we are happy to welcome all of you to this final day of our Keep on the Watch District Convention. As one congregated people, let us lift our voice in praise to Jehovah. Please stand if you are able and sing song number six, entitled Declare the Everlasting Good News. After the song, Brother Karen Maidlin, a missionary serving in Madagascar, will direct our thoughts in prayer. Again, that's song number six. Grand Instructor, we're very, very happy to be here on the final day of our Holy Convention. 
It's hard to believe that it's the last day. We've been so well fed spiritually, and we certainly appreciate this. Very timely, Jehovah, the reminders to keep on the watch. We really do appreciate them because it's so easy today to be distracted by Satan's system. We've seen too, Jehovah, the tremendous step that we have new brothers and sisters who symbolize their dedication by baptism yesterday, and we're so happy that they've done this, and we hope, Jehovah, that we can be a strengthening aid to them. We're appreciative too for the spiritual food, the new releases, that certainly will help us draw closer to you and to grow in faith. We thank Jehovah of our program today and we pray your Holy Spirit, your blessing upon those who have a share. We know many may be very nervous to have a part, but we're confident that your Holy Spirit will back them up, give them courage and strength. It certainly makes us happy too and must make your heart glad to see the tremendous efforts of so many of your servants to get here, Jehovah. We know we have elderly ones, ones with children, ones whose families are not yet in the truth, who have made efforts to get here, and that makes us happy. We pray your Spirit will watch over us, to bless us, help us to make personal application of the material, so that we can certainly keep on the watch in these last days. This we pray, Father, asking for your help, through the name of our King Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. You will notice on page 8 of your convention program that the scriptural theme for this third day of our district convention is Keep in Expectation, It Will Not Be Late, based on Habakkuk 2, verse 3. Heeding those words calls for steadfastness. What can help us to develop that quality? Please listen as Brother Tim Hancock from the Tawin congregation presents the part, Keeping in Expectation Day by Day. It's not surprising that so many in the world today live in a state of anxiety. This is because the Bible tells us at 2 Timothy 3 and verse 1 that these last days in which we're living in now will be critical times hard to deal with. Many unable to cope with today's problems and pressures can only anticipate a dismal future. In contrast, though, Jehovah's people, even though we too have to live in this world and face many similar problems and pressures, Jehovah's people are a happy people. Why is that? Well, this is because, unlike so many in the world today, we have a hope. Yes, we live in the joyful expectation of the fast approaching fulfillment of God's promises. A promise that soon all the, the problems and the pressures that we face in this system will give way to a new system right here on a paradise earth under Jehovah God's righteous kingdom rule. Now we have a guarantee of this promise. The Bible assures us it will come true. Just turn with me to the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 2 and 3 to, to have a look at that assurance together. It says there, And Jehovah proceeded to answer me and to say, Write down the vision and set it out plainly upon tablets, in order that the one reading aloud from it may do so fluently. For the vision is yet for the appointed time, and it keeps panting on to the end, and it will not tell a lie. Even if it should delay, keep in expectation of it, for it will without fail come true. It will not be late. So keep in expectation of this promise. It will come true. It will not be late. Now because we, we do have to live in this wicked world, 
And Satan, the devil, is, is constantly trying to damage and weaken our faith. That's why we must cultivate this Bible-based hope day by day. Now, the expression there, day by day, denotes constancy. You see, Satan, the devil, won't take a break from trying to weaken your hope. So we can't afford to take a break after. We need to strengthen our hope every single day. So how happy we can be to have such a powerful aid in our daily worship as examining the scriptures daily. Now 1 Peter 5 and verse 8 tells us or describes Satan as a roaring lion seeking to devour someone. So many have, have taken full advantage of this valuable provision to keep on the watch. So considering our text is part of our daily worship of Jehovah. That's why you'll find around the world that Bethel families will begin their work day with morning worship, a consideration of the text and comments. Now many family heads who have, have had the privilege of visiting Bethel and attending morning worship have been so impressed by, by how it's been done that when they've returned home they've been determined to do the same with their families. Now their families have greatly benefited from following a similar family arrangement. Our elders in the Christian congregation too do a fine job of helping many families, including single parent families, to stick to a well-arranged day-by-day consideration of the text. I'd like you to look in now on two elders who are encouraging a single parent and her two children to do just that. How have you found considering the day's text has helped you? Well, often when I'm at school, if I get faced with a problem or a difficult situation, I've been able to recall the day's text, and it has helped me through problems there. That's good to hear that, Emma, the fact that it's helped you in that way. I was thinking that when my family visited Bethel once, we were all quite impressed with the way they considered the day's text. As well as just reading it, they had some well-prepared comments showing the value of the scripture. And when we watched that, we thought, well, we could probably do better ourselves in our own family discussions. Could you demonstrate that for us, Philip? Yes. Well, if I was at home, what I would first do is get someone to read the text for the day. So maybe Mike could do that for today, which is Sunday, July the 12th. He that exercises faith in the Son has everlasting life. John 3:36. Thank you. Well read. Now, if I was at home, I would have a couple of quickfire questions aimed at various members of the family. For example, perhaps I could ask Laura, what determines whether a person has a good relationship with Jehovah or not? It depends on a person's exercising faith in Jesus' ransom sacrifice. Very good. Now, a question for Mike. What kinds of people does God want to worship him? Well, as it says in Timothy, Jehovah wants all sorts of people to be saved. Very good answer. Now, if I was at home, I would probably make a few comments myself to try and apply it to my own family and conclude by having the comments read. So maybe, Emma, could you read the comments for us? Yeah, it says, The first century Christians understood that God is not partial, but in every nation the man that fears him and works righteousness is acceptable to him. Whether a person has a good relationship with Jehovah or not depends on his exercising faith in Jesus' ransom sacrifice. And it is Jehovah's will that all sorts of men should be saved and come to an accurate knowledge of truth. It would be wrong for proclaimers of the good news to prejudge people on the basis of their race, social status, appearance, religious background, or any other characteristic. Consider for a moment, are you not grateful that the person who first spoke to you about scriptural truths was free of prejudices toward you? So why hold back from offering a potentially life-saving message to anyone who might listen to it? 
So, uh, really nice, thank you. We would like to commend you uh, on your routine of considering the day's text and encourage you to bring back to mind the scripture throughout the day which would help you to cope with whatever the day holds. Well, thank you for your call today. It's been really helpful. And we will definitely keep it in mind and put into practice the suggestions you've made. So a day-by-day -day consideration of God's reminders and applying his direction can help families to keep on the watch for Jehovah's Day. I'd like you to note just how Jehovah is described in Isaiah. Isaiah 64 and verse 4 describes Jehovah as the one who acts for the one who keeps in expectation of him. Yes, we today have the privilege of worshipping the only one capable of blessing us eternally for keeping in expectation of him. Thank you for that exhilarating discussion. For what events are you keeping on the watch? Which part of Jehovah's inspired words do you particularly long to see fulfilled? By means of a nine-part symposium entitled Keep Your Eyes on the Things Unseen, we will consider nine prophecies due to be fulfilled. As we do so, ask yourself, are my eyes of faith focused on these future realities? To begin, let us give our attention to Brother Lewis Roberts, an elder in the Rugeley congregation, as he presents the first portion, namely, the ten horns will hate the harlot. Jehovah's servants realize the importance of keeping on the watch and good physical eyesight is a wonderful blessing. However, the Apostle Paul refers to a kind of eyesight that is of greater value. Note how in his second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 4, he draws this to our attention. There, in verse 18, Paul writes these words. While we keep our eyes not on the things seen, but on the things unseen. For the things seen are temporary, but the things unseen are everlasting. It must be a very special kind of eyesight indeed that enables one to see something that is unseen. What are the things unseen? Did you note that Paul said they are everlasting? That is, they have to do with our hope of everlasting life. And so here, Paul is urging his spiritual brothers to focus on the things unseen, to always keep before them their heavenly reward. So whether we are of the anointed Christians or of the other sheep, let us always keep in mind our wonderful hope. This scripture also contains a fine principle that in order to maintain that hope we must keep our spiritual vision. Our eyes of faith must be focused on the things unseen. In this symposium we will consider nine as yet unseen events closely related to our hope of everlasting life. Truly believing that these events are certain to occur will have a good effect. It will move us to be filled with joy and peace and cause us to abound in hope with the power of Holy Spirit. And our hope can be likened not to a candle flickering in the darkness, but rather to the brilliant rays of the morning sun, filling our lives with peace, happiness, purpose and courage fortifying us to continue 
despite present tribulations and remember the tribulations as the scripture said are merely temporary the first of those nine as yet unseen events we will consider is this the attack against the harlot Babylon the Great the world empire of false religion and that attack is significant in that it marks the start of the great tribulation in the revelation penned by John the Apostle the scriptures clearly reveal by whom the attack will come and how complete and utter it will be note as we turn to Revelation chapter 17 the graphic language employed by John in Revelation chapter 17 this is what he writes commencing in verse 16 and the ten horns that you saw and the wild beast these will hate the harlot and will make her devastated and naked and will eat up her fleshy parts and will completely burn her with fire what this means will be awesome to contemplate it will mean the eradication and the end of false religion in the four corners of the earth the wild beast that John refers to here is the United Nations organization operative since 1945 and since when atheistic anti-religious elements have been prominent in her membership when he makes mention of the ten horns he is depicting the present political powers that support the wild beast now in the Lord's day they have a kingdom or political authority and it is this that will be utilized in the harlot's destruction which will be thorough and final how so the nations and the United Nations will plunder her wealth they will expose her real character they will devour her and as the scripture says completely burn her but what is it that ignites this fearsome attack against the harlot and ensures destruction there is no need to surmise there is no need to guess the answer is plainly seen in the following verse Revelation 17 verse 17 for God put it into their hearts to carry out his thought even to carry out their own one thought by giving their kingdom to the wild beast until the words of God will have been accomplished yes it is Jehovah who puts the thought into the heart of the political rulers at that time they will feel as though they are carrying out their own one thought but the reality is this they are merely tools in the hands of Almighty God when the time comes the nations will evidently see the need to strengthen the United Nations giving it teeth as it were lending it whatever authority and power they possess so that it can turn against false religion and successfully fight against it until as the scripture says the words of God will have been accomplished and thus the ancient harlot will come to a complete end and good riddance to her with that in mind let us see now how one of your brothers determines on the best way to prepare himself for the imminent attack against Babylon the Great this is dreadful news yet another terrorist attack in Pakistan all these people killed innocent children women men of course it's not just Pakistan Afghanistan but we look back in history and think about Northern Ireland Bosnia Chechnya it's religion behind all of this isn't it different religious fractions which are causing these terrorist attacks and so much death and destruction these images are terrible that we see it can't be long until the governments attack Babylon the Great and put an end to all these atrocities but am I ready am I ready for the Great Tribulation what am I doing with my time Am I spending enough in the ministry? No. 
What am I doing with my family worship evening? I've let overtime get in the way, or DIY projects, which I don't finish in time. I'm wasting my time. And we can see this because, yes, meeting attendance, it goes up, doesn't it, after we get news like this of these terrorist attacks that religion is causing. Yes, this temporary zeal is, is not what Jehovah wants at all. This system of things is going to be destroyed very, very soon indeed. So what am I doing? What are my works, my godly deeds of devotion? What are they like? No, I need to stay close to Jehovah's organization right now. I need to stay in God's love. I need to make changes, and I need to make them now. Whereas the actual attack against Babylon the Great is still unseen, we are not completely in the dark. A development is already visible. And it is related to a term used on more than one occasion by the Apostle John. We're going to consider two scriptures. Turn first to Revelation chapter 16. We're going to look at verse 12. And then we'll use the following chapter to find the answer to this question. In Revelation chapter 16, verse 12, it says, And the sixth one poured out his bowl upon the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up. We're interested in the phrase, water. Look across to chapter 17. There in verse 15 we read, And he says to me, The waters that you saw where the harlot is sitting mean peoples and crowds and nations and tongues. The waters picture the millions who support the harlot Babylon the Great, her hordes of adherents, that she was always regarded as a protection. But since World War I, support for her has diminished. However, it is not totally dried up. The prominent Catholic writer, Malachi Martin, said, we are witnessing the death of a socially and politically structured Christianity. Shall we therefore expect that the attack against the harlot will only commence after the support has totally dried up? No. The history of ancient Babylon indicates at what point the imminent attack against the harlot will take place. When ancient Babylon was attacked by the Medes and the Persians, the little waters surrounding the city were not totally dried up. The historian Herodotus said, Cyrus the Persian went drawing off the water by a canal into a lake. At that time, the Persians were posted to make entrance into Babylon by a channel of the Euphrates, which had by now sunk to the height about the middle of a man's thigh. The waters had not totally dried up. Even so, Babylon fell and a desolation would come. Similarly, when the harlot is attacked, support for her will not completely have dried up. Actually, just prior to the attack, she will still view herself as a queen who will never see mourning. What a terrible miscalculation! Her dwindling numbers of adherents will offer no support whatsoever. Ancient Babylon felt that she was in an absolutely secure position, boasting, I shall not sit as a widow. I shall not know the loss of children. Babylon the Great also feels secure. But her destruction, which is decreed by Jehovah, who is strong, will happen quickly, as if in one day. By keeping in expectation, day by day, we will be ready for the outbreak of the Great Tribulation. Brother Jonathan Phillips, presently serving in West Midlands No. 2 circuit, will now consider the subject, keep your eyes on the things unseen, the nations, 
will have to acknowledge Jehovah. So, with the smoke of Babylon the Great symbolically ascending, what will follow next? In complete contrast with the desolated condition of false religion, take a look at the condition of Jehovah's people at Ezekiel 38. And we're going to just consider some of the expressions found in verse 11. Ezekiel chapter 38. Notice how it speaks about them dwelling in an open rural country with no disturbance, dwelling in security, without war. They do not have even bar and doors. This peaceful condition, dwelling in security, why? Because God's people are no part of Babylon the Great. And they have been acknowledging the true God, Jehovah. But how does this condition make Satan feel? Enraged. Prophetically describing these events. Jehovah relays this to Ezekiel at verse 2 of Ezekiel 38. Verse 2. Son of man. Set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the head chieftain of Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Gog refers to Satan after being ousted from heaven. And the land of Magog? The realm where he is now confined. And Jehovah causes Satan to see his people as defenseless in that open rural country. Hence, as those speaking to Satan, Jehovah says this at verses 15 and 16 of Ezekiel 38. And you will certainly come from your place from the remotest parts of the north, you and many peoples with you, all of them riding on horses, a great congregation, even a numerous military force. And you will be bound to come up against my people Israel. Like clouds to cover the land, in the final part of the days it will occur. And I shall certainly bring you against my land for the purpose that the nations may know me when I sanctify myself in you before their eyes, O Gog. Jehovah draws on Satan and his many peoples, the militarized nations that are under his control. And it happens, as it says in the verse, in the final part of the days. These are events as yet unseen. Knowing in advance Satan's all-out attack upon us as God's people, uh, how does that make you feel, brothers and sisters? A little anxious, perhaps? Nervous? Well, we need not be nervous. Why? Because Jehovah is in full control of events at this time, and he provides divine protection for his people. What will also help us is that we focus not on our own salvation, but on Jehovah's name and his sovereignty. This is the main issue. Jehovah's holy name and his supreme sovereignty. The book of Ezekiel highlights this main issue on numerous occasions. Let's consider just one of them at that well-known verse 23 of Ezekiel 38. Ezekiel 38, the last verse, 23. And I shall certainly magnify myself 
and sanctify myself and make myself known before the eyes of many nations and they will have to know that I am Jehovah. The nations will have to know, will have to acknowledge Jehovah when he sanctifies his beautiful name and vindicates his sovereignty. This is the main issue, not our own salvation. Uh, still, it is vital that we maintain our integrity regardless of what tests we may face and yes there will be tests as yet unseen for us and whether we live or whether we die through such events if we keep our integrity it will lead us to everlasting life either by preservation or by resurrection because we acknowledged Jehovah and his sovereignty now in complete contrast the nations as a whole continue to reject Jehovah's sovereign position and this despite our having witnessed worldwide the good news of the kingdom the nations have rejected their only hope of survival now regarding our preaching work what may happen with regard to the message that we preach well we're given indications within the book of Revelation where at chapter 16 our climactic judgment messages are referred to as giant hailstones coming down from the heavens this shows that the message we preach may well become stronger think of that the message we preach may well become stronger what we can say with certainty is that before the great tribulation is over Jehovah's name will have been made known as never before in the meantime the nations will continue to reject Jehovah's message of salvation they will continue to harden their hearts as did Pharaoh of old he and his Egyptian army refused to acknowledge Jehovah's sovereignty until when until events at the Red Sea and if you open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 14 Exodus chapter 14 and look at the expressions found in verse 25 Exodus 14 verse 25 and he kept taking wheels off their chariots so that they were driving them with difficulty and the Egyptians began to say let us flee from any contact with Israel because Jehovah certainly fights for them against the Egyptians it was at this point that Pharaoh and his armies acknowledged Jehovah but it was too late as he took the wheels off their chariots and they exclaimed Jehovah certainly fights so only at this last point do they acknowledge Jehovah similarly when Jehovah fights for us his named people in a way that we have never seen before the nations will be forced to acknowledge Jehovah they will have to know Jehovah that unprecedented acknowledgement will lead to the battle of Armageddon this is the next unseen event to be considered in this symposium brother Adrian Hill will now consider the subject keep your eyes on the things unseen all these kingdoms will be crushed
Can you see it? It's just there on the horizon. Can you hear it? The proclamation of its arrival is heard loud and clear worldwide. Now it's true in this time of the end, the world may be deaf and blind to its approach, but we can see it clearly. It's getting closer and closer every day. Although still a future event, Daniel saw it clearly, and he describes it in these words at Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44. Turn there with me to Daniel chapter 2. In verse 44 he describes, In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be brought to ruin and the kingdom itself will not be passed on to any other people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, and it itself will stand to times indefinite. Yes, Daniel saw God's government crushing out of existence all human governments at the Battle of Armageddon. And as we've just heard, Satan may attempt to destroy Jehovah's people, but with confidence we can say he will not succeed. Jehovah reassures us in verse 45 that the dream is reliable. In other words, this prophecy will come true. God's kingdom will triumph over all human rulership. We can be confident of that fact because Jehovah never lies. How does Daniel's interpretation then of this ancient dream help us to keep our eyes on the things unseen? Did you notice an expression there in verse 44? Daniel spoke about all these kingdoms. What's being referred to there? Looking back through the verses of Daniel, you'll remember how Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. A dream of an immense image in human form. He sees there a head of gold, breasts and arms of silver, a belly and thighs of copper, the legs of iron, and right down to the feet and toes which are iron with, mixed with uh, moist clay. And with Jehovah's help, Daniel was able to reveal that those four metallic parts represented various world powers. So looking back to verse 38, for example, Daniel says to, him, to uh, Nebuchadnezzar, you yourself are the head of gold. Yes, that head of gold represented Nebuchadnezzar along with the entire Be Babylonian line of rulership. Then in verse 39... Daniel then tells Nebuchadnezzar, After you there will rise another kingdom, inferior to you. So in 539 BCE, the Medes and the Persians took the kingdom of Babylon and established themselves as the next kingdom as represented by the silver breasts and arms of the image. That dynasty lasted for around 200 years. And so down to uh, 331 BCE, Alexander the Great defeated Medo-Persia and the Grecian Empire established itself as the third kingdom as depicted by the belly and thighs of copper on that image. Can you recall what metal Jehovah used to describe the fourth kingdom of the image? That's right, it's down in verse 40, iron. And that's very appropriate for the Roman Empire was certainly iron-like in its rulership. One of its captured territories rose to prominence as the British Empire. And along with the United States formed an alliance, the Anglo-American world power. And just like the Roman Empire, they too ruled with iron-like authority. So the iron legs of the dream include the Roman Empire along with the Anglo-American dual world power. In verse 41, our attention is now turned to the feet and the toes of the image. 
They're described as iron mixed with clay. And really how well that pictures all the coexisting governments in this time of the end. Traditional iron-like rulerships are more and more having to listen to the common people who want their say. That often produces an uneasy relationship. There's a lack of cohesion between the two parties and that results in a politically fragmented world. And wouldn't you say that describes the rulerships of this old system of things? So where are we living in this prophetic timeline? I'm sure you'd agree history confirms that these world powers have already made their appearance. You can look in the history books at the Roman Empire, the Babylonian Empire, Medo-Persian, the Grecian Empire, the Anglo-American world powers. We, we see in the history books all of those rulerships. We also know that according to verse 45, God's kingdom has been cut from the mountain, that mountain representing God's universal sovereignty. That was done in 1914. That too is a historical fact. So using Daniel's prophetic picture here, where is God's kingdom right now? Well, at this very moment, but it's hurtling towards its target. It's hurtling towards the feet of the image. And we have the wonderful opportunity of seeing very soon the vinyl destruction of all human rulership. Can you see it? It's just there on the horizon. Shh! Can you hear it? The proclamation worldwide of this fast approaching event. We've already highlighted the fact that Jehovah cannot lie. All his promises are true. By contrast, Satan is the father of the lie. All his propaganda is a sham. It's falsehood. In Revelation chapter 16 and verses 13 and 14, that propaganda is described as frog-like inspired expressions. In other words, demonic expressions designed to blind the kings of the earth to the approach of God's kingdom. And those kings of the earth have subsequently manoeuvred into a position of opposition to God's kingdom. You know, Satan is just like a lying con man. He's trying to get us to invest in a bankrupt company. Nationalism, patriotism, political bias. Yes, they might be prized assets in this system of things, but we know those shares are completely worthless. Brothers, don't be tempted to violate your neutrality. Be determined never to take sides in political issues. More than ever, we need to keep on the watch. Satan's propaganda is very soon going to manoeuvre the kings of the earth into direct opposition to Jehovah and his angelic forces. And then Jesus, along with those angelic forces, will await Jehovah's command and destroy them all. <sighs> Just imagine what the world will be like then. Just imagine a world without oppressive rulerships. A world without national boundaries. A world without rivalries or conflicts. Do you like to travel? That will be a world that is passport free, visa free. The whole world will be united under Jehovah's rulership. Can you see it? Can you hear it? It's true at the moment such things can only be seen with our mind's eye. But very soon, we can await the joy of the time when Jehovah welcomes us into that new world order. And we can see firsthand all those kingdom realities. Brother Paul Smith of the Kington Congregation will now consider the subject. Keep your eyes on the things unseen. The devil will be bound for a thousand years.
You're running as fast as you can across the Serengeti Plains in Africa with a lion behind you. The faster you run, the slower you seem to go. And within seconds, you feel its hot breath on your neck and you feel the crushing weight of its body on your back. And then the scene changes. You're on the battlements of a medieval castle and a huge siege tower is trundling towards you. And as it approaches you, a ramp is lowered down and a, a, a great mass of soldiers in armor come running down towards you and the first one raises his sword and then the scene changes again. You're in the trenches in the First World War and as you look out across the no man's land, you see a cloud approaching you and gradually dispersing you sense a slight smell of garlic and you remember mustard gas and within seconds your skin starts to burn and your throat starts to burn and you find that you can't breathe and then suddenly you wake up and you realize it's all been a dreadful nightmare can you imagine the sense of relief well, you, brothers and sisters, you're soon going to feel the same sense of relief because you have been experiencing just such a nightmare. Think about 1 Peter 5.8. It describes the devil as a roaring lion who's walking about seeking to devour someone. Think of Paul's words in Ephesians 6 where he talks about Satan's machinations or his crafty acts that are trying to undermine our defenses. And can you remember his words in Ephesians 2 where he talks about Satan being the ruler of the authority of the air, the spirit that now operates in the sons of disobedience. And of course all those activities have been all the greater since he was cast out of heaven and hurled down onto the earth. Have you felt the pressure? Well, I'm sure you have. So isn't it wonderful to think that that pressure will soon be completely relieved? How can we be so sure of that? Well, turn with me to Revelation 20 and we're going to read most of verses 1 to 3. And here we read, And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven with the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he sees the dragon, the original serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he hurled him into the abyss, and shut it and sealed it over him that he might not mislead the nations any more until the thousand years were ended. Now the key word in that section of scripture is the word abyss. And that's the same word that is used of the demons in Luke 8.31. That's their fate as well. So what does the word mean? Well, it literally means very or exceedingly deep. It means unfathomable or boundless. It's the same word that was used to describe the state that Christ was in when he was in the grave. So it means a state of absolute inactivity, where the only people who can release one from that state are Jehovah or Christ, who is described there in verse 1 as the angel with the key of the abyss. As it says in that verse, when Satan is in the abyss, when it's shut, when it's sealed over him, it says there that he will not be able to mislead the nations anymore until the thousand years have ended. So no more not lion-like prowling, no more machinations, no more deadly air. And thinking back to that wonderful symposium yesterday, no more fire, no more pit, no more snare, no more trap that chokes, no more trap that crushes.
Can you imagine what it will be like to live with so, so much pressure relieved from us? I was trying to think what it would be like, and I could picture in my mind what I've seen on videos of lambs that have been transported in a stock lorry, and they're released into a field. And they go absolutely mad with excitement. They bound and they leap and they bleat and they do little vertical takeoffs because they're so excited. And really, spiritually, that's what it's going to be like for us. So let's talk now then to a brother about what he's looking forward to when Satan is abyss. So Brother Andrew Russell is from Leek Congregation. He works full time, he's raised a family, and he's served as an elder in the congregation for many years. So Andrew, you're, you're very uh, used to pressure, aren't you? So in what ways do you anticipate feeling relief when Satan is abyss? First of all, if we think about the field of secular work. Well, I, I enjoy satisfying work, secularly, but I find as years go on that it becomes increasingly pressurised and less pleasant to work in the secular environment. But in contrast to that, what I really look forward to is the satisfaction and try and imagine what it's like to work with the brothers and sisters, creating a paradise, helping to Jehovah to create a paradise for us all in the future. Not pursuing money, not pursuing the trivial pursuits that people at work pursue, and I'm sure that the, the audience will sympathize with that outlook. Thank you, Andrew. Now, what about within the family? Well, Satan's devised so many different devices, hasn't he, really, to entrap the young ones particularly. And Christian parents are really anxious about uh, what the world has to offer. For instance, uh, the internet we've been warned about, computer games, all these have such a, a bad influence on them. And just the thought of waking up in the morning, that anxiety being gone, the Satan being gone, all those pressures, those evil influences disappeared. Well, that's a wonderful prospect for all parents. And, and, and also, the only influences that will be upon them will be positive ones, good ones. Mm, yeah, that's lovely to think about, isn't it? How, how about within the congregation, finally, then? Well, we enjoy a spiritual paradise now. We know that. But as we've learned over the last few days, we need to be so watchful, don't we, in looking after our families and our brothers and sisters, because Satan can significantly harm them if, if we allow that. So when Satan's finally gone, that threat will be gone as well. And I'm really, we're all, of course, looking forward to a secure future, but shepherds in particular then will have the job of helping our brothers and sisters to develop their role to create that new system their role in that new order. Lovely. Thank you very much, Brother Russell, for those comments. So what are you looking forward to, brothers? In what ways will the abyssing of Satan come as the greatest relief to you? Will you be glad to see the back of his lion-like prowling Will it be his machinations? Will it be his demonic air? Will it be the fire, the pit, the snare, or the trap? What will you most enjoy freedom from? And looking beyond that time, what are some of the first things that you would like to do when in the words of Psalm 37, the wicked will be no more, and we can look forward to finding our exquisite delight in the abundance of peace? Well, let's give our attention now to Brother George Kidd, who will discuss the next part of the symposium, Keep Your Eyes on the Things Unseen, this time looking at They Will Build Houses and Plant Vineyards. An Englishman's home is his castle, as the saying goes. Now what's implied by that? Doesn't it suggest a sense of security, of uh, comfort, of relaxation, and possibly even pride of ownership? The desire to set up a home and to have a family is universal. But for the vast majority of mankind, that's just what it is, 
uh, a desire, a dream, the reality is very different. And that's because in many lands today, there's a housing crisis. In the United States of America, 90% of the population live in big, overcrowded cities. And worldwide, the situation is the same for over 50% of the world's inhabitants. Uh, throughout the world, there are also more than 20 cities nowadays which are more than 10 million people in population and getting bigger by the day. And in many places, many parts of the world, you have makeshift houses in shanty towns. Uh, no running water, uh, no sanitary facilities, dreadful places to live, and it does bring home to us that for many people, life is very difficult and they do not enjoy a home of their own. Now, by contrast, perhaps you'd look with me at Isaiah chapter 65 and verse 21, because here we have a promise. Isaiah 65 and verse 21. And looking forward in this restoration prophecy to better times for the Israelites back then and for us in the new world of righteousness, Isaiah tells us, and they will certainly build houses and have occupancy, and they will certainly plant vineyards and eat their fruitage. So, what a promise that is. Now, that's a promise, not a dream. It is something unseen now for the world as a whole, but an assured hope for the future. Now, if you've ever seen what an RBC can achieve in building a Kingdom Hall with its uh, many volunteers, then just imagine what can be achieved by voluntary workers under Jesus Christ's direction in a new world of righteousness. We really can imagine a paradise earth. Now could you open your Bible please at Micah 4 and verse 4 to read a parallel prophecy to Micah's, uh, to Isaiah's. Micah 4 and verse 4. And here Micah assures us, and they will actually sit each one under his vine and under his fig tree, and there will be no one making them tremble for the very mouth of Jehovah of armies has spoken it. What a, a wonderful hope. Now this is no, no pie in the sky. This is Jehovah God's assured promise, but it does raise a question. What do we need to do to benefit from that promise? And the answer, we need to do God's will now to gain eternal blessings in the future. Now what does it mean? The Apostle Paul advocated that Christians should consider themselves, the Apostle Peter, uh, advised Christians to consider themselves aliens and temporary residents in this system of things, not to be putting down roots in it. So what does that amount to for us today? Well, we must control the urge to have the things of the world and to expend time and energy and become stressed in the process, possibly pushing kingdom interests out in the process and certainly leaving very little time for the preaching of the good news of God's kingdom. Jesus Christ, you'll remember, advised us to keep a simple eye. It's in Matthew chapter 6, verse 22. The lamp of the body is the eye. If then your eye is simple, your whole body will be bright. So we must endeavor to keep our eyes simple, to lead a balanced, modest, 
and simple life, free of undue anxiety. Now, this affects many aspects of our lives. But the example the faithful and discreet slave has chosen to highlight today is this. Do not be tempted at this time to pursue higher education so as to lead a materialistic way of life and pursue pleasure. So what should we do instead? What we need to do is to focus on the sure hope ahead and as Revelation 14 verse 6 indicates, we need to focus on the preaching of the good news of the kingdom under the oversight of the angel flying in mid-heaven. So how important that preaching work truly is today. It's now my pleasure to interview Brother Edmund Kerr, who currently is circuit overseer on the Cheshire No. 2 circuit. And uh, Edmund, if I could just ask you, when you and Pauline married, I know that uh, you didn't crave a life of cozy uh, uh, domesticity, but instead you set your eyes on the full-time service. So how soon was it after you married that you got into the full-time service? Well, it was pretty quickly, George. We were married in 1968. If you're doing the maths, that's 41 years tomorrow. And the following year, 69, we moved away from here in the Stoke area to Mid Wales, where the need was then greater. 1977, we started doing temporary circuit work, and in 1982, we were assigned to regular circuit work, where we've been ever since. Very good. Um, so, how have you and Pauline managed, then, all these years, to keep your eye simple, as Jesus put it? Well, it's a lovely illustration that Jesus gave, wasn't it? Keep your eyes simple. Uh, you can only focus on one thing at a time. So we've always tried to focus on the truth, uh, not letting uh, secular or material things get in the way too much. One thing we both agreed to do right from the time we were married was that we would never go into debt. So for all of these years, we've never ever bought anything on higher purchase, as it was called, or credit cards today. In fact, our credit card is always paid at the end of the month, so they don't get much out of us. Uh, that's helped us to focus on spiritual things, and we've always felt that Jehovah God has provided the things that we've needed, and we've had many, many spiritual blessings as well. Well, that's uh, very encouraging and helpful to, to hear, Brother Kerr. Now, just one more question, if I may. Uh, what kind of house are you looking forward to having in the new system of things in the paradise? Well, we've always tried to focus on the full-time service, so uh, if we survive into that new system uh, without having to benefit from a resurrection, we never know what assignment Jehovah might have for us, where it will be, what it will be. But I'm pretty confident that when the dust of Armageddon finally settles, whatever accommodation Jehovah God has provided, it'll be the best that we could possibly imagine. Very good, thank you. So thank you for those helpful insights, Brother Kerr. I think we could truly say that Brother Kerr is an Englishman whose home is by no means his castle, uh, but for whom Jehovah's name is a strong tower which provides all the security and satisfaction he needs. But besides uh, pleasant and wholesome living conditions, Jehovah has much more in store for those who love him. At this point, we're going to introduce Brother Martin Geach, who will present the next part of the symposium, Keep Your Eyes on the Things Unseen, The Wolf and the Lamb Will Feed as One. Twenty-three million people in this country own a pet. 
and that's not including 50 million fish. Maybe, maybe you have a pet waiting at home for you. There can be lots of reasons why we might choose to own a pet. They can provide some sort of companionship. Uh, children are sometimes taught a sense of responsibility through owning a pet. It's not really surprising that we like to have animals around us. You know, Jehovah made us that way. He made us to enjoy the company of animals. You'll remember that he gave us dominion over the animals, to care for them, to look after them. What's your favorite animal? Some really get caught up with the cute animals like koala bears and pandas. Pandas seem very popular. Others like animals like lions and tigers, very powerful creatures, elephants, they're drawn to those. Little boys, they seem to like snakes and lizards and things of that sort. Wonder what your favorite is. We know a lot about animals these days. TV tells us a lot about them. Wonderful documentaries. And of course, the Awake Out magazine has outstanding articles dealing with the lives of animals. Sadly though, as we look at these pictures and we feel we'd like to get close to them, we just can't. It's very rare that we get a close up to an animal. Man's treatment of the animals has not been good. We've, out, we've not done as Jehovah asked in caring for the animal kingdom. Animals have been made to look ridiculous in circuses. They've been caged up. Their environment has been destroyed. They've been cruelly hunted. And so as a result, our relationship with them is very poor. So we ask ourselves, will we ever have a good relationship with the animals? Will we ever get a situation where no animals ever kill a human? Why even pets? Sometimes we read in the paper that even pets turn on their owners. Will we ever get a situation where that doesn't exist anymore? Will it ever change? The good news is, as we look into the things unseen, we know that we will have in the future an absolutely wonderful relationship with the animals. Jehovah has promised it. If you turn to Isaiah chapter 65, and verse 25, we can see what Jehovah has to tell us there about the animal kingdom and how he's going to make a much better relationship with us and the animals. Isaiah 65, and we're interested in verse 25. Look what it says there. It says, the wolf and the lamb themselves will feed as one, and the lion will eat straw just like the bull. And as for the serpent, his food will be dust. They will do no harm nor cause any ruin in all my holy mountain, Jehovah has said. So what a wonderful thing to look forward to. As we look at the animal kingdom now and our relationship with it, it almost seems impossible to imagine, doesn't it? But we're encouraged with our, to look forward with the eyes of our imagination to a time when that will actually exist. Jehovah has shown his ability to actually do this. It's not something that we have to have such a high degree of faith about that we can't imagine it happening. You see, when Adam named the animals, he had a perfect relationship with them. And he was able to get close to even the wildest of creatures, even the most powerful creatures, to study them, to find a name for them. Noah, of course, he took the animals onto the ark. Well, while they were on the ark, they never attacked him. He had a perfectly good relationship with them. Jehovah saw to that. And then you may remember the Jews, when they returned to the land of Israel, the land had become filled with wild beasts. And so in 537, when they went back, Jehovah made sure that those wild beasts didn't attack them, didn't affect them. And in a figurative way, Jehovah has been able to eliminate even beastly qualities from people. And so he has demonstrated to us through the pages of his word that he has the ability to bring these things about. The big question though is how will this come about? What will cause this to happen? Well if we turn to Isaiah chapter 11 verses 6 to 9 we can see what will bring it about. Isaiah 11 6 to 9 it describes the conditions that we can look forward to in a wonderful way and then it tells us right at the end of those three verses 
just why we can be confident that it's going to happen. Isaiah 11, 6-9 says this. It talks about the creation in this very positive way. And the wolf will actually reside for a while with the male lamb. And with the kid, the leopard itself will lie down. And the calf and the maimed young lion and the well-fed animal all together. And a mere little boy will be leader over them. And the cow and the bear themselves will feed. Together their young ones will lie down. And even the lion will eat straw just like the bull. And the sucking child will certainly play upon the hole of the cobra. And upon the light aperture of a poisonous snake will a weaned child actually put his own hand. They will not do any harm or cause any ruin in all my holy mountain because the earth will certainly be filled with the knowledge of Jehovah as the waters are covering the very sea. Yes, you see, it is the knowledge of Jehovah that will do it. The world will become filled with an understanding of Jehovah's purposes and as a result there will be peace between humans and animals. Something that we all really look forward to. And it's certainly something that brother Simon Lindley and his daughter Kezi from the Cheadle Staffordshire congregation look forward to. You got any pets in your family, Kezi? Yes, I have a rabbit and my sister has two Chinese hamsters. And of all the animals, what's your favourite animal? Well, I like the orangutan. Do you? That's really a big animal, isn't it? Do you, th do you see yourself having an orangutan as a pet in the new order? Not really. Orangutans are wild animals, so they need to live in the jungle. So they are not really suitable as pets. But Jehovah has promised that the wild animals won't be scared of us in the paradise. So I'm looking forward to being able to get closer to them and learning more about them. Very good. And why do you think that's going to come true? Well, I like the scripture at Joshua 23:14. Joshua said that not one of Jehovah's promises ever failed. They all came true. I believe this promise will come true as well. That's very good to hear, Kezi. Thank you very much. And so, Simon, it sounds as though you've encouraged Kezi to take an interest in animals. Well, yes. Every time we go for a walk, whether it's in the countryside or on the beach, we're always turning over rocks and locks and uh, looking in rock pools to see what we can find. Very good. Now, I think, though, that you're... Uh, interest in nature was taken quite seriously when you, came, when you were at university before you came into the truth. Yes, I wanted to do what I could to protect the environment and protect animals. So I studied marine biology, I supported Greenpeace and was active in Friends of the Earth. But I think I soon came to realise that whatever I did had no lasting benefit and things only got worse. And how did that make you feel? At first I was disappointed, but then that gave way to anger. And it was only the truth that helped me control that anger. So how did the truth help you then? Well, first of all, it taught me that uh, there is a loving creator who cares about this earth and all the animals he put on it. But also it taught me that uh, he has a purpose for the earth, that he has the power and the desire to undo all the damage that we've done and restore paradise conditions. And one scripture that had a deep impact on me was Revelation 11 verse 18. And what impressed you about that particularly? Well, first of all, because it was written something like 2,000 years ago, yet it's only in our generation, the past 50 years, where we've had the capacity to destroy the planet. But also because the solution to the problem is so simple, just to remove those that are ruining the planet. So how are you keeping your eyes on the things unseen in this regard now? Well, it helps me uh, not get upset or angry by the things we see happening in the world around us and just looking forward to the time when those conditions are restored, when we can live peacefully with the animal kingdom without fear of pollution and global warming and then we can learn how to take care of this earth and the animals in the way Jehovah originally intended us. And how about you, Kezi? Well, I like to imagine myself in the paradise, surrounded by all sorts of animals, just like Jehovah has promised. Thank you both very much. We know that you're going to keep keeping your eyes on the things unseen. Thank you very much.
Besides ideal living conditions and meaningful work and a harmonious relationship with the animals, there are further things that we can keep our eyes on as we look to the things unseen. So let's give our attention to Brother Mike Cusdin as he delivers the next part of the symposium, Keep Your Eyes on the Things Unseen, God Will Wipe Out Every Tear. My dear brothers and sisters, I wonder, have you cried today, or this week, or this month? If you haven't cried, have you felt like it? Well, if so, please do me the honour of turning to Revelation chapter 21 and verse 4. And let's read these heartwarming words together. Revelation 21 verse 4 where it says, and he will wipe out every tear from their eyes, and death will be no more, neither will mourning nor outcry nor pain be any more, the former things have passed away. Notice, every tear will be wiped out. So take heart, if you are suffering distress, grief, sorrow, anguish you will be healed as Psalm 147 verse 3 states Jehovah will heal the broken hearted and bind up their painful spots just imagine the relief that this will bring to mankind uh, many of you dear ones serve Jehovah loyally despite having painful spots Maybe you cope with illness or old age or distressing family situations like perhaps a disfellowshipped relative or family opposition. Maybe it's economic hardship or the loss of employment or a disappointment perhaps in yourself or in others. Whatever it is that makes you want to cry out in anguish, rest assured, you worship a God who knows what to do. He's cared for his servants in the past over many, many years, despite their pains. I wonder if you can think of a, a Bible account where a faithful one wept with emotional pain. Let's just mention a few, shall we? And what about poor Hannah? At a time when having a child was a matter of great spiritual as well as emotional importance Hannah was barren the Bible says she wept greatly or King David and his men one day they came home from battle to find that their wives and their children had been carried off the Bible record says they wept until they could weep no more I guess we would say they were all cried out. And then uh, there was Hezekiah. Because of his failing health, the Bible says he wept profusely. However, let me read to you what Jehovah said to him, according to Isaiah 38 verse 4. Jehovah said, I have heard your prayers, I have seen your tears. How encouraging, don't you agree? In the Greek scriptures, we might think of the Apostle Peter. After denying Jesus, the Bible says he went outside and wept bitterly. So, if you're serving Jehovah with tears, brothers and sisters, you are not the first and you are not alone. Jehovah knows how you feel and he will keep to his promise to heal your broken heart. In fact, just think for a few moments of the implications of Jehovah's promise at Isaiah 65 and verse 17. We read there, For here I am creating new heavens and a new earth, and the former things will not be called to mind, 
neither will they come up into the heart. Now there's an unseen thing upon which to keep your eyes. Those things that cause you to weep will not come into your heart. Just think, one day someone will say to you, have you had any problems? And you'll say, me? No, never. I can't ever remember having a problem. That will happen to you. That day will come. So take heart from that, brothers and sisters. But what about in the meantime? Well, in the meantime, we have to be honest about it. We've got to keep our integrity. Whether we have problems or not, all of us have to keep on the watch. The psalmist described it in Psalm 126, verse 5, as sowing seed with tears. However, if we're in that situation, we can be safe in the knowledge that Jehovah is acutely aware of our suffering. Just note the beautiful way this is expressed in Psalm 56. And uh, when you've found Psalm 56, have a look at verse 8. Psalm 56 and verse 8. We read there, My being a fugitive, you yourself have reported, do put my tears in your skin bottle. Are they not in your book? Now, interestingly, the skin bottle was used in ancient times. In fact, it's still used even today amongst the nomadic tribes of the... Uh, Sahara uh, to transport safely precious liquids like uh, water, oil or wine. Well now what could be more precious than your tears? Jehovah remembers every single one of them. He sees not only the trials we face but also the emotional impact that they have on us. He appreciates all that we go through to remain faithful to him. To help us to appreciate that, let's now talk to Brother Neil Marsden, who serves as an elder in the Dolgethlai congregation. Uh, Brother Marsden, what difficulties do you face? Well, my wife, Jill, she suffers from multiple sclerosis. And uh, any other problems? Yes, uh, we have two children. Our youngest, Lewis, who's five, he has chronic asthma. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. So how have those problems affected you? Well, obviously, Jill's condition is ongoing. It's not going to go away. And she has to be reasonable as to what she can accomplish. But on occasions, her condition will flare up. And it's been as bad at times when literally she could not walk. As for Lewis, as many parents would understand, uh, managing asthma in a young child is very difficult. But just in addition to that, uh, we have to monitor everything he comes in contact with, everything he eats, in case he should uh, go into anaphylactic shock, which is a life-threatening allergic reaction. Must so at times, it can be difficult. Yeah, it must be really heart-rending to see your, your yes. family suffering in that way. So uh, how would you say Jehovah's helped you to remain faithful despite those problems? Well, two things come immediately to mind. And that is really, firstly, a reliance on Holy Spirit. Uh, we really do just need to stop for a moment and just think how Jehovah does support us. And the second thing we'd like to add to that is just a schedule or a routine, especially when there are so many things to disrupt a schedule, like illness, for example. Having that to fall back on and to rely upon is essential. Uh, we just have a very simple rule in the house. If you're well, you go to the meeting. Very good, that's interesting. Now, uh, is there anything else that you feel that's helped you? Well, there's two other points, really, that do assist us. Of course, the love and support of our family, our brothers and sisters in our congregation and in many other congregations. And also a need for a perspective on the situation. I was just thinking of the words of 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 9. It reminds us, doesn't it, that uh, sufferings are accomplished in the whole association of brothers. You know, we see so many fine examples, and that's really what does help us. Very good. That's encouraging, Brother Marsden. Thank you for your steadfast example. So, dear brothers, 
keep going. You may be sowing seed with tears now, but very soon you will not even be able to remember them because God will wipe out every tear. What though about the countless tears that have been shed because of the death of loved ones? Brother David Callaby will next consider the subject, keep your eyes on the things unseen, all those in the memorial tombs will come out. In that moving conversation that Jesus had with Martha immediately following the death of her brother Lazarus, Jesus gave Martha and her sister Mary and other close friends very sound reasons for comfort. Let's just uh, look back at those words of Jesus that we find recorded in uh, the book of John, chapter 11, and verse 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that exercises faith in me, even though he dies, will come to life. And then as you cast your eyes a few words down, he says, looking directly at Martha, do you believe this? No greater source of comfort could we have than that guarantee of Jesus. He is the resurrection. Brothers and sisters, you dear ones that have lost loved ones, close friends, family members, and others in death. Do you believe this? It is a wonderful promise for us. And even though in the heart-wrenching, agonizing, aching moments of parting from our loved one, in time, that promise, as we meditate on it, really will be a guarantee for us. Jesus' Father, Jehovah, also reassures us how he feels. When Job reflected on the mortality of man, just listen to what God had recorded in the book of Job, chapter 14, and let's just look at verse 15. Just look at the last sentence in verse 14 to pick up the thread there. Job says, All the days of my compulsory service I shall wait until my relief comes. You will call and I myself shall answer you. For the work of your hands you will have a yearning. A yearning. Jehovah is yearning for the time when he can bring back to life all those faithful, loyal servants of his. Likely billions of others too will get the opportunity of life in a paradise earth. Jehovah is not going to wait a minute longer than is necessary. He has a yearning. Brothers, that should really give you great comfort. It should strengthen our faith and help us to realize that we can meditate and visualize on the many Bible accounts of resurrections. Let us just look at one. We're going to look at the one in 1 Kings chapter 17. It's the account you probably remember of Elijah when he was uh, very hospitably cared for over a period of time by the widow up in Zarephath. Just to give you a little bit of a background to that, um, the young boy and his mother had uh, put themselves out 
to accommodate Elijah. They were worried about their uh, material uh, food uh, resources, and yet Elijah had reassured them Jehovah would care for them. And uh, here they are as a result of this uh, divinely induced drought that had provide, pro caused a widespread famine uh, here in this home. The boy, not yet a teenager, gets sick and dies. His mother is distraught. She can't be comforted. Can you imagine Elijah's feelings as his emotions churn inside him, puzzling, wondering why his miracle-working God, Jehovah, has permitted this? Elijah gently takes the boy from his mother and carries his lifeless body upstairs to the attic room that they had so kindly provided for him. He tenderly lays the boy on the bed and in a very deep emotional prayer pleads with Jehovah as we can now pick up in our account in chapter 17 of 1 Kings and verse 20. He began to call out to Jehovah, saying, Oh, Jehovah, my God, is it also upon the widow with whom I am residing as an alien that you must bring injury by putting her son to death? He proceeded to stretch himself upon the child three times and call to Jehovah and say, Oh, Jehovah, my God, please, please, cause the soul of this child to come back within him. Can you imagine how Elijah felt when he sees that lifeless form begin to heave. His first breath comes back into his body. His eyelids begin to flicker. His eyes open, this time brilliant, alive, sparkling. A smile of recognition comes across his face as he sees Elijah, who he knows and has come to love. Downstairs, his mother, probably being comforted by neighbors who were aware of the son's sickness and subsequent death, hears the door creak. And a little voice says, Mummy, where's my mummy? She runs to the stairs, absolutely ecstatic with joy, weeping uncontrollably as she grasps her son, now fully alive. Can you imagine that scene, brothers? Think about it. Dwell on it. Absorb it. Enjoy it. This will be your privilege in the resurrection when Jehovah brings back your loved ones. How much we long for that time. This is indeed just a foretaste as we consider Jehovah's loving provision. Jehovah is yearning to bring these ones back to life for the time to come when he and his dear son Christ Jesus will say, wake up, dear loyal one, come and meet your family. That can be your experience, brothers and sisters. Do you wonder, perhaps, why Elijah had such confidence that Jehovah would fulfill this? After all, this was the very first resurrection. Do you think Jehovah had given him some indication that this might be the outcome? Well, keep these questions in mind. 
write them down. Think about them. It may be your experience and your privilege to meet Elijah at some time. Ask him. Are there questions, for example, you would like to ask other Bible characters? Maybe that little Israelite girl. Maybe Abel. So many questions that we could ask these individuals about their life as they served Jehovah. So why not make a list and uh, write them down so that you can ask them. We've asked uh, brother and sister here if they would like to uh, also focus on this and uh, they're going to tell us what they would like to ask. First of all, we've got brother Ben Holmes from Wolverhampton Finchfield. He's an auxiliary pioneer. So Ben, what Bible character would you like to meet? Well, I've always thought about Job because of the example that he set for us and how he was faithful to Jehovah. Job. All right. So what specially sparks your interest about Job? Well, it was mainly because when he was tested by Satan, he wouldn't have known why he was being tested, yet he still managed to keep faithful all the way through. Excellent. And what's the question you're going to have written down for him? Well, I'd like to ask him how he kept faithful, what kept him strong, and how he felt being blessed by Jehovah numerous times afterwards. Excellent. Thank you for that. That stimulates our mind then. Sister Ann Cooper is also a regular pioneer in Wolverhampton Finchfield. Got a grown-up family. So, Sister Cooper, perhaps we can ask you what Bible character would you like to meet? I think there'd be many, but one particular for me would be Ruth because of her industriousness and her humility. And any particular interest about Ruth that you'd like to focus on in asking her? She could have gone home, she could have gone back to her people, worship her gods, but she, no, she chose to stay with Naomi and worship the true God Jehovah. She was determined to uh, worship him and thus known for the, to be an excellent woman in the scriptures. Right. So, what's the question? The question would be... Did she know that she was King David's grandmother and the ancestress to Jesus Christ? Wow, that will be interesting. That'll be interesting to be there when she realizes that. Excellent. Thank you both very much for giving us your thoughts. That gives us an idea of what we can think about. So, brothers and sisters, have you thought about what it'll be like on the day your own dear loved ones are brought back to life again. The Watchtower of December the 15th, 1991, made this comment. Funerals may be replaced by welcoming sessions for those brought up in the resurrection, including our own loved ones who have gone down into death. Maybe we'll have lists of all those who've recently come back. How we look forward to that time and, of course, maybe there will be many surprises in our own family. You never knew who great Aunt Ada was, did you? Do you wonder who your great-grandparents were? Maybe you just have pictures. She looked pretty. Or, oh, he looked a tyrant. Well, you may have opportunity to find out. What about your great-great-grandparents as we go back in time? What a wonderful privilege that Jehovah gives us. We invite all of you brothers and sisters to be there at those welcoming sessions when all those in the memorial tombs will come out. Please give your attention, brothers and sisters, to Brother Andrew McNeil from the London Bethel family, who will conclude this symposium by developing the theme, Keep Your Eyes on the Things Unseen, God Will Be All Things to Everyone. Can you now see what the future holds? With the preceding eight talks, our spiritual vision should now be as sharp as ever. So what do you see first on the horizon? 
Well, from our first talk, it was the swift and complete destruction of Babylon the Great, the world empire of false religion. And it's imminent, as indicated by the drying up of her support from Revelation 18 and verse 8. Our second talk showed that enraged Gog of Magog launches an all-out attack on God's people. But we need not fear because Gog's hordes will be made to acknowledge Jehovah's name and sovereignty, from Ezekiel chapter 38. The third talk showed that all these kingdoms, all human governments, are crushed by God's kingdom, just as the image in Daniel's vision was pulverized by the stone in Daniel 2 and verse 44. The fourth talk showed the binding and abyssing of Satan and the demons. Brothers, can you imagine the relief you'll feel when false religion has gone, Gog's hordes have gone, all these human governments have gone, and Satan and the demons have gone? Then, the tone of the talks changed. Because instead of talking about destruction and removal, the fifth talk was about construction. You will certainly build houses and have occupancy. A prophecy from Isaiah 65 and verse 21. The sixth talk showed that you will play with your favorite animal. I saw an extraordinary thing on uh, the BBC where this hippo had been hand-reared by a couple and, uh, you know, a hippo is the most dangerous of all the animals in Africa because it's so aggressive and unpredictable and strong. But this hippo, it was like a little pet. It weighed tons, but it would come in to the living room and lie on a, on a mattress, a double bed mattress, and put its enormous head on the knee of the lady and look at her with adoring little beady eyes like a little dog. So if in this system, a hippo can be a pet, then it's true. In the new system, you can have a panda, a koala, a tiger, or a lion, whatever you like, even a hippo. And then the seventh talk showed that even if you're sowing with tears right now, you'll have no cause to shed any tears any longer in the new world, from, Isaiah, uh, from Psalms 126 and verse 5. And the eighth talk said that your joy will be boundless when you see and touch resurrected loved ones and meet the cloud of faithful ones of old. Now, the first of those events, the destruction of Babylon the Great, is imminent. So we must stay spiritually alert and follow the counsel that Jesus gave us in Luke 21, verses 34 to 36. Please look at that. Luke 21 and verses 34 to 36, where it says, But pay attention to yourselves, that your hearts never become weighed down with overeating and heavy drinking and anxieties of life, and suddenly that day be instantly upon you as a snare, for it will come in upon all those dwelling upon the face of the earth. Keep awake then, all the time making supplication that you may succeed in escaping all these things, that are destined to occur and in standing before the Son of Man. Other events are fulfilled a thousand and more years from now. And that's what we really want to turn our attention to now. Some of the final things that the Bible has prophesied for the new system. And really, this is one of the most touching of all the events that are prophesied. The Apostle Paul tells us about it. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verses 24 to 26. This is about the grand fulfillment of God's purpose. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 24 says this. Next, the end, when he hands over the kingdom to his God and Father when he's brought to nothing all government and all authority and power. For he, Jesus, must rule as king until he has put all enemies under his feet. 
as the last enemy, death is to be brought to nothing. And then verse 28, But when all things will have been subjected to him, then the Son himself will also subject himself to the one who subjected all things to him, that God may be all things to everyone. Now let's meditate on that for a moment. Let's look at it first of all from the perspective of Jesus Christ and the 144,000. Jesus said when he was on earth that all authority in heaven and earth had been, had been given to him. And Philippians chapter 2 shows how he uses it. It says there that God exalted him to a superior position, kindly gave him the name that's above every other name, so that in the name of Jesus every knee should bend of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the ground, and every tongue should openly acknowledge that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So yes, we see that Jesus has this great authority, but its purpose is to glorify God. And when everything is accomplished, what does Corinthians tell us that he will do? He hands back all that authority to his God and Father. What an outstanding example of humility Jesus is. What about the 144,000? Well, they are shown in Revelation chapter 4 as casting their crowns before God's throne. So they too will do the same thing, hand back their authority to God. What a remarkable example of humility and devotion to God. Let's now look at this from a, a second perspective, and that's God's perspective. God wants to be all things to everyone. Before Adam and Eve sinned, they were part of Jehovah's universal family. There was no intermediary government needed between God and them. Jehovah was all things to them. Now despite all that's happened, and despite what humans have done, God wants the same direct relationship between himself and each one of us. He wants to be our closest friend. He wants to mean everything to us. Our relationship with God will enter a new era. The Worldwide Security Under the Prince of Peace book on page 181 says this, When the Prince of Peace hands over the kingdom to his God at the end of the thousand year reign, Earth's inhabitants will be made aware of this act of their adoptive father, with him, Jesus, as their royal example, they will likewise subject themselves in a new aspect to the Most High God. Now, for the first time, they will render loving submission directly to Jehovah. Yes, worship in all sincerity and truth, no longer requiring the priestly services of Jesus, not even when praying. Don't you find it so touching that Jehovah wants to hold you so close as a friend of his? But there's always a choice. In Revelation chapter 20 and verses 7 to 10, it tells us what happens next to Satan and the demons. They are released. And they present all of earth's inhabitants with a final choice as to whether they want to worship Jehovah or not. And in the latter part of verse 9 and then verse 10, it says to all of those who do not choose worship of Jehovah, a fire came down out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil who was misleading them was hurled into the lake of fire and sulfur where both the wild beast and the false prophet already were. And they will be tormented or kept day and night forever in eternal destruction. Thereafter, all rebels human and spirits will be gone forever. The entire universal family will joyfully worship Jehovah who will be all things to everyone. May this morning's review of future events strengthen our resolve to uphold our loving God Jehovah's sovereignty now, a thousand years from now, and even forever.
We thoroughly enjoyed those invigorating talks. And now, with our eyes focused on the things unseen, it's appropriate that we stand, if able, and praise Jehovah for our happy hope by singing song number 222, Keep Your Eyes on the Prize. After the song, you may remain standing during the announcements to follow. That's song 222. have some announcements. For your information, brothers, the lost and found departments are located in the concourses of the Booth and Stand, Block 20, and the main John Smith Stand, Block 14. If you have lost anything or found anything, could you please use these facilities before leaving the stadium this evening? This is an important announcement for all literature coordinators. There will be a limited supply of the new releases set aside for congregations. We would ask congregation literature coordinators to please collect these from the book room located in the lower level of the John Smith stand, block 14, during the lunch break. To assist the parking department, 
Could brothers that will still be working this evening after 5.30pm please listen to this announcement. If you're parked on the South Car Parks 1 and 2, please move your vehicles to the North or West Car Parks around 5.30pm so the other car parks can be closed down. Now we have four greetings, brothers and sisters, which uh, I'll go through. The first greeting from the land of lakes and volcanoes, the Bethel family in Nicaragua send warm greetings. The second greeting, we have warm love from the 1,300 currently assembled at the Surrey Assembly Hall, enjoying the very first of three district conventions to be held there. Our third greeting, we also have greetings from the six missionaries in the Dar es Salaam Tanzania missionary home and the 934 publishers in the Dar es Salaam number one circuit in Tanzania. And the fourth greeting from Brazil, the 1,052 members of the Bethel family send love and greetings to all assembled at the Stoke Keep on the Watch District Convention. We're happy to receive these greetings, aren't we? You may be seated. It is our pleasure to extend a very warm welcome to all of you who have come to hear the public Bible discourse entitled, How Can You Survive the End of the World? What exactly is meant by the expression, the end of the world? Can humans survive such an astonishing event? We invite you to consider the Bible's answers to these important questions. Kevin Taylor from the Warsaw Wilmot Congregation is our speaker. Brother Taylor, you have our attention. I wonder how many here know who Bear Grylls is. Well, maybe you're like me and you thought it was perhaps some new lean machine for cooking grizzly steaks. But believe it or not, Bear Grylls is the name of a well-known survival expert. And on his TV shows in recent times, he gave what have been described as potential life-saving tips. I hope you've got your pens because they might prove useful. Now, amongst these potential life-saving tips are how to eat scorpions, spiders and other insects, how to escape a mud bog, and how to travel through alligator-infested swamps. Uh, not much use for me where I live, I don't know about you. So much for survival tips. But don't worry, because we're going to see how every single one in attendance today can become a survival expert in their own right. And we're not talking about surviving some trek through a jungle or wading through a mud bog. No, we're going to see how we can survive something far greater as we answer the question, how can you survive the end of the world? So what exactly is the end of the world? Understandably, that very expression often invokes anxiety. You see, many fear that it means destruction of the entire Earth by a nuclear holocaust, or maybe a collision with a celestial body, or some other cataclysm. But that is so different to what the Bible says. You see, though the Bible speaks of the end of the world, it actually guarantees that the planet Earth will never be destroyed and will never be depopulated. So what does that expression, the end of the world, mean from the Bible standpoint? Well, to help us answer that, please take your copy of the Bible and open it with me to 2 Peter chapter 3. And let's read together, first of all, verses 5 and 6. 2 Peter 3, verses 5 and 6. Now you may find it interesting 
that these verses actually refer to a time in the past when man experienced the end of the world. See if you can spot it. Verse 5 and 6. It says there, For according to their wish, this fact escapes their notice, that there were heavens from of old, and an earth standing compactly out of water, and in the midst of water by the word of God. And then notice, And by those means, the world of that time suffered destruction, when it was deluged with water. Do you notice how Peter makes reference here to the days of Noah and how the world of ungodly men came to an end in his day? Well, now notice verse 7. It says, But by the same word, the heavens and the earth that are now are stored up for fire, which represents destruction and are being reserved to the day of judgment and notice and of the destruction of the ungodly men. So Peter here refers to a future time when the world will end and so logically just as the world suffered destruction in Noah's day so too it's the world of wicked mankind that will be destroyed in the near future. Now that's quite a thought. But what we want to know now is just how will God end this wicked world? Well, there are three ways that this will be achieved. You may like to note them. The first is this. In confusion, wicked ones themselves will kill one another. Can we really believe that this remarkable event will happen? Well, how would you feel if I said you can because it's been done before. Interestingly, Jehovah at times used this very strategy to deliver the Israelites. Would you like to see one such account? Well, turn with me please to Judges chapter 7. And we're going to read verse 22 together. And while you're turning that up, let me just set the scene of this Bible chapter. Just imagine you're there. An army had come against the Israelites who were led at the time by Judge Gideon. There were 135,000 jeering troops facing you across the valley plain. They'd got war camels, chariots and horses that would strike fear into any foot soldier. And on your side are 32,000 men. Before the battle, Gideon stands and he shouts this. Who is there afraid and trembling? Let him retire. Phew. A collective sigh of relief. And two-thirds, including me, if I've been there, I have to be honest, abandoned the battleground. In time, Gideon is instructed to reduce that number to just 300 crack troops by Jehovah. And then this small band split into three divisions and under cover of darkness they take up their positions. Are you there? Suddenly, the stillness of the night is broken as each of Gideon's 300 men shatter jars that they've been instructed to take with them. They blow horns that they've got by their side. And then the cry, Jehovah's sword and Gideon's. Do you want to see what happens? Have a look at verse 22 of Judges 7. It says there in part, And the 300 continued to blow the horns, and Jehovah proceeded to set the sword of each one against the other in all the camp. Total victory to Gideon and his 300 men. But did you spot it? Did you see how it was done in verse 22? It said, Jehovah proceeded to set the sword of each one against the other in all the camp. And yes, we can have confidence that this method will be used to end this wicked world today because it's been done before. So how about the second line of attack? Well, interestingly, Jehovah God will wield forces of nature to bring unrighteous ones to ruin. Now again, that's quite a remarkable claim. I'm sure you'll agree. But guess what? 
He's done it before. The Bible testifies to God's ability to direct natural forces carefully, first of all for the benefit of his people, but also for the demise of opposers. Think of the very occasion that Peter referred to in our opening verse, the flood of Noah's day. Genesis chapter 7 tells us how it rained for 40 days and 40 nights and how the water covered the highest mountain by 22 feet. But faithful ones survived. And who hasn't heard of the way the mighty Red Sea was used in the time of Moses? First of all to save the Israelites, but then Jehovah uses that very same force of nature to wipe out an entire army of the then world power, Egypt. Yes, we can have confidence that Jehovah will use forces of nature to end this wicked world of the ungodly. That's right, because he's done it before. Now that brings us to our third and final way. The mopping up operation, if you like. You see, the third and final way that God will end this wicked world is by having Jesus and his angels complete the extermination of evildoers. Oh yes, powerful and numerous, the angels are fully capable of fulfilling this assignment. How do we know? I think you've got it. It's been done before. Look with me at 2 Kings chapter 19 and verse 35 for one such occasion. 2 Kings 19 and verse 35. Now on this occasion, Sennacherib, who was the leader of a very cruel Assyrian power, he was determined to take Jerusalem. And he made the mistake of taunting Jehovah. But now he's got 200,000 troops camped outside Jerusalem, ready for action. And they settle for one more night's sleep. It proved to be a very long night's sleep. Read with me 2 Kings 19, verse 35, please. It says, And it came about on that night that the angel of Jehovah proceeded to go out and strike down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. When people rose up early in the morning, why? There all of them were dead carcasses. One angel takes out 185,000 troops in one night without so much of a murmur. So what can thousands of thousands of angels do to the ungodly of this world? No contest. Jesus and the angels will need no help from humans. Brothers and sisters and friends, I'm only too delighted to tell you that as God's people, we will stand still and see the salvation of Jehovah in our behalf. And just as in Bible times, angels were used to deliver God's people, so too it will be the same today. Think, amongst others, Daniel was protected by an angel while in the lion's den. Three Hebrews were delivered from the most savage furnace, again, by an angel. Yes, angels will deliver God's people, and we're confident of that. Why? Because they've done it before. So now the important question. How can we survive the end of this wicked world? Well, to help us do that, we need to make it clear that it is only those who meet Jehovah's requirements that will survive. It is impossible to hide from him. So we really need a survival plan, don't we? And we need to consult a survival expert. Don't worry, it's not going to be Bear Grylls with his mud bogs and alligator infested swamps. We're going to consult one of the finest survival experts ever to walk this earth. How many others can lay claim to surviving a global deluge? Now surely that's a survival expert. 
So for a moment, let's consider how the man Noah provides a pattern for our very survival today. So just why was it that Jehovah kept Noah safe when he brought a deluge upon a world of ungodly people. Well, if we could just sum it up before we go into detail, it was because Noah met Jehovah's requirements for salvation. And since neither Jehovah nor his righteous standards ever change, copying Noah's life pattern will ensure our survival. Can you see that? Does that not make sense? So, for a moment, Let's look at seven survival tips that Noah's life provides us with and let's pay close attention, just as if our very lives depend upon it, because in reality, they do. So for our first tip, it's this. Noah did not succumb to pressure from the world. Now we know, don't we, that Noah's family became the laughing stock of the neighbourhood. They became objects of abuse and ridicule. And yet despite that, they refused to, join, to be pressured to join the masses. Now we must take a similar stand today. But therein lies the challenge, especially to young ones. Because the world is made to look so appealing. In fact, it can be illustrated by... Perhaps thinking about a time when we've gone out to buy an item of clothing. Maybe a nice suit or a nice dress. In no time you find what you've been looking for. The colour's right. It's just your style. And perhaps more importantly, the price is right. And then you go and have a closer look. But you notice that some of the stitching is actually missing on important seams and it will show. You can see that some of the fabric is frayed. That suit or dress that you first thought so attractive, so right for you, it really is just a cheap and inferior product. Isn't that what the world's like? At first glance, the world may look really attractive. You know, that easygoing, live-as-you-please lifestyle. But just think of what quality is the fabric and stitching of this world. Brothers and sisters, it is cheap and inferior compared to the promises recorded in God's word. And I'm sure you don't need me to tell you that even the moral fabric of the so-called leaders and politicians of this world leaves a lot to be desired. This world is coming apart at the very seams. And like Noah, we must remain no part of the world if we're going to escape passing away with it. Point two. Noah resisted the influence of wicked spirit creatures, and so must we. Now, interestingly, in Noah's day, we know that wicked angels materialized to have immoral relations with women. So powerful was the pull of immorality that it caused these once perfect creatures to forsake the very presence of Jehovah himself. The world of Noah's day was filled with violence as a result and their influence was terrible and also the influence of their hybrid offspring was felt by all. Now while Noah may have been able to see these materialized angels and their offspring, We certainly can't. Because, you see, to escape the flood, they dematerialized and they returned to the spirit realm. But even though we can't see them, I'm sure you agree their influence is as strong today as at any other time in human history. Just think, what are the popular forms of entertainment in this ungodly world? Sexual immorality. Wasn't that what caused them to come down to earth in the first place? Violence. Didn't they cause that once they were here? And then, well, this speaks for itself. Spiritism of some sort or other. You know, it's just like we're swimming in the sea, really. You may be swimming on a day when the sea looks calm and placid to the naked eye. 
but very often there are powerful undercurrents that can easily take us out of reach of our family and friends. And isn't it true? You never notice how far it pushes you until it's too late. Likewise, as we go through our daily activities, our thoughts and our feelings, if not checked, may come under that unseen influence. Don't you agree there is a strong demonic undercurrent that is designed to take us away from the protection of our spiritual family? Brothers and sisters, if we expect to survive the end of this world, then like Noah, we must resist demon influence by completely rejecting immorality, violence, and spiritistic practices. Now that brings us to point number three on our survival plan. And this really affects maybe not everybody in the audience, but a few. And it's this, that Noah was blameless as a family head. Can you imagine Noah being so busy with other activities that when the time came to get into the ark, he actually goes into the ark with his wife and he just turns to her and he says, uh, Hey love, where's the boys? Never. His family remained united in sacred service and his wife and his three sons and their wives are all spoken of with approval in the scriptures. Now as family heads, are we doing the same thing? Oh, we may have God assigned duties that we need to carry out, but we should never be too busy to know exactly where our families are on the road to spirituality. As family heads, we must be exemplary in leading our families in spiritual discussions and in spiritual activities, just like Noah. After all, we want our families to survive. That leads to point number four. Noah maintained a close relationship with Jehovah. How do we know? Well, if you'd like to know the answer to that, turn with me, please, to Genesis chapter 6. And we'll read together verses 8 and 9. There really are some beautiful expressions here to describe Noah. Genesis 6, verses 8 and 9. Okay? It says there, But Noah found favour in the eyes of Jehovah. This is the history of Noah. Noah was a righteous man. He proved himself faultless among his contemporaries. Noah walked with the true God. I'm sure you'd agree they are beautiful expressions, aren't they, to describe the man Noah. Did you notice he walked with God and he found favour in Jehovah's eyes? Doesn't that paint a beautiful word picture? Noah actually walking with Jehovah. The illustration's ready-made, isn't it? A small boy walking down the road with his father. This little son imitates his father's every move. His face glows with admiration for his dad. What a close relationship that pictures. Now fittingly, Jehovah uses this to describe the man Noah. More than anything else, Noah treasured his relationship with Jehovah. The question is, do we? Today, we must safeguard our relationship with Jehovah as our most precious possession, because it is. Yes, Jehovah has held out his hand to us, and like that child, we've grabbed it without hesitation, ready to walk with the true God. And wherever that journey may lead us, we trust the guidance of our Heavenly Father, and we follow with confidence. Come what may, our firm grip on Jehovah's hand remains unbroken. And as long as it does, we will survive the end of this world. Point number five. Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Now, 
I'm sure you'd agree that it's fair to say that Noah was a man who had strong religious beliefs. But he didn't keep them to himself, did he? Though his territory was difficult, though he had many responsibilities, he persevered. The world of his day were put on notice and they were given the option of survival. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses too are known for their strong religious beliefs. But we can't keep them to ourselves. To avoid blood guilt, we must be zealous preachers and teachers. Our very survival depends on it. But always remember, brothers and sisters, that as with Noah, our success does not depend on how people respond to the preaching. You see, if like Noah we are preachers of righteousness, then we are successful. And that will lead us to survival. For our sixth point, I'd like to do this slightly differently. I'd like to look at a scripture first, and that's Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. And as we read this verse together, maybe you'd like to work out what point number six is, our survival tip number six. That's Hebrews chapter 11, and it's verse 7. Have you got it? It says this. By faith, Noah, after being given divine warning of things not yet beheld, showed godly fear and constructed an ark for the saving of his household. And through this faith, he condemned the world. And he became an heir of the righteousness that is according to faith. Did you get it from that scripture? Well, I'm sure you have. You see, survival tip number six is Noah kept his faith strong. Just on that point, let me ask you, do you think Noah had what we could call a fire escape faith? Something that was only used in times of emergencies when no other avenue of escape was available? Hardly. I mean, to just build that ark was a mammoth project. We've already found out this week, this weekend, that it would have taken 40, possibly 50 years to build that ark. On top of that, he was a preacher of righteousness. On top of that, he made sure that he cared for his family. And think, he didn't know exactly when the flood would come, did he? But he was sure that Jehovah would bring that deluge. That's not a fire escape faith. His whole life was built around his strong faith in God and in God's promises. Rather than make excuses of being advanced in age or of never having built an ark before, Noah proved by his works that his faith was genuine and strong. As we ponder our own survival, we do well to examine whether ours is a fire escape faith. Do we find that we only turn to Jehovah in emergencies when there's no other avenue of escape? I'm sure you'll agree we must avail ourselves of Jehovah's provisions for building and maintaining a strong faith, not allowing doubts of any sort to make inroads. And we prove by our works that our faith is genuine, recognizing as Noah did that a genuine faith is vital for survival. And so our seventh and final survival point. Noah maintained strict obedience. In Genesis chapter 6 verse 22, there is a lovely phrase that epitomizes the man Noah. Do you remember after telling us that Noah proceeded to do according to all that God had commanded him, it then says four words. He did just so. Don't you think that sums Noah up? I love those four words, don't you? He did just so. No, he didn't take shortcuts in the construction of the ark, nor did he procrastinate adopting a wait-and-see attitude. He did just so. Now we're in a very similar position to Noah. You see, although we know neither the day nor the hour for the end of the world, we must keep on the watch. 
and Jehovah provides instruction for our survival. So let's not fool ourselves into thinking that there must be some easier way. Jehovah's way is the only way. And as this world speeds to its end, not one of us can afford to adopt a wait-and-see attitude. Do we tend to procrastinate when it comes to spiritual matters? Don't leave it till tomorrow to answer that, brothers and sisters. And don't forget, Jehovah shut the door of the ark before that deluge began. And likewise, it will be too late to enter the modern-day ark, our spiritual paradise, once the great tribulation begins. As we adopt the survival plan that Noah's life shows us, may Jehovah look down upon us and say, they did just so. So, brothers and sisters, can you think what it will be like to come out through the great tribulation? Without doubt, happy will be those who survive the end of the world. As clearly substantiated in the scriptures, this wicked world's end is imminent. Bible prophecy is unfolding before our very eyes as this system is, is, is on its last shaky legs. But if we imitate Noah's life pattern, we will survive. Try and think how happy and thankful Noah and his family were as they were preserved safe and dry through that deluge. How thrilling for them to step out of the ark onto an earth cleansed of all unrighteousness. Don't you think there must have been a real sense of peace and joy at that time? Yes, at the protective hand of Jehovah, they had survived the end of the world. Well, what of today? Please take your Bibles and turn our final verse in this talk together in Revelation chapter 7, verse 14. And as we read it, let's just think what it will mean for you and I. Revelation chapter 7, verse 14. Now, interestingly, just a few verses earlier, the Apostle John had been given a vision of a great crowd. And naturally, he wanted to know who they were. Let's see. Let's pick it up just part the way through verse 14. Because it says, And he said to me, These are the ones that come out of the great tribulation, and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. How thrilling. A great crowd of Noah-like people coming out of the great tribulation into a clean new world. Can you sense the peace now the old world is gone? Can you feel the joy of surviving the great tribulation? Yes, at the protective hand of our great God Jehovah, we will survive the end of the world. Brothers, sisters and all our friends attending our Stoke District Convention, may you be numbered among this happy throng of survivors. How grateful we are that Jehovah has provided such encouragement and insight in the pages of his inspired word. If anyone would like to have Bible discussions free of charge at a time and place convenient for you, you're invited to give your name and contact information to one of the attendants. We will be happy to arrange for one of Jehovah's Witnesses to supply you with more details about the Bible's promises. It has been a delight for us to be here this morning to enjoy all the fine teaching. The noontime break will give us an opportunity to talk about the morning's program and to contemplate what's in store for the afternoon. We invite all 9,476 to stand, if able, and join in singing song number 215, which reminds us of Noah's example. The song is entitled, Extending Mercy to Others. Let's all sing song 215. 
number 215. just remind you the afternoon session will begin at 1:20 p.m. You're listening to the Watchtower Convention in Stoke. Broadcasting on 87.7 MHz FM and operating under the call sign Watchtower Convention Stoke. This is a test transmission operating on a restricted service license. We are transmitting on 87.7 MHz FM and operating under the call sign Watchtower Convention. This is a test transmission operating on a restricted service license. We are transmitting on 87.7 MHz FM and operating under the call sign Watchtower Convention.
This is a test transmission operating on a restricted service license. We are transmitting on 87.7 MHz FM and operating under the call sign Watchtower Convention. This is a test transmission operating on a restricted service license. We are transmitting on 87.7 MHz FM and operating under the call sign
afternoon program begins with a song that reminds us of Jehovah's great mercy. Everyone is invited to stand if you are able and sing together song number 139 entitled Listen to the News of the Kingdom. That's song 139. Please be seated. The first part of our program this afternoon will be a live action drama. Please keep in mind that no one is allowed anywhere on or around the stage to take pictures during the drama. Although video recorders and other cameras are permitted, if operated from your seat, please be considerate of others by not blocking their view. And please do not use flash or any other form of electronic lighting. No cameras or recording devices are to be connected to the electrical or sound systems at the convention, nor should any equipment be placed in aisles or in traffic areas. The drama about to unfold before us will reveal the depth of Jehovah's concern for each of his little sheep. Brother Andrew Holland from the Crew North congregation has been working with a cast of characters for several weeks and we invite him to introduce the drama entitled your brother was dead and came to life. When Jesus walked the earth, his teachings about God's love and forgiveness drew all types of people to him. 
Many were known sinners. Others were despised tax collectors, Jews who were employed by the Roman Empire to extract money from the populace. But the Pharisees and the scribes also took interest in Jesus. They, however, thought themselves better than the common man. And they muttered regarding Jesus, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Let's read Jesus' response to this comment, beginning at Luke chapter 15 and verse 4. Jesus asked the Pharisees and the scribes, What man of you with a hundred sheep, on losing one of them, will not leave the ninety-nine behind in the wilderness and go for the lost one until he finds it? Those religious leaders knew that they all would do so. Jesus continued, And when he has found it, he puts it upon his shoulders and rejoices. And when he gets home, he calls his friends and his neighbours together, saying to them, Rejoice with me, because I have found my sheep that was lost. Then, to make his point, Jesus went even further. He said, I tell you that thus there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner that repents than over 99 righteous ones who have no need of repentance. Just think of that. When we repent of our sins, it makes Jehovah himself happy. Jesus then gave another illustration. He asked, Or what woman with ten drachma coins, if she loses one drachma coin, does not light a lamp and sweep her house and search carefully until she finds it? Indeed, none of us likes to lose something valuable. Jesus continued, And when she has found it, she calls the women who are her friends and neighbours together, saying, Rejoice with me, because I have found the drachma coin that I lost. Then, to drive his point home, Jesus added, Thus I tell you, joy arises among the angels of God over one sinner that repents. What was the lesson of these two illustrations? Simply this. If Jehovah and the angels rejoice when a sinner turns around, so should we. But did the Pharisees and the scribes get the point? Apparently not, for Jesus went on to relate a parable that has become well known around the world. It is known as the parable of the prodigal or wasteful son. The parable begins at Luke chapter 15, verse 11. Please, open your Bible to this passage. Follow along as we listen to a dramatized reading of the account. Try to visualize what is happening. Using your imagination, fill in the details of the setting as well as the thoughts and feelings of the characters. Let's listen. A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the part of the property that falls to my share. Then the father divided his means of living to his sons. Later, after not many days, the younger son gathered all things together. Then he traveled abroad into a distant country, and there squandered his property by living a debauched life. When he had spent everything, 
A severe famine occurred throughout that country, and he started to be in need. He even went and attached himself to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him into his fields to herd swine. And he used to desire to be filled with the carob pods which the swine were eating, and no one would give him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many hired men of my father are abounding with bread? while I am perishing here from famine. I will rise and journey to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So he rose and went to his father. Eliezer, someone's coming our way. Who could that poor ragged man be? It looks like... It is! It is my son! Moved with pity, the father ran to meet his son. He then embraced him and tenderly kissed him. Oh, my son, you've returned! You've come home! Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. Eliezer, quick! Bring out a robe, the best one, and clothe him with it and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fattened young bull, slaughter it and let us eat and enjoy ourselves. Because this my son was dead and came to life again. He was lost and was found. And they started to enjoy themselves. Now his older son was in the field and as he came and got near the house, he heard a music concert and dancing. So he called one of the servants to him. Eliezer, what's going on? Why all this festivity? My lord, your brother has come, and your father slaughtered the fattened young bull because he got your brother back in good health. What? I want no part of this. Then his father came out to him. Son, your brother has returned. Come, let us welcome him. Father, here it is so many years I have slaved for you, and never once did I transgress your commandment. And yet to me, you never once gave a kid for me to enjoy myself with my friends. But as soon as this your son, who ate up your means of living with harlots, arrived, you slaughtered the fattened young bull for him. Child, you have always been with me, and all the things that are mine are yours. But we just had to enjoy ourselves and rejoice, because this your brother was dead and came to life, and he was lost and was found. Jesus, uh, Jesus probably did not base the parable of the prodigal son on just one family's experience. Rather, he drew on his unerring understanding of human nature and his intimate knowledge of his father's mercy and forgiveness. Thus, the parable teaches us much about Jehovah's own fatherly love and his willingness to forgive repentant sinners. Indeed, it contains many lessons that can help Christian families and congregations today when one member strays from Jehovah but wants to return. In Jesus' parable, there were important lessons that both the younger and the older son needed to learn. How, though, might the story play out in a modern setting? Let us see.
David? Dad, I really have to go. David, wait a minute, please. I just can't understand why you don't want to keep working with me. What's wrong with our little family business? Look, Dad, it's not that I don't like working for you. I just want to try doing things on my own, just for a little while. But, David, what happened to all those goals you set for yourself last year? What goals? You told your mother and me that after you graduated, you wanted to work part-time and pioneer. Oh, yeah, those goals. Was that just talk? There's nothing wrong with working for someone else, son, but will the schedule allow you to pioneer? Keep working for me, and you can. I know I said that, but you know, Dad, things have changed. Changed? How? I've changed. In what sense? I've changed, you know, in my outlook on things. I guess I... I'm confused. I'm not sure what I want. I'm burned out because of school. I just want to rest and take things easy for a while. It's just for a little while, Dad, I promise. Besides, I already have another job. Another job? Already? You got a job? Doing what? Al got me a job at the computer store where he works. Al? Oh, brother, this beats everything. David, I'm very concerned about you. Why didn't you talk to me first? Dave, all the brothers know how spiritually wishy-washy Al is these days. All he does anymore is watch movies and play video games. You've got to be kidding. Movies and video games. Is that the best you can come up with? It's just his recreation. Even if it is, I still don't think that taking this job is a good idea. It's just for a few months. It's not about the money. It's about me. I just want to get out on my own a little. Do something myself. I'll set you up with a couple of jobs where you can be your own boss. Dad, please. You're treating me as if I'm going to leave the truth. I'm not. I never said such a thing. Dad, if you think I'm going to get myself into some kind of trouble, I promise you I won't. All I want is to have a little freedom before, you know, before life gets really serious and I have to buckle down. Trust me, Dad, for once, just this once, please. Look, David, we've talked about all of this before. You're old enough to make decisions for yourself. But remember, our decisions always have consequences, good or bad. I know. And whatever we do, say, and think, Jehovah knows it all. I just need a little freedom. Dave, what kind of freedom are you looking for? There's no such thing as absolute freedom. Jim's right, David. We're all connected to someone or something, and that means accepting responsibility. I know, Dad, I know. You're a good kid. I'd hate to see you waste all your good training. But, Dad, that's where you're wrong. I'm not a kid. I really wish you would keep on working for me. Don't worry, Dad. I'll be careful. I'm not going to disappoint you. Well, I hope you're right. But somehow, I've got a bad feeling about all of this. I'm not going to let you down, Dad. Understand, I only want the best for my sons. You boys mean so much to me. Oh, Dad, please. Oh, hey, Mom. What do you think of my new shoes? Why, they look nice. Thanks. Well, I gotta go. Bye, Dad. Bye, Mom. Bye, James. See you tonight. I'll be back before the meeting. Well, I guess we better hit the road. Dad, I'm very uncomfortable about David's new job with Al. Why? Well, you know, some of the brothers call him Bad News Al. I don't believe a thing he says, and I think David is in bad company. Jim, your brother's a good kid. Sure, he's got some growing up to do. I just don't want to see you disappointed in a big way. I know. Your mom and I don't want to be disappointed either. But Jim, sooner or later, everyone has to make his own decisions. He'll eventually realize there are limits. Let's keep supporting him. I've been supporting him for years. Well, that's good. I'm proud of you. Well, come on. We better go or we won't get to work until noon. Okay. I'll get the tools. John, I'm really concerned about David. What if James is right about Al? What do you mean? Well, what young person has ever got into trouble without some kind of bad association? I'm worried that David could begin to drift from the truth. David's got a good heart. And he's right. He's no longer a little kid. But whether he's matured spiritually is another question. How will he respond to the attractions of this world? Only time will tell. At some point, he will have to decide that for himself. I often wonder if we've done everything we could as parents. 
Have we done right by them, John? Have we? Ever since they were born. Oh, John, I have so many misgivings these days. I feel so unsure. Mary, no child comes with a guarantee of success. In every child's life, the time comes when he must answer for himself to Jehovah. From this point on, David must show what's really in his heart. That's what I'm afraid of. So? So what? Come on, what did he say? He hardly said anything. He said, Jehovah sees everything and we all have an accounting with Jehovah. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. That's what they always say. What else? That's it. That's it? That's it. You're kidding. So you're working? I'm working. Slaving right next to you, Al. <laughs> awesome. Listen, here's what we'll do. We can work together and put aside a little money for, say, six months. Then we're out of here. My cousin Anton's got a place in the city. We'll stay there for a while until we find a place of our own. What do you say? Yeah, that sounds... And check this out. I've got an idea for a new video game. Fantastic idea. I'm telling you, it's going to blow everyone away. You're going to be a part of this. Well, I... Hey, this is for real. I'm online day and night. Not just playing games, but studying them. We're going to make a fortune programming games. Are you with me? Yeah, I guess so. Why so gloomy? Look, we're going to be in demand. It's only a matter of time. They'll be calling us from all over, knocking on our doors. Let me in, let me in. What, are you doubting me? How many times have I told you? Have no fear. Your buddy Al is here. Wow, it's like you've got this whole thing all planned out. Well, somebody's got to do the thinking around here. Otherwise, we won't get anywhere in this world. Come on, you got to meet Mike. Who's Mike? Follow the leader and find out. He's the one who's going to sign your paychecks. Hi, I'm the manager. You can call me Mike. Mind if I call you Dave? No, not at all. Sure. I'd like to think that behind those friendly eyes is someone who's got a little fire in him. A go-getter. Know what I mean? Yes, sir. So, let's see. You just graduated. Not much experience. Hmm. What are your goals? Um, well, I haven't really decided yet. Your friend Al here speaks highly of you, and we like Al a lot. He does whatever we want him to, and he works all hours. Are you anything like him? I work hard, sir. Willing to work all hours? Yes, except Thursdays and Sundays. <sighs> Why is that? Well, on those nights, I have my meetings. What kind of meetings? Al, is this what you were talking about when I hired you? Yeah, you remember. They're religious meetings, right? I get the picture. Yeah, 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 that's fine. But I still need you to work either a Saturday or a Sunday each week, or at least part of a Sunday. You good with that? I, I suppose, sure. Al here has no problem with any of this. He says if he misses a meeting at his church, he can catch it somewhere else. Maybe you can do that. Just work it around your schedule here. All right, Dave. Be here tomorrow morning, 7 o'clock. I'll be looking forward to seeing if you're made of the same stuff Al here is. Al, why don't you show him around? Introduce him to some of the folks. Come on. I'll introduce you to my friends. How can you have friends here already? You've only been here for three weeks. Uh, let's just say I'm gregarious. Gregarious? In what way? Come on. I'll introduce you to Patrick, the hardware geek. 
And you'll like Thomas and Carl, the programmers. I think they never sleep. Plus, the office girls. Allison, Monica, Brittany, and you definitely want to meet Taylor. Why would I want to meet Taylor? Never mind why. Besides, it's more like she wants to meet you. Al, did you really tell the manager that if you miss a meeting, you can catch one somewhere else? Yeah, so? You can't tell him that. If he thinks we're not serious about meetings, he'll schedule us to work whenever he wants. So what? Relax. It's not the end of the world. Anyway, I've only missed a couple of meetings. Get real. I'm your friend. I know when you're there and when you're not. Look, I've got everything under control. You heard how much he likes me. So have no fear. Your buddy Al is here. And besides, here they are. Hi, Brittany. Taylor, I want you to meet my friend Dave. Hey, guys. Oh, so you're Dave. Nice to meet you, Taylor. You too, Brittany. We've known each other since we were this high. Dave and I are like brothers. <laughs> oh, really? So, you want to tell him what labor-intensive thing you're working on? Me? I'm doing nothing. It's a joke around here. If we see the boss, we say we're doing everything. But when we see each other, we say we're doing nothing. Okay, what are you really doing? Just some boring paperwork. So, when do you start, Dave? Tomorrow, seven in the morning. Cool. I'm looking forward to seeing you. I bet you are. Come on, bud. Let's check out the back. Ow! Wow. Where have you been hiding him? He's really cute. What did I tell you? Didn't I tell you, Taylor? Just use your charms, and he'll fall right into your arms. Hey, David, did you just get off work? Yeah, they had us working late. Wow, why so late? We needed to finish a project. An executive from some big company is coming in tomorrow. Sorry, I didn't mean to wake you. <sighs> I was waiting up for you and fell asleep. So, how's it going after a month on the new job? It's all right, nothing special. Not what you thought it was going to be, huh? So why don't you quit? Join Dad and me. We've got plenty of work. And you don't even need an application. You've already got an in with the boss. Nah, I'll pass. Look, I don't understand you. It's like you're deliberately turning up your nose at us. You spend every waking hour at work with a bunch of wild kids when you have it made right here at home. Even the pay is better. How do you know what I'm making? What kind of carrot are they holding out to you? Is it a girl? What has Bad News Al got you thinking? Listen to me, David. That kid is looking for trouble. He's going to find it, too. And the two of you are going to be swimming in it together. You're being too hard on him. I don't get it. What is it with you and Al? Al is my friend. I've known him since we were five years old. And you know what? I've never liked that kid. That kid is a baptized brother. And you were always jealous of him. Jealous? What are you talking about? There's nothing to be jealous of. He's a weasel. End of story. Al enjoys life. And you're jealous because he makes friends with all kinds of people. The brothers at the hall always used to like him. The only reason some don't like him now is that people like you badmouth him. And people don't like me? Is that what you're saying? People think you're boring. You're too uptight and serious and so judgmental. You're like a noose around my neck just waiting for me to drop. You're out of your mind. I'm none of those things. You don't know anything about me. What I've been through for you... Always sticking my neck out for you so you wouldn't wind up in the doghouse. Oh, sure. Like you're my savior. And while I'm trying to follow the cramped road, you're running around like a big shot wannabe. And you know what else? You're jealous about that, too. Are you crazy? Oh, that's what your problem is. You're jealous of me, aren't you? You're jealous of me stepping out. Afraid I'm stepping a little too far into the world. Afraid I might find something cool when all you want is to do the same. Go ahead. Mock me. I'm just trying to look out for you, as if I've got nothing better to do. Nobody told you to try and control my life. You're taking this on yourself. That's nuts. Yeah? Then why do you hate me? I don't hate you. Oh, come on. It's in your eyes, all over your face. You're always judging me. You know what I want in life? I'll tell you. 
I want to do what's right in God's eyes. Yeah, right. And I want you to do what's right, too. Not in a million years are you thinking of me. I told Dad, if you go off into the world, you've got no one to blame but yourself. You've wanted to do that for years. I can't stop you. Dad can't stop you. And you know what? Jehovah won't stop you, because it's your decision. That's right. It's my decision. And you and your lazy, good-for-nothing friend will sink into this world's mess. And nobody's going to be there to pull you out. Then what are you going to do? I've got news for you. I and my lazy, good-for-nothing friend are not going to sink. We know what we're doing, and we can take care of ourselves. You think so? All right, here. Here, take it. Go off into dreamland. What's this? It's your bank card from the account you've been slowly draining. That's my money. You got no right. It's Dad's money. He set that account up years ago, so you could use it to pioneer. I want to know what you're doing with my bank card. I found it on the bathroom floor. I must have dropped it. Still, you had no right. Just stop. I'm tired. I got to get up in the morning and do some real work. Yeah, well, so do I. Yeah? Making up violent video games? Give me a break. I'm going to bed. What kind of a brother are you? What are you going to do to me next? Take me out in the field and kill me? Cain? You know what I like about you? Uh, no. What? You're different. I am? Yeah, from any guy I've ever met. You're respectable. You treat me decently. There's just something about you. <laughs> I'm serious. So tell me, what is it? I never thought about it. You're awesome. You know that? What do you mean? You don't come on to me like other guys do. You're just natural. And I've never even heard you curse. Don't look at me like that. I'm serious. It's just nice to be with a person like you. So tell me, what makes you so special? I don't know. Seriously? You don't know? You don't curse and you don't know why? I really don't. I guess it's because I was raised a Christian. So was I. But my mother says I've got a filthy mouth. I've never heard you curse. That's because I don't hear you curse. So why should I? I don't need to impress you. Because I can tell I've clearly won you over. Or is this just an act? Are you pretending? I'm not a very good actor. I don't know. I guess I just love life, and I want to do the right thing. I would never hurt you. You're a Jehovah's Witness, right? Yeah, I'm one of Jehovah's Witnesses. Part-time or full-time? What does that mean? Well, Al's a witness too, right? He's definitely a part-timer. I've seen what he does around here. He's no angel. He's a hard worker, all right. But I don't know who he thinks he's fooling. Well, I'd like to believe I'm full-time. Someday you'll have to tell me what you guys believe. Oh, look who's here. It's your buddy. Would you excuse us for a minute? I gotta go do everything. See you later. What's up? I've got really good news. Remember my cousin Anton I was telling you about? Yeah. His tenant has just moved out. He's got an apartment that's so cheap, it's not even funny. This is like a deal made in heaven. It's all coming together. Like our future is calling us. We'd be idiots not to grab this chance. Now what? What's the matter? Your dad been grilling you? Or the elders? Nah, the elders keep coming around. It bothers me some, but only until they leave. It's more my brother, James. Your brother? What does he want now? You know, honestly, he's like made of stone. He's so self-righteous. That's what I told him. And that's why I keep telling you, you gotta get out of that place. He's never going to change. I don't know what he wants. I'll tell you what he wants. He wants you to wallow in guilt. He's always been that way. He thinks he's better than us and has to keep an eye on us. What are we? Still kids? Yeah, right? The problem's not with us. It's with him. Your brother doesn't know how to live. Know what? If you want to serve Jehovah, fine. Nothing wrong with that. But don't go around telling other people how bad they are and how bad this world is. It's up to each of us to make this world a better place. Well, look, we know the end is coming. Dave, they've been saying that for years. 
People thought the world was coming to an end during the Black Plague. And guess what? Hello, we're still here. But Jesus said to keep on the watch. After all, the end will come. Yeah, sure it will. But who knows when? In the meantime, none of this is going to stop me from living life to the fullest. I could still be a good person. Yeah, you're right. Of course I'm right. I'm your friend. I'm not going to lie to you. Look, all your brother's trying to do is make you feel guilty. Personally, I think he hates me. Listen, you're going about this all wrong. I know your family doesn't like you working here, but all you have to do is yes them to death. I do that with mine every day, and they're none the wiser for it. What do you mean? Look. Whenever older people talk to you, all you have to do is nod and say yes, yes, yes. And then go and do what you want. Anyway, we'll be out of here soon. In the meantime, just let them hear what they want to hear. Hey, you with me or against me? I'm with you. Great. All we need is money. Well, if that's all we need, what are we waiting for? What's this? You didn't steal this, did you? Trust me, it's all mine. No way. You're awesome. That's what Taylor said. This man is awesome. I know. Why have you been holding out on me, man? I haven't. I was just waiting for the right time. You're taking us one step closer to fulfilling our dream. Have no fear, because Dave, your buddy, is here. Taylor, what are you doing? Everything. <sighs> David, Al, what are you two up to? Get back to work. In fact, you two need to stay here tonight and finish that project of yours. Oh, no, not tonight, Mike. I have my meeting tonight. Don't start with me, David. Not now, not ever. You need to finish that project if it keeps you here all night. Understand? What am I going to do? I have a talk tonight. Pretend you didn't get the assignment slip. I can't do that. Then call your dad and ask him if he can do it. He'll do it. No, he won't. He wants me to give this talk. It's my first in a long time. Be imaginative. Think of your dad as the greatest guy in the world. Here. Sweet talk him. Beg him if you have to. He's your dad. Dads do everything for their kids, right? I've got my dad eating out of my hand. Dad, I've got a big favor to ask of you. No, wait. Before we go anywhere, let me get this straight. You two guys are Jehovah's Witnesses? I'm telling you. Come off it. There's no way you guys are witnesses. Who says we're not? A girl in my school was a witness. So? First of all, Jehovah's Witnesses don't smoke. So I was right. You are a part-timer. What are you talking about? Al, you smoke? Never mind. Second, she told me that witnesses hang out with other witnesses. So what are you guys doing with us? Well, it's quite simple, ladies. The reason we're hanging out with you is that we want to educate you about what real gentlemen are like. <laughs> are you guys serious? Forget it. Listen, maybe we should just go, the two of us. Aw, oh, come on. Don't leave. We're just getting to know you, and you don't know us at all. All right, let me ask you something. I want to see if Gina was telling me the truth. Who's Gina? The witness girl. She said, let me get this right. What if someone does something they're not supposed to do? Like what? Like, let's say, they're caught smoking. Or suppose they hook up with someone. Because I know that's against the rules. What would happen? Well, you'd get in trouble. They lecture you, you'd say you're sorry, and then you're back in. And that's it? Well, that's not exactly the way it works. You see, if you're not repentant, you're disfellowshipped. What does that mean, disfellowshipped? The elders sit down with you, and if you're not sorry, and, you know, really have a change of heart, then they have no choice but to disfellowship you. So other witnesses won't hang out with you? Mm, sort of. I think that's mean. Yeah, so do I. Well, except there's a reason for it. They hope you'll turn around, you know, repent, and make things right with God. Then you can come back. After they treat you like that, why would you want to come back? Well, because it's the best place to be. But if you don't tell anybody what you're doing, nobody knows a thing. 
Right. Exactly. Look, I don't want to talk about this anymore. Let's do something or go somewhere. We still have time to see that movie. You want to go? Now we're talking. Come on, Taylor. Why did you have to bring up all that disfellowshipping stuff? Talking about religion turns people off. Brittany's the one who brought it up. Come on, you guys. Come on, Dave. David, I've been calling all over for you. Where have you been? I'm right here, Dad. David, you were not here. Where were you? I was at work and then had to drop some things off at Al's place. I need to talk to you. That's funny, Dad, because I need to talk to you, too. No, come sit here next to me. You're my son. Father and son should be able to talk to each other man to man. Sure, Dad. So, I'm a man now, huh? Well, you've grown up. But I remember when you were this little. I held you in one arm, cradled you like this. I promised Jehovah I would do my very best to bring you up to serve him. I grew up to disappoint you. Is that it? No, but your mom and I are concerned about your spirituality. I know, Dad. You've been telling me that every day. Dad, look, I have to tell you something. I'm moving out. I'm leaving tonight. What? What do you mean? Where are you going? I'm moving to the city. With Al? Yes. We have a place, and we've got jobs at a bigger firm. Why? What's wrong with living here? People are always judging me. What people? Are you talking about your brother? He treats you the way he does because he cares for you. Why can't people just let me be who I want to be? Who's stopping you from being who you want to be? Everybody. I feel so restricted around here. All these rules. You can't do this. You've got to do that. David, Jehovah's laws are not restrictive. They protect us. They're not burdensome, unless you want to do something wrong. Is that what you want to do? I don't know. All I know for sure is that I'm happy when I'm with my friends and away from here. Where will you go to meetings? Actually, I don't even feel comfortable at the meetings anymore. David, do you realize what you're saying? If you leave Jehovah's organization, you take yourself out from under his spiritual protection. You become easy prey for Satan. Well, right now that protection feels more like a cage. David, we don't have to learn things the hard way. Bad decisions have bad consequences. Is that really what you want? I want my freedom. Freedom to do what I want, when I want, and with whoever I want. Is that such a crime? If you know how to do what is right, but you don't do it, then yes, that is a crime. The Bible says it's a sin. Son, don't you believe that this is the truth? I never said I didn't. I know it is. There couldn't be any other truth. But, Dad, the bottom line is, I want to do what I want to do. And I don't want anyone telling me I can't. Besides, this system of things hasn't ended yet, so it may still go on for some time. Is that what you honestly believe, or has someone else told you that? It's just a feeling I have. I've been hearing for years that we have to keep on the watch. David, what's going on? Is it a girl? David, you know Jehovah. No one can truly love you unless they know and love Jehovah, too. Dad, I'm sorry. This is something I have to do. I know I'm disappointing you and maybe Jehovah, but I just have to this time. David, what are you talking about? David! David, answer me. What's going on? Talk to me. David, how can you explain this to your mother? I don't know. Mom, I just have to do this. Do what? David, no! Don't do this. Don't leave. Oh, John. I feel like we're letting him walk right out of the truth. I know, dear. I know. John, it's like death. How can this be happening to our family? Dad, what's going on? What's wrong with Mom? Is she all right? Oh, James. David doesn't realize what he's doing to his mother.
Dad? It's way past midnight. Why are you staring out the window? I just wonder where your brother is and how he's doing. I keep thinking he won't really keep this up. He'll come to his senses and come back to Jehovah. But, Dad, he's been gone for months. Even if he knew that Mom still cries every day, or that all you do is think about him, would that make any difference to him? And what about me? He's affected me, too. I'm so angry about what he's done to our family that my stomach is always in knots. Well, Jim, we have to move forward, no matter what your brother does. We can never help him if we let his bad decisions hold us back spiritually. The congregation has been very supportive. The elders come by, they ask about David and share scriptural thoughts with us. Yes, I know. And most of the brothers and sisters are so warm toward us, visiting and inviting us over. A few, well, I guess they just don't know what it's like. What do you mean? Oh, a sister called from the city just to say she'd seen David going into a bar with Al and two girls. I'm not sure what she thought she was accomplishing by telling us that, but needless to say, it didn't help your mother. I guess not. At least it means David is still alive and able to stand on two feet. Personally, Dad, I think he deserves whatever he gets. Was that your phone, Dad? Yes, but at this hour? Jim, it's a text message from David. From David? What does he say? He says, Hi, Dad. How are things? Project's on track here. Should be rich in no time. But right now, money's running low. Can you help? I'll pay you back soon with big interest. Thanks, Dad. Hi to Mom and James. So he spent all the money you gave him to Pioneer, and now he wants more? No way. James, he needs our help. Our help? You know what? Good night. David, so good to hear from you. We all miss you and want to help. Please, come home, son, and come back to Jehovah. That's the best way, the only right way. You know you'll be welcome. Please, come. I love you, son, Dad. Well, now my family knows I'm out of money. What they don't know is how bad everything else is. Al's big dream has turned into a daily grind, working around people interested only in themselves and in how much they can squeeze out of us. Money is all Al thinks about, too. Yesterday I saw a sister witnessing to a man on the street. I thought, if he listens, he can learn the truth. He can gain real happiness. He'd be a rich man. What about me? Will I ever be truly happy again? Who am I kidding? I can never fit in completely with the world. I know too much about what's right and wrong. But how can I go back? I'd be disloyal to my friends, to Al, and to Taylor. Besides, I've done some things that are really wrong. How can I face mom and dad? And what about the elders and the congregation? No. I'm not ready to face all that. I've got to work things out by myself somehow, with a little help from Al and Taylor. Besides, I can't let them down. They need me. What a day. I'm like brain dead. I really needed to come here and have some fun. Well, Mr. Brain Dead, we're going to be late for the concert again. Why do you always have to be complaining? We're waiting to get Dave's bank card back, remember? Ugh, what's taking so long? We've been looking forward to this concert for weeks, and you're letting this silly waiter ruin it for us. 
Don't you understand? This is the most exciting thing in my life. You mean besides me, right? Oh, yeah, right. You're okay, but this is really important. Al, can't you get them to hurry up? We're going to be late. Stop being so pushy. Who do you think you are? Nobody tells me what to do. Not you or anybody else. Oh, Al, it's all about you and what you need and what you want, isn't it? And if anyone else doesn't like it, that's tough, right? And what makes you think you're ever going to get what you want with your attitude? You two are absolutely hilarious. Come on, can we just stop? This is going to get ugly again. You just stay out of this. Exactly why do we have to hang around with Brittany now anyway? Why? Because they're our friends, remember? Why, from looking at these photos, I can tell you really enjoy your new assignment. The tropical landscape is gorgeous. Is it really this green? It really is, John. But there's something more beautiful there than those hills. What's that, Linda? All our dear new friends and our Bible students. We already have 11 between us, even though we're still fumbling with the language. 11? Wow. And they're really getting the sense of the truth. Half of them are attending meetings and making big changes in their lives. It sounds silly, but we often feel like we're living inside a yearbook report. It's such a rich experience. Absolutely. And busy? We've never been busier and never felt more fulfilled. Wow. Need a helper? Of course, anytime. Come and see for yourself. Seriously, Jim, you should come and check it out personally. We can help you with the arrangements. That would be great. I can tell you this. There is nothing like serving Jehovah with all you've got and seeing him bless your efforts. Too bad David doesn't see things that way. Ah, uh, he doesn't even know what he's missing. Maybe he does, Jim. Maybe one day he'll realize he can still get back his good relationship with Jehovah. Okay, we've got Dave's car. Come on, let's get out of here. We've got to hurry if we're going to make that concert. Like, finally, you get it. Oh, buddy, why not let me drive tonight? You're pretty tired. What are you trying to say? You think I'm drunk? You've been drinking too, you know. Yeah, but nowhere near as much as you. Come on, Al, let me do you a favor. Dude, back off. You think I can't handle my liquor or something? Yeah, Dave, what's with you? Let him drive already. Why are you always so worried about everything? We're going to be so late. All right, come on, everybody. Let's go. What? Are you crazy? Do you realize what you're asking me to do? No way! Listen to me. If you don't tell them that you were driving, I could go to jail! If I tell them I was driving, I could go to jail. I'll pay the bail. I'll pay everything. You're not hearing me. I'm not doing it. I'm not lying for you. You've got to help me out. If I lose my license, I'm sunk. Do you know what that means? But I wasn't driving. You were the one behind the wheel. I said you shouldn't. I can't believe you won't help me out. You're supposed to be my friend. A friend wouldn't do this to a friend. I'm asking you for a favor. This is insane. How can you try to pin this on me? I didn't do anything. You both reek of alcohol. You two have no sense. Look what you did to those girls. Stop struggling. He was the one who was driving. Officer, I was not driving. Save it. Let's go, wise guys. Down at the station, you'll get your chance to tell us what really happened.
Well, now that's interesting. Your friend just told us a completely different story. But, officer, I'm telling the truth. You can check the steering wheel for fingerprints. Oh, yeah? You both failed the alcohol breath test. Officer, listen. No, you listen. Do you think this is some kind of game? I don't know what's going on between the two of you, but I know this. One of you was driving while under the influence. If I had it my way, I'd send you both to prison. Officer, how are Taylor and Brittany? Are they badly hurt? So now you want to know about the girls. They're pretty bruised up, but they'll live. They said they tried to stop you two clowns from driving drunk. What? Taylor said that? You nearly killed yourselves and them too. But officer, they were the ones who said... They said, he said, you know what? What is it? You stay put. I'll be back. And I thought Al was my friend. He wants me to lie and go to jail for him. He really is bad news, Al, after all. And Taylor? She said she tried to stop us. Are you kidding? She egged us on. How did all of this happen? It's like a nightmare. How could I have been so blind? All these people, they're so unhappy, so unfulfilled. And to think, I was once in the truth. I knew it was the truth. I had real friends and a clean conscience. What have I got now? While others are learning the truth, improving their lives, I've been going down the drain, wasting my life. Dad was so right about everything. If you leave Jehovah's organization, you become easy prey for Satan. No one can truly love you unless they know and love Jehovah too. Please come home, son, and come back to Jehovah. You know you'll be welcome. Please come. I love you, son. Oh, dear God, Jehovah, please hear me. Forgive me, please. I've been so foolish. I beg you, help me to get back to you, whatever it takes. Please, give me the strength to do what I have to do. Help me to right all these wrongs. Well, David, it turns out that you were telling the truth. The girls confirmed that your friend was driving, not you. You're free to go, but you won't be going anywhere in that car, what's left of it. There's a phone if you want to call someone. Hello? James, it's me. Where in the world are you? I'm at a police station. I'm not surprised. James, I need help. Please, let me talk to Dad. So now that you've hit rock bottom, you want Dad to come and get you out of trouble? No, James, I want to come home. I want to come back to Jehovah. I bet. James, please. I just want to do what's right. I'm serious. I want Jehovah back in my life. I want to be back in the truth. Please don't hang up. <sighs> okay. Dad, it's David. He's at a police station. David? Dad. Oh, it's good to hear your voice, son. Are you all right? Dad, you were so right about everything. I'm so sorry. I wronged Jehovah, and I hurt you and Mom. Please, let me make it up to you somehow. Dad, can I come home? Of course, son. Do you have a way home? Can I come and get you? The police say they can bring me home. Then come right away. I can't wait to see you. Mary! Thank you, Brother Smith. 
I really appreciate how kind you and the other elders on the Judicial Committee have been. In fact, everyone has been so encouraging. Okay, I'll see you at the meeting. Thanks again. David, Brother and Sister Robinson are here for dinner. They're really looking forward to seeing you again. Great. I can't wait to see them. James. Hi, Dad. Whose car is that outside? The Robinsons are here to see David. Has everybody forgotten what he did to our family, to the whole congregation? Son, please. He's put that behind him now. He hurt me too, you know. All those years, I tried to set a good example for him to keep him on the straight and narrow, and what did he care? Jim, David always looked up to you, even if he never said so. He still does. But that's not all, Dad. After he takes off and blows all the money you gave him, running around and doing who knows what, then he wanders back home expecting to be treated like nothing ever happened. He feels differently now, son. And then you and Mom start inviting people over to see him. I've never caused you and Mom a bit of trouble. When's the last time you did something like that for me? Son, you've always been loyal and obedient, not only to me, but also to Jehovah. But your brother almost lost everything. Jehovah gave him the opportunity to come back, and David responded. He is truly repentant. He accepted discipline, and he's doing everything he can to make things right with Jehovah. He wants to make them right with you, too. You must rise above this resentment, son. If you don't, Satan will use it against you. How can we expect Jehovah to forgive us if we don't forgive others? But, Dad... James, your brother was dead and came to life. He was lost and was found. Jesus said the angels rejoice when one sinner repents and comes back to Jehovah. What about you, son? Will you rejoice too?
In his parable, Jesus did not say whether the older son listened to his father and went in to rejoice over his brother's return. Uh, perhaps Jesus wanted each of us to ask ourselves what we would do. Of course, much heartache can be avoided if one never leaves the truth at all. Still, when someone who has strayed repents and comes back to Jehovah, surely we all want to rejoice. Simply beautiful. We wish to thank Brother Holland and all those who worked along with him in preparing and delivering that deeply moving presentation. Every week in more than 103,000 congregations, Jehovah's Witnesses actively participate in a Bible study program using the Watchtower magazine. Please follow along in your personal copy of the Watchtower as Brother Simon Bird, serving in Staffordshire No. 1 circuit, presents a summary of this week's material. I don't know about you, but when I first reviewed today's study article, I knew it was the assigned study material for today's convention, this week's convention, well I could not think of a more fitting article to review. In fact, if you wanted to provide a subtitle for the article, we could do no better than choose the theme of our convention, Keep On the watch. Now why is that the case? Well we're going to investigate together. So have you got your study article, your study copy of the Watchtower with you? I'm looking at the front page. I've got the date, May the 15th 2009. Have you got the right one? And the article is entitled, Press on to Maturity. The great day of Jehovah is near. The article can be found on page 9. But before we do that, we want to turn to page 2, which explains the purpose of this study article. It tells us there, this article highlights why Christian maturity is essential and how it can be gained. So that is the purpose of our review of the Watchtower this afternoon. So let's turn to page 9. Let's restate the theme. Press on to maturity. The great day of Jehovah is near. The theme text is taken from Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1. Let us press on to maturity. Now you'll notice as you prepare the watchtower before our convention that five out of the six key scriptures they're the ones found in italics in our article they came from the book of Hebrews so what we want to do is ask the question 
Why did the Holy Spirit, why did Jehovah's Holy Spirit move Paul to write these words to the Hebrew congregation, the congregation in Jerusalem and the environment? Well, to answer that question, we need to go back to the year 33 CE. Now, this is right at the close of Jesus' earthly ministry. Now, you remember, he made some very challenging comments about the temple at Jerusalem, that it would be left not a stone standing upon a stone, which provoked questions from his disciples. They said, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your presence and the conclusion of the system of things? Now, I don't know whether they fully comprehended Jesus' answer, but his answer actually was extending forward thousands of years because it had to do with an initial fulfillment, but also right through to the very last days in which we live now. But of course, they would be very interested in the initial fulfillment because they knew that the initial fulfillment had to do with them, that they were involved in it because of Jesus' words in his answer to them. When he said these words, those in Judea are to begin fleeing to the mountains, something very specific to Jerusalem and those who lived in it. But what was he talking about? Well, he just explained that there was going to be a signal, a signal event that would let them know that now was the time to flee, to get out of Jerusalem. So what was the initial fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy there in Matthew chapter 24? Well, paragraph 2 explains the opening stage of the Great Tribulation that they were going to experience in Jerusalem started in 66 CE. Now this was when Cestius Gallus led the Roman troops on an assault of Jerusalem. Now he was within a hair's breadth of succeeding in taking and desolating Jerusalem at that point in 66 CE. But then withdrew suddenly for no apparent reason. And this allowed those with spiritual discernment to flee the city. There was a window of opportunity for salvation. Those who knew the survival plan given by Jesus. So the question that Paul was asking to the congregation in Jerusalem and the areas around was, have you got that discernment? Are you on the watch? Are your senses alert to the fulfillment of the prophecy, the signal? And are you going to act upon it? Well, what did Paul find in the congregations in Jerusalem and around? Well, this is where we turn to our first key scripture. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 11 to 13. Please turn with me in your own Bible to these verses. What was the situation among some in the congregations? This is what Paul said, under inspiration. Concerning him, we have much to say and hard to be explained. Since you have become dull in your hearing. For indeed, although you ought to be teachers in view of the time, you again need someone to teach you from the beginning the elementary things of the sacred pronouncements of God. And you have become such as need milk, not solid food. For everyone that partakes of milk is unacquainted with the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. So what was the situation there in the congregation in Jerusalem amongst the Hebrew Christians? Well, they were dull of their hearing. Some even who were experienced in the truth they had begun drawing away from the truth. They had lost their senses. They were not alert. They were not on the watch. They were also drawing away from Jehovah's spiritual feeding program, the Christian congregation. Hence the words in Hebrews chapter 10, 
about not forsaking the gathering of ourselves together, and especially so, as Paul mentioned, because the day is drawing near. So, will they be alert when that signal presents itself that Jesus had explained that they would see? Well, now we come to paragraph four, because here really is the application of the whole watchtower in a nutshell for us to consider the reason why we're discussing this information. Let's read it all together, verse four, paragraph four. We are living during the time of the final fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy, the great day of Jehovah, the day that will bring the end of Satan's entire system. As never before, we must remain spiritually keen and alert. Are we really doing that? Christian maturity will help us to stay focused on where we are in the stream of time. So the situation in the book of Hebrews and the context of when it was written is the same for us today. Are we alert? Can we see the signals? Can, are our eyes set, clearly focused on the things unseen, the things just yet to happen? Of course, the key, let's read Hebrews 6 verse 1 again, the opening words there. For this reason, now that we have left the primary doctrine about the Christ, let us press on to maturity. Now, you notice the first subheading, the obvious question, what is maturity? So the heading, what Christian maturity is. Now, you've noticed there's one verse that we haven't read yet in our little uh, run of scriptures there in Hebrews chapter 5. It's verse 14. Here Paul explains what maturity is. Let's read verse 14 of Hebrews chapter 5 together. But solid food belongs to mature people, to those who through use have their perceptive powers trained to distinguish both right and wrong. So, what is maturity? Well, Paul linked maturity to solid food. And he used the, uh, the comment there also of their perceptive powers being trained. Now, if we go to the reference Bible, you may have noticed in your own pre-study, the footnote makes these comments. For perceptive powers, you could read literally our sense organs. And for the word trained, to be trained as a gymnast. So think of the contrast for a few moments of a baby on milk and a trained gymnast. That's what Paul was contrasting, that's what he was saying. Are you a baby or are you a trained gymnast? Now, a, a child, a baby, its uh, senses, its eyes, looks at its hand, and it thinks, wow, a hand. Ooh, that's interesting. But it may not even realize that that hand belongs to him or her. It might wave it about, hit him in the face, wonder how did that happen? That is the sense that a young baby has. Compare that to a gymnast, finely tuned, precise machine that can manipulate their bodies, that can make imperceptible adjustments to every situation and are in total control. That's what Paul was asking. What are you like? Are you trained like a gymnast? So what is involved then in being mature, to have that perceptive powers, to have our sense organs trained like a gymnast? It's obviously keeping our senses, being watchful, keeping on the watch. So notice paragraph six, there are three questions that we want to ask ourselves in this regard. Am I still considering just elementary things? Could I merely be going through the motions and floating along as it were, without my heart being fully involved with the truth? How can I make genuine spiritual progress? All three questions, asking the same question, Am I spiritually mature? So what is involved, or what is needed, 
to become spiritually mature, to press on to maturity. Well, the next subheading gives us the first step to be well acquainted with the word. You see that there at the beginning of paragraph 7? Now this is uh, where we look to our next key scripture. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 13. This is what Paul said, For everyone that partakes of milk is unacquainted with the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. So what does it mean then to be acquainted with the word? How do we do it? Well, it means more than just being familiar with God's word. We could do that by reading God's word, but maybe a, like a child looking at its hand may not realize the significance of what it's seeing. Or it, that this affects me. This belongs to me. This spiritual feeding. These spiritual principles. So it involves more than reading. It must also involve study. Really getting to know the meaning and how it applies to me. What this has got to do with me. Now you notice there's an experience in paragraph 7 of a sister who did just that. She started a, a regular reading, a Bible reading pattern, but why? Because it helped her to draw close to Jehovah. She said, I was meeting my creator for the first time. I learned about his ways, his likes and his dislikes, the degree of his power and the depth of his wisdom. So why? What happened when she read God's word? She was starting to train her perceptive power. She said, this is teaching me about Jehovah. I can draw close to him and he will draw close to me. And certainly she needed that as she explained in her dark moments that followed in her life. So that's reading, studying, meditating on God's word. What else is involved then in being acquainted with God's word? Well, let's read Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. You see it's in italics there in paragraph 8. For the word of God is alive and exerts power and is sharper than any two-edged sword and pierces even to the dividing of soul and spirit and of joints in their marrow and is able to discern thoughts and intentions of the heart. So, the purpose of Bible reading, study and meditation, to get right down to the inner person, to get right down to our spiritual senses, to get right into our hearts, to mould our thinking, and of course then, to mould our actions. Is that what you do when you study God's word? Do you say, well, how does this affect my relationship with Jehovah? How does it help me to get him know, to know him better? And how can I use this? How can I uh, attach myself to Jehovah and use this information to deepen my worship to him? So, then what? Well, there's more still involved in being acquainted with God's words. First, paragraph 9 explains, once we understand what it means and its application to us, then we have to apply it. To put it into practice in our everyday lives. Hence, that comment in the beginning of paragraph 10. To become acquainted with the word of God means to know what it says and to put that knowledge into practice in our everyday lives in situations we face during the course of our normal life experience. Now you notice there's a, a picture on page 10. Can you see that picture? The picture of uh, two women talking together. It looks like it's in a work environment. Well, it doesn't say exactly, but do you think that picture is describing the events recorded in paragraph 10? Uh, our Christian sister named Kyle. What happened? She just had some sort of problem with a workmate. There was some sort of rift between them. But what was she going to do about it? Was her inner person molded? Did she say, oh, well, that's just the way I am. That's just the way they are. But I'm just going to not talk to that person ever again. Or maybe, well, it's, it's, they've got a problem. That's what is their problem. 
the spirit of this world? No. She said she reflected on Romans 12, verse 18. As far as it depends upon you, be peaceable with all men. Now what does she do with that scripture? I know that scripture. It's an interesting scripture. She did more than that, didn't she? She said, this applies to me. How do I apply it in this situation? She had her perceptive powers trained and she did it. And then the results were, well, what a beautiful word she con concludes with. I learned that we can never go wrong if we apply Bible principles. So her actions, her application of Bible principles resulted in greater experience and her confidence in the power and spirit of God's word. So what's the second step then to building maturity? Well, the next subheading is to learn obedience. You might say, well, what's, that, that's the same thing, isn't it? To apply what we learn in our lives, isn't that the same as learning obedience? Well, we have discussed about being obedient to God's laws and principles in our daily lives. But what about when we're under pressure? Now, this is when it becomes increasingly difficult, isn't it? How do we act when we're under pressure? We might panic or lose our senses, see red, so to speak, and our thinking processes fall apart. Well, if we are mature Christians, our perceptive tr powers trained, like a gymnast, we will know, even in this tr difficult situation, how to act. Now, the next key scripture in paragraph 12 is actually the example, the perfect example, of Jesus Christ in this regard of learning obedience. Shall we read Hebrews chapter 5 and verses 8 and 9? Quite astounding words when we read them. Verses 8 and 9 of Hebrews 5. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. And after he had been made perfect, he became responsible for everlasting salvation to all those obeying him. Two phrases there. He learned obedience and he was made perfect. How can the perfect Jesus Christ, with all his experience in the, his pre-human existence, his perfect service to Jehovah, how could he learn obedience when on the earth? Because now he was in a different situation. He was under extreme pressure. And now he was putting his obedience or his senses into action in these circumstances. So his faith and his obedience now took on an altogether different quality. Now his obedience was tested, hardened, proved by his trials. Is it the same for us? Well, let's look to our next key scripture in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. Let's think of Jesus' example. He was made perfect in learning obedience, that tested quality. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verses 6 and 7. Let's apply these words to ourselves. In this fact, you are greatly rejoicing, though for a little while at present, if it must be, you have been grieved by various trials, in order that the tested quality of your faith, of much greater value than gold that perishes, despite its being proved by fire, may be found a cause for praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Christ, the tested quality of our faith, learning obedience even when under pressure. So can you think of any times when we might be under pressure, when we really have to apply ourselves even more, our senses need to be even more keenly alert, we need to be even more on the watch? Well, it gives a few examples in that paragraph, only a small paragraph, uh, paragraph 13, but really, it's like a workshop to know, am I truly a mature Christian? When it comes to the crunch, when I'm under pressure, how do I react? My dealings with others, the use of the tongue, the fire, 
one of Satan's traps that we discussed yesterday. How do I act? Do I use my tongue in an obedient way to Jehovah's instructions? Or the preaching work, sometimes it's not easy. Sometimes we have pressure. Sometimes we find apathy in our territory. Sometimes we don't get the results we would like. Well, is this going to stop us? We're under pressure. Will we be obedient? This is the tested quality of our faith. Not just words, not just understanding of the God's word, not just application, but applying it under pressure. That tested faith. So what are the benefits of pushing on to Christian maturity? Certainly, it is a real protection for us. Can you think, well, just look, look at paragraph 14, the example of James there. We can read the, the account of James, of James there in paragraph 14, but all we need to do really is think back to yesterday's sessions, Satan's trap, the pit. Do you remember that demonstration that we had on the platform? Well, James was in exactly the same situation, being pressured by a female colleague to commit adultery. How was he going to act? The tested quality of his faith. He knew God's words, but then he said, this applies to me. I must apply this. And he had the presence of mind, the alertness, his senses alert to know, well, this is what I must do in this situation. I cannot fail if I apply godly principles, even in this stressful situation. And what a protection it was. He says he was thankful that nothing further happened and that he maintained a good conscience. In fact, haven't we just seen that also demonstrated in our beautifully enacted drama? Let's look to our final key scripture now, which is in uh, paragraph 15. It's Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 9. Another benefit that comes from Pursuing maturity, or pressing on to maturity. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 9. Do not be carried away with various and strange teachings, for it is fine for the heart to be given firmness by undeserved kindness, not by eatables, by which those who occupy themselves with them have not been benefited. So here, Paul was contrasting a mechanical form of worship to worship from the heart. And how is that made possible? Not just reading God's word, but studying it, meditating upon it so it reaches our heart, makes it firm because our actions are motivated by our love, confidence, faith, and obedience. Lovely example in paragraph 16 of somebody who did that. Louise, she knew that it was time to give her heart a checkup. That she was just going through the motions, she was just drifting, maybe potentially even drawing away from Jehovah. She said, I need to analyze my heart and she put things right. She said it took a lot of effort, but it was vital for her to continue approved of Jehovah because she pressed on to maturity. Obviously, study, meditation, application, and then applying it even under, under pressure was involved in doing that. So are we obedient from the heart? You see our final a picture there, on page 12, the results of those in the first century who saw the signal, understood it, and acted upon it. There they are, leaving Jerusalem, on page 12. Do you know what, when I saw that picture, do you know what it reminded me of? Maybe you as well. The, the front page of our invitation to this convention. Did you see a similar picture? A crowd of people leaving a situation. We are in the same situation today. The unseen, are our eyes clearly focused on it? Do we understand what's going on? Are we prepared? And are we going to be obedient? Not the destruction of a city, the city of Jerusalem, 
but the end of this world. Let us press on to maturity. That is how we will survive. So let's look at the final, what did you learn from our ma magazine, from our study article? What is spiritual maturity and how do we attain it? Having our perceptive powers trained. How? Not just by reading God's word, but letting it reach our hearts and motivate our actions. What part does becoming acquainted with the word of God play in our pressing on to maturity? That's question number two. Well, to become acquainted with the word of God means to know what it says and to put that knowledge into practice. How do we learn obedience? From the heart, following Jehovah's instructions, even when under pressure. That is true evidence that we are keeping on the watch. And in what ways does maturity benefit us? Well, the protection we receive now, the building up of our heart, our devotion to Jehovah, following his instructions, no matter where those instructions take us, with confidence and faith and survival as the result. Let's turn back to paragraph 4 and conclude with these words. The purpose of our discussion, we are living during the time of the final fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy. The great day of Jehovah, the day that will bring the end of Satan's entire system, is near. As never before, we must remain spiritually keen and alert. Are we really doing that? How Christian maturity will help us to stay focused on where we are in the stream of time. Yes, press on to maturity. The great day of Jehovah is near. This is how we keep on the watch. Thank you for that lively synopsis of that important scriptural information. We now invite you to stand if able and sing song number 29 entitled Forward You Witnesses. After the song there will be a few announcements during which you may remain standing. That's song number 29.
first of our announcements concerns the flowers. The flowers that have decorated our platform will be available for those wanting to take them away after the conclusion of the afternoon sessions. They will be available from the running track of the Seddon stand below entrance 30. No one is to approach the platform area beyond this point. We have one greeting, and that is that we have the love and greetings from Melbourne, Australia. Each of us has an opportunity to share in the joy of making voluntary offerings. Contribution boxes are located throughout the facility for those who would like to give financial support to the worldwide preaching work. Anyone who pays income tax may wish to increase the value of their kind donation by placing cash or a cheque payable to IBSA Convention in an envelope along with a completed gift aid form, both of which are available at the contribution boxes. The form just needs to show the amount enclosed along with your name and address, all of which will be treated confidentially. In addition, donations can be made by credit or debit card, whether tax effective or not. The facilities for this are located in the following areas. There are three in the main stand, concourse block seven and 18, and in the main reception. Two are located in the north stand, concourse kiosk and supporters club entrance. A further location is in the south stand, concourse block 36. Please be seated. We have thoroughly enjoyed an abundance of spiritual provisions these past three days, have we not? And now the time has arrived for the concluding talk of this Keep on the Watch District Convention. Why has this convention been a milestone in theocratic history? And what can we look forward to in the days ahead? We are eager to hear what Brother Andrews has to say in the talk, keep in expectation, watching for Jehovah's Day. Well, our three days together have flown so quickly. But we've had a very happy and upbuilding time together, haven't we? We do hope you thoroughly enjoyed the program. I don't think any of us are in any doubt that the Convention has heightened our awareness of the need to be watchful. It's been reflected in almost every talk throughout the last three days. We know that Jehovah's Day will come at his appointed time. It will abruptly overtake the world of darkness while we walk in the light, awake to the times and seasons, to quote Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5. Appropriately, the theme text for this final day is this. For the vision is yet for the appointed time. And it keeps panting on 
to the end. And it will not tell a lie, even if it should delay, keeping an expectation of it, for it will without fail come true. It will not be late. Habakkuk 2 and verse 3. That text allows no room for doubt. Jehovah's day will come right on time. So we're, we're so thankful that Jehovah keeps us in expectation, ever watchful. Well, throughout the program, it's very obvious when we look at events of the past that we've reached another milestone in theocratic history. What are some of the highlights of this convention that stand out in your mind? Well, I expect if you glance at your notes, you'll all have a range of different key points that have stood out in your mind, but maybe we could just uh, refer to one or two. Firstly, a tremendous witness has been given throughout the area. We had a share, perhaps, in advertising campaign that will result in the distribution of millions of handbills worldwide. And that, too, has been very, very excellent to have a chance to distribute the handbills and to wear our lapel badges. As a result of the handbills, uh, some excellent experiences were handed in which perhaps I can just uh, mention in brief to you. A brother and sister visiting a local restaurant on Friday evening met a waitress who asked about their lapel badges. When they explained, she excitedly told them that she and her partner had been searching for the brothers for seven months since their arrival, that is, from Portugal. She wanted to study and asked her manager to write a contact detail for the brothers and sisters. Despite a heavy work commitment, they did get to this convention on Saturday, yesterday, and were delighted to have found Jehovah's people and thrilled by the welcome they received. Arrangements have been made for them to have a study with a Portuguese-speaking brother. So that uh, shows in itself the, the blessing of wearing our lapel badges. A local, um, on Friday, a man in jeans sat along and responded to uh, had responded to an invitation. He came and sat along among the brothers. He visited local churches because of his love for Jesus, desire to find the true religion. And he found help with a copy of the reasoning from the scriptures purchased from a second-hand shop. It had helped him to understand the Bible. He commented how different the information was in the reasoning book and the program was very thrilling for him. On Friday he came by bike, he came five miles and on Saturday he arrived by bus in a suit and carrying a briefcase. His uh, uh, Bible with him and he was given a Bible teach book that he placed, that was placed with him. All because uh, a leaflet had been through, put through his letterbox. And one woman in her 30s arrived on Friday morning by taxi, having had an invitation through the door. Although not planning to stay all day, she was actually at the convention all day, even joining in the singing of songs. She commented on the warm, hospitable atmosphere at the convention and readily accepted a Bible teach book. The local witness is following up the interest. There's just two of a number that were handed in to the office here of those that uh, came as a result of having a leaflet. So though you perhaps wonder when you put them through the door or gave them to someone whether anything would ever happen, well they did and they came and we're so grateful for that.
The new releases were received very joyfully, particularly announcement about the new songbook, I think, uh, uh, heightened our expectation of something thrilling in the way of new releases. I don't think too many of us, unless we were attending another convention, were expecting a new songbook. Many old favorites have been retained and the new songs added. And I know after Friday, I had the privilege of uh, introducing this item, uh, the expressions after the assembly were very, very warm and so thrilled to get this uh, new songbook. Of course, many old favorites have been retained. You'll no doubt have your favorites. And new songs were added. Wording in a number of songs has been brought into line with current understanding of Bible truth, something we explained to you on Friday. And may I ask, did you enjoy hearing the singing of various selection from our new songbook with that uh, brief eight-minute tape? Did you enjoy that? We'd like to uh, show that you'd like to hear more of these songs performed. Several have been asking me about that. We're happy to announce that starting September 1, 2009, you may order through your congregations a new recording entitled Sing to Jehovah Vocal Renditions Disc 1. Now this program will contain 17 of the new songs recorded by chorus and orchestra. And this recording will also be available to download on our website, www.jw.org, on September 1. The same is true of recordings of Sing to Jehovah with piano accompaniment. So we can look forward to just a few weeks ahead when those uh, items will be available to us. Another release that was uh, very well received was the video the wonders of the creation reveal God's glory. If you haven't had a chance to see it yet, you will enjoy it. And many of our young ones, the children, um, have thoroughly enjoyed seeing that. It would be appreciated by all of Jehovah's Witnesses as well as our Bible studies. We next received a new brochure, The Bible, What is Its Message? This will benefit people with little or no Bible knowledge. The beautiful way it encapsulates key points from the Bible is something that indeed is very special. All of us were, were thrilled to receive the new book bearing thorough witness about God's kingdom. Although it's not, as I mentioned yesterday, for field distribution, this publication will have great appeal uh, for God's servants. Now, um, Saturday morning we were very thrilled to see, though the weather wasn't very nice, that large crowds stand up for baptism and we'd like to welcome 29 new disciples who were baptized. We have 11 brothers and 18 sisters. The baptism talk, Keep Your Senses, after baptism was a new outline and uh, in the minds of many a very appropriate, practical and special outline because it brought home to us among the many, many key points just the care that new ones will need after baptism. That's when they're most vulnerable. So if you have new ones in your congregation or you were aware of new ones in a nearby congregation, well then we do ask that you will pay particular attention to them, encourage them as much as possible because Satan is very interested in them and do, he will do his utmost to fracture their newly found faith. Now, um, so many have worked so hard in the volunteer arrangement to make uh, the place uh, suitable for a, a place of worship for three days. And we'd like to thank 
the 1,911 who worked hard on pre-convention cleaning and um, assisting with getting the stadium ready and the 1,611 who worked throughout the assembly to make it a pleasant place and to make the organization a smooth running for our benefit. And the administration office just asked me to mention that you brothers may know that we were not able to do very much pre-convention work last Saturday due to a wedding here. But on the Sunday, there were around a thousand brothers and sisters who attended the Watchtower at 8.30 in the morning and 1,229 registered uh, to help uh, clean the stadium. Now that's uh, not to mention all the other departments who were in attendance. That day, every seat in the stadium was cleaned, and I understand there were 28,000 seats to clean, so we'd like to thank them especially. <laughs> Many of the officials and business people um, have been very helpful to us, in, um, in the convention, and we do appreciate that very much. A local non-witness um, hire company realized our request to high scaffolding was for the convention, so the company supplied the scaffolding free of charge. Having had previous dealings with us, this would be their contribution to the success of the convention. So little things like that are very much appreciated. They give a wonderful witness. The plant uh, nursery that supplied all the shrubs and trees for the platform were pleased also to provide all items free of charge with the proviso from the manager with a smile you can't take anything like this as long as you don't expect me to come. Well, we're happy that uh, maybe one day he'll come, but he allowed us to take anything that we'd like. The stadium manager commented <laughs> to a parking attendant, it was nice to see you again. We love having you, and you always have and leave a clean stadium. I get um, to meet so many nice people as well when you arrive. Oh, we appreciate that very much too. <laughs> the Stoke City ground staff are always very, very helpful to us. We'd like to thank the staff for the help, especially the Chief Executive, Tony Scholes, John Alcott, the Stadium Manager, Adam Frith, Rob Carter and Andy Jackson of the ground staff who have only, uh, we only have to ask for their cooperation and they very keenly and very actively provide it for us. One of whom commented that sometimes he meets people who have made adverse comments about our convention, but he tells them that he encourages them to come and see for themselves how well the stadium is cared for while we are here and how smart all the people look. So we're happy for those uh, comments to be passed to us. <laughs> A number of brothers um, at this time of the year at our district conventions often ask, are there, is there any news from the branch? And um, the service department have provided a report that um, we think you might find interesting. You might want to take a note or two uh, for your own um, good and for passing it on to others. This is the um, report from the branch office. It says some have inquired about Britain's involvement in and support for the worldwide field. 
we are pleased to convey the following information. Of the 1,522 congregations in Britain, 111 in 26 different languages make up that number. Additionally, there are 251 groups covering 38 different languages. What about Bibles and Bible literature for the multi-language field? Well, last year, the 51 full-time translators and a number of temporary commuters in the Britain branch assisted with the translation of Bible literature in seven different languages. Four are Asian languages and three are indigenous to the British field. In total, these seven languages are spoken as the first language by 262 million people worldwide. And for the first time in many years, a new tract was also produced in Scottish Gaelic. We hope that the Would You Like to Know the Truth tract in Scottish Gaelic will have a wide distribution during the summer's witnessing campaign in Scotland and help Gaelic speakers. They'll help them, we hope, very much to appreciate the interest and concern that Jehovah's people show for all nations and tribes and tongues. The Society now produces literature in well over 400 languages, so let's be determined to make good use of these publications in our territories where people uh, are looking for something in their own languages and where possible we're able to reach the hearts and minds of those who speak and read another language. The British branch printery produces 12 million magazines and brochures on average each month and ship them to 51 lands. Recently the governing body has redistributed work in Europe which means that in the autumn we will be uh, helping to assist with countries such as Denmark and a list of others to serve. It's also not unusual for us to work our man press on double shifts to obtain higher production and reduce costs. The shipping department is very busy dispatching all we print as well as, re as receiving books and Bibles from the United States to distribute throughout Europe and Africa. Recently, we purchased a new warehouse for literature next door to our existing shipping department. Our engineers and technicians travel to other branches to assist in maintenance and training of operators of printing machines. We also manufacture parts in our workshop to keep the presses rolling. You therefore appreciate that when we use the expression supporting the worldwide work, we're not just thinking in terms of financial support for theocratic spiritual support. Everyone feels it's a pleasure and privilege to play such an active role in advancing Jehovah's Kingdom interests in a practical way. <clears throat> so a few points there you might like to add to your existing knowledge of what we do at the branch so as to um, help you bring Bible studies up to date and help them see the work that we're doing. Now we'd like to switch back to a more uh, spiritual footing. The evidence that Jehovah's people are keeping on the watch, especially so at this time, although of course, as we shall see, they've always been very sensitive to keeping on the watch. The faithful slave class is living in expectation of Jehovah's day is well documented. In the latter part of the 19th century, the Watchtower pointed to 1914 as a marked year, alerting God's people to keep in expectation. On October 2, 1914, C.T. Russell announced, the Gentile times have ended. Their kings have had their day. And so repeatedly, in our literature, the year 1914 
has been referred to as a turning point in world affairs. Since 1914, wickedness has advanced from bad to worse. You know, just on that, because it happens slowly and in a measured way, I suppose, we sometimes forget just how much is advanced from bad to worse. And of course, every likelihood that it is and will continue to get worse. After that fateful year, there were other things that the faithful slave class highlighted and repeated for our benefit. For example, the Cedar Point, Ohio Convention in 1922, moving ahead from 1914, urged all anointed ones to intensify the kingdom proclamation. Then a few years later, in 1925, the Watchtower carried the article, Birth of the Nation, explained the account in Revelation chapter 12, which served as a basis for understanding what happened in 1914. God's kingdom, pictured by a male child, began to rule with Christ as king in the midst of his enemies. In 1914, the horsemen described in Revelation 6, 2-8, began their ride. In the midst of World War II, it was revealed to Jehovah's people what they could expect in the post-war period. In the talk, Peace, Can It Last?, given in 1942, N.H. Nor explained what would follow the plunge of the League of Nations into the abyss. He mentioned that there would be a period of peace after which the symbolic beast ascended out of the abyss, which it did with the emergence of the United Nations in 1945. This provided opportunity to expand the Kingdom Proclamation to quote acts to the most distant part of the earth. Moving ahead to 1953, the International Convention, F.W. Franz explained the prophecy of Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39 about Gog's all-out attack against God's people. Gog's aim would be to despoil God's people of their spiritual prosperity and even of their material assets. That's his aim. In 1963, coming to a date now that many of you perhaps will remember, the book Babylon the Great Has Fallen, God's Kingdom Rules was released. It more clearly identified the woman sitting upon the scarlet-colored wild beast. An understanding was provided as to when the fall of Babylon occurred and when the world empire of false religion would be totally desolated. That will mark the first phase of the Great Tribulation. The clamor for religion to have influence in the world's affairs is today being publicized openly. Yet, waters supporting the harlot's position are drying up. How should all these events of fulfilled Bible prophecy in this time of the end affect us? There should be no uncertainty whatsoever in our minds concerning the solid basis for our expectation as to keep on the watch for the sudden outbreak of Jehovah's Day. Now, of course, uh, coming back to the present time, we've had some noteworthy aspects of this year's convention. In many places, as you're aware, there are large international conventions, but even here, many missionaries have uh, come from different places across the world uh, to join in our conventions, and we've had that here at uh, Stoke, and we're very happy to have had them with us and had many of them being able to share on the program. I'm sure you'll agree. (laughs) 
Generous contributions were made by the congregations to help them cover their travel expenses. Some local brothers have opened up their homes to provide accommodation for them. If so, and there are some locally, we'd like to express thanks for the hospitality, hospitality shown in this way. I think reflecting on the program, different things would have highlighted in our minds different aspects of the truth. We'll have a lot to think about afterwards when we get home, when we can meditate on all that we've learned. And surely it spurred us on in this all-important work. For decades, we've proclaimed an urgent message concerning God's kingdom and the end of this wicked system of things at Armageddon. The witness given by word of mouth, by printed page, and by electronic means has reached billions of people. In this regard, a declaration has been prepared for presentation to the millions assembled at this year's conventions. And uh, I would like to have the privilege to read you this uh, declaration. And uh, at the end, if you agree, no doubt you will say, I. Today, July 12, the year 2009, we as Jehovah's Witnesses assembled at this Keep on the Watch District Convention at Stoke-on-Trent desire to go on record in having followed, following the declaration in support of God's worship. In this turbulent period of human history, rulership over Earth's billions is a key issue. Human rulership face monumental challenges. Mankind is besieged with complex problems. All sectors of human society suffer from widespread crime, economic turmoil, environmental pollution, terrorism, wars, and moral breakdown. Human rulership has failed to bring relief from distressing problems afflicting this alien world. Why? The Bible alone provides the right answer. At 1 John 5, 19, we are told, the whole world is lying in the power of the wicked one. Jesus Christ referred to that wicked world, that wicked one, as the ruler of the world identified in the Bible as Satan the devil, who is misleading the entire inhabited earth. The devil has misled mankind into trusting in imperfect men for salvation. Such trust in mortal humans is futile. Under human rulership, the present system of things is economic, political, religious, and social structure is in disarray. The prospects for better days ahead appear gloomy. But our outlook is different. We are convinced that as the Bible clearly shows, it is high time to recognize the superiority of God's worship. We are determined to help God-fearing people of all nations to trust that God's kingdom will soon administer all affairs of this earth. It is for this rulership that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, let your kingdom come, let your will take place upon earth. Concerning the role of Jesus Christ and the permanence of God's kingdom rule over the earth, the prophet Daniel declared, to him there was given rulership and dignity and kingdom and peoples, national groups and languages should all serve him. His rulership is an indefinitely lasting rulership that will not pass away and his kingdom one that will not be brought to ruin. 
God's kingdom with Christ as king is an expression of Jehovah's universal sovereignty. Soon, Jehovah will settle for all time the issues raised by the devils challenging regarding the rightfulness of God's sovereignty and his just, wise, and loving way of ruling his creatures. However, until then, we, as Jehovah's Witnesses, will continue to render relative subjection to the existing governmental authorities. We live in expectation of deliverance from the present system of things and all its problems. God's promise of eternal life and endless blessings and a righteous new world will be fulfilled under Jehovah's rulership. Therefore, as part of a worldwide brotherhood, we declare ourselves to be unequivocally in full support of Jehovah God and his rulership. All those in favor of this declaration, please say aye. Now what about things ahead? Well, if it's Jehovah's will, the governing body have to, of course, make plans for the future. And they have in mind something similar for next year, a three-day convention. Meanwhile, there's plenty to do in the Lord's work. And we are pleased to announce that the Christian Organization of Jehovah's Witnesses in Georgia was officially registered by the government of that country on December 24, 2008. Something we'd never ever thought we'd get registration, but it was Jehovah's will, and he blessed it. The whole point of our lives now is to digitally keep on searching out deserving ones and persevere in making disciples. No, it's not easy. We know the majority of people are not interested. But if we use resourcefulness and come to love Jehovah in greater depths, even as a result of this convention, and pray to him for his blessing on our service, he indeed will bless us. But we have to persevere in making disciples. Courageously sound the warning of the rapidly approaching great day of Jehovah before he executes judgment upon this wicked system of things. As we face the future, we're comforted by the assurance given in many texts, like this one in Isaiah 30, verse 18. And therefore, Jehovah will keep an expectation of showing you favor and therefore he will rise up to show you mercy for Jehovah is a God of judgment happy are all those keeping in expectation of him and that's our aim to keep in expectation of him when Jehovah acts decisively on that day that great fear inspiring day we know what that will mean. His name will be sanctified. His rightful sovereignty will be vindicated. And what about Jehovah's people who have been doing his will and keeping on the watch for that day? Well, how happy they will be, all of us, to gain entrance into a righteous new world where all things will be made new. What a glorious eternity awaits all of us. May we be joyous and blessed with our lot to being here and having the privilege of being Jehovah's people and serving him to the very best of our ability. Thank you.
I'd just like to uh, conclude on a personal note as I started by saying what a delight it's been uh, to be with you. I'd like to thank all the brothers whom we've known for years for their encouragement and kindness and help and it's really made it a very, very happy assembly which has added to the warm uh, spirit that you brothers in this part of the country show which I know for one will not forget it. Although we just spent a year in this circuit and did some work in connection with the Wolverhampton Convention, we've never forgotten it. And we know that Jehovah will continue to bless you as you go about your work in doing your utmost to find more people locally who want to serve Jehovah, who love the truth and love righteous standards. So may you continue to serve him to the best of your circumstances. We know that over the years many of our circumstances have changed and we can't do what we used to do. But Jehovah understands that. That's been made plain in talks at this convention that Jehovah sees and understands and never forgets what we were able to do when we were able. So as long as we can do our best within the framework of our circumstances, well then Jehovah will be highly delighted with that. May we continue to serve him to the very best of our ability and show our love for him more so as each day passes. So thank you very much. And I don't know whether the chairman's going to say it or not, but if I, I thought I've got it on my mind, I'd like to be able to take your love back to the Bethel family on Monday and tell them what a fine time we had. And uh, I'm sure you'd like to uh, agree to that. Thank you. What a remarkable future lies in store for God's faithful servants. What splendid blessings we have enjoyed here this weekend. Rich spiritual food, delightful new publications, refreshing association with our brothers and sisters, a magnificent demonstration of God's Holy Spirit at work and overwhelming evidence that the faithful and discreet slave is keeping on the watch. Truly, Jehovah deserves our most heartfelt expressions of gratitude. We, we have enjoyed having so many brothers from Bethel with us this weekend, and Brother Andrews has just mentioned, and I have to ask the question again, would you like to concur with the fact that you'd like Brother Andrews to take our love back to Bethel? We now invite all 9,082 in attendance to join in praising the one who has made possible this grand spiritual event. With our determination stronger than ever to keep on the watch, let us all, if able, stand and sing together song number 129 entitled, Now's the Time. Following the song, Brother Andrews will offer our closing prayer. That's song 129.
Our most gracious Father Jehovah, may we speak to you please through Jesus' name. Thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts for three days of delightful association. We thank you too for an outstanding program. There's no question that we have the message. We need to keep on the watch. We know that uh, in the immediate future all sorts of things could happen. Some perhaps unexpectedly, some expectedly. We ask that your blessing will be upon us to weather what difficult storms may lie ahead for us, that we'll try to our very best, according to our circumstances, to maintain high spirituality, that we remember our daily Bible reading, our study and association together, the importance of being a spiritual person. That's going to help us through the difficult days that uh, lie ahead. So whatever happens, Jehovah, though maybe we'll find a lot of it extremely difficult, we know that you'll be with us and we know that you will listen to our prayers for personal strength, both spiritually and physically. We're very happy to have seen so many here in attendance. Naturally, we think of those <clears throat> well along in years. We're finding it all a bit of a struggle. And I remember their days when they were able to run up and down, uh, but those days have passed, uh, and they're now uh, not able to do that. But we know, Jehovah, that you'll love them just as much. As we've just mentioned in our discussion, you remember... Uh, their good times and all they were able to do while they could and we ask that that may be the case with all of us Jehovah whatever our situation may you continue to bless us and hear our prayers it's such a wonderful reassurance for us that we can speak to you the God of the universe at any time anywhere whether we linger in prayer which we've been encouraged to do or whether in an emergency situation we need to approach you very quickly. We know that you can hear us and you'll be sensitive to our prayers and be helpful to us. Knowing all the circumstances and the outcome, we know you may not answer the prayer exactly as we would have expected, but it will be for, your, for, the, for our best and for your best according to your will as to the future. So thank you very much, Jehovah, the privilege of prayer. We, we are so grateful for it. We thank you too for thinking of the new ones, for helping them along, knowing that uh, many have had to make great changes, but you saw in them a good heart and you've uh, introduced them to you and your people. Uh, something maybe they never even expected, ever expected. We ask that you will continue to bless us all, Jehovah, whether new in the truth, whether elderly, whether suffering from ailments of some kind or persecution, whatever our situation may be, we ask humbly that you will continue to love us and that our love for you will increase as each day passes. So thank you once again for the privilege of being here this past three days. Though the weather's been little inclement, we've enjoyed the sunshine now, and thank you for that. But may, mainly thank you for our health and strength, however limited it might be, and thank you for refreshing us spiritually. So Jehovah, we go our various ways now. We ask for a safe journey home, and we thank you for giving us so much to reflect on in the days that lie ahead. Finally, we just think of our brothers earthwide that are Circumstances are very different from ours at this time. Those brothers are confined and persecuted and having extreme difficulty to bear. We ask that you'll be with them and you'll hear their prayers equally as with ours for help and reassurance. Please be sensitive to all of our prayers for help and strength at this time. We love you dearly and our aim is that as each day passes, our love for you will be enhanced still further. Thank you again for all things, and we say this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Convention in Stoke, broadcasting on 87.7 MHz FM and operating under the call sign Watchtower Convention Stoke. This is a test transmission operating on a restricted service license. We are transmitting on 87.7 MHz FM and operating under the call sign Watchtower Convention. This is a test transmission operating on a restricted service license. We are transmitting on 87.7 MHz FM and operating under the call sign Watchtower Convention. This is a test transmission operating on a restricted service license. We are transmitting on 87.7 MHz FM and operating under the call sign Watchtower Convention.
Welcome, one and all. What a joy and a privilege it is to be assembled here for the opening session of this Remain Close to Jehovah District Convention. For the benefit of those who need the provision, the entire program can be heard on 87.7 FM frequency. If you are carrying a cellular telephone or two-way pager, we kindly request that you adjust it to a setting that will not disturb others in the audience. We would also like to direct that any recordings of this program should be for your personal use or for the benefit of those unable to be present. Recordings should not be made available for general circulation or distribution. Could parents please keep a careful watch of their children, especially in view of the construction work in progress around the stadium? We have been planning this event for many months, and we have spent the last few weeks inviting our friends and neighbours to attend. What better way could there be to begin our opening session then by singing together song number 118 entitled Welcome One Another. We invite you to stand if possible and sing. After the song, Brother Phil Swainson will offer the opening prayer. Again, that's song 118. Our dear Heavenly Father, Jehovah God, please may we approach you as a, a gathered people uh, through the name of our mediator, your Son, Jesus Christ. We do this, Father, to bring you expressions of thanks and appreciation, and also to ask for your Holy Spirit, please, upon our convention uh, this weekend. We do have much to be grateful for, Father. We've anticipated this program since the theme was announced because it is our desire to draw close to you and to remain that way, Father, as your people. So as we anticipate the program, we do thank you for the uh, hard work and preparation that's gone into the program itself, and also the ground and the uh, effort that's been put into that, making it ready for us. 
but we do implore your Holy Spirit to be upon us, Father, that uh, all of these preparations and that have been put into place uh, may benefit us fully, that we can uh, concentrate on the program and be able to apply things, Father, that we learn. We pray your blessing upon those having a part in the program. Uh, nerves will be natural, but uh, we do ask that your spirit be upon all those that uh, will play a part with demonstrations, experiences, and parts on the program that we can all benefit uh, from the things that they have to say, directed, of course, by your Holy Spirit. So we thank you now and leave ourselves in your care. This we do through the name of your Son and to your praise and glory. Amen. Please be seated. What is the objective of this year's convention program? How can we personally benefit from being in attendance for all three days? Listen carefully as our convention chairman, Brother Maurice Simpson, answers the question, why must we remain close to Jehovah? As chairman of this Remain Close to Jehovah District Convention, I gladly welcome you and commend you for being here from the very start for an exciting three-day spiritual feast. Why are we here? Simply because the universal sovereign Jehovah has personally invited every one of us through his faithful and discreet slave. Just imagine, the universal sovereign is personally interested in each one of us. We're reminded of the words of the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 17 and verse 27, where Paul said, Jehovah is not far off from each one of us. Jehovah knows what we need to know to come to worship him. And he provides all of the information that we need to be able to do that successfully. Jehovah personally drew each one of us to him to help us to, to benefit from the provision for everlasting life. Please turn with me uh, to Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 3. That's Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 3. From far away, Jehovah himself appeared to me, saying, And with a love to time indefinite, I have loved you. That is why... I have drawn you with loving kindness. So how does Jehovah do that? How did he draw us to him? Well, it was by means of the preaching work which reached each one of us individually. And then by means of the Holy Spirit which helps us to grasp spiritual truths despite our limitations and imperfections. Are we not grateful to Jehovah that he invited us to become his intimate friend? Indeed we are. Never should we take our precious relationship with Jehovah for granted. It is a privilege to be that The Apostle Paul, however, gave words of encouragement to Hebrew Christians to prevent them losing that close relationship. If you'd open your Bibles to the book of Hebrews and turn to chapter 2, and we're going to read verse 1 together. That's Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1. Paul said, 
That is why it is necessary for us to pay more than the usual attention to the things heard by us, that we may never drift away. So there's a warning. But if you turn to Hebrews chapter 3, and again we're going to look at verse 1, he said, Beware, brothers, for fear there should ever develop in any one of you a wicked heart, lacking faith, by drawing away from the living God. A ship adrift does not reach its destination. If the captain doesn't pay attention to the wind and the currents, his ship may drift past a safe harbour and finish up on the rocky shoreline. In a similar manner, if we don't pay attention to the precious truths that Jehovah's provided for us, then we might easily drift away and suffer spiritual shipwreck. Now to suffer such a loss uh, doesn't mean necessarily that we have to reject the truth outright. In fact, it's true to say that not many uh, do reject Jehovah suddenly. No. More often, they gradually get involved in the things of the world or things that distract them from paying attention to God's world. And almost imperceptibly, they drift away from Jehovah and perhaps into sin. You see, like a captain asleep, such individuals don't wake up until it's far too late. So every single one of us must constantly be on guard against drifting away or drawing away from Jehovah. Now we're going to consider four vital areas that will help us to remain close to him. The first one, Jehovah is the source of happiness. I'll repeat that. Jehovah is the source of happiness. And many people in the world today seek personal fulfillment and yet happiness eludes them. Why? Well, consider the words of wise King Solomon. Consider what he did. He said that he built houses for himself. He planted vineyards. He had parks constructed. He had pools of water. Think about it. He was entertained by singers and musicians, the best in the land. He enjoyed the companionship of the most beautiful women of the land. So Solomon didn't hold back from pleasurable activities. And yet notice what he said at the conclusion. He says, everything was vanity and a striving after the wind. And how true those words. Because material things can be ripped away from us and we're left with nothing. But by way of contrast, just turn please to Psalms 112 and verse 1. Psalm 112 and verse 1. Happy is the man in fear of Jehovah in whose commandments he has taken delight. So no human relationship, no material possession, no personal accomplishment can bring the happiness that comes from belonging to the people whose God is Jehovah. Genuine happiness is a byproduct of having a good relationship with our Heavenly Father. 
That's why the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 20 verse 35 was moved to say, there is more happiness in giving than there is in receiving. You see, it comes from focusing not on ourself, but rather on the doing of God's will and giving to others. In fact, Jesus himself stated, happy are those hearing the word of God and keeping it. As we await the end of this present system of things, Jehovah helps us to keep our minds fixed on the things above. In order not to drift away or to draw away then, we need to keep focused on the great issues involving Jehovah's name and his sovereignty. That will help to prevent us from becoming self-centered, wanting to do everything for ourselves. Just consider the scripture with me in Romans chapter 11 and verse 33. Romans chapter 11 and verse 33. Oh, the depth of God's riches and wisdom and knowledge. How unsearchable his judgments are and past tracing out his ways are. Aren't those beautiful words? And as we contemplate Jehovah's wisdom, we should be filled with awe. The fact that he wants to teach us. He wants us to remain close to him. Those words should motivate us to do that. If we meditate on God's love for us, if we think about the future triumph of his purposes and the blessings that lie ahead, that's the thing that will bring us deep-seated joy and happiness. Are we not grateful then? That our Heavenly Father Jehovah has given us the key to true happiness. Never lose that key. Let's take our second point. Jehovah provides protection and security. I'll repeat it again. Jehovah provides protection and security. It's true. We're, filled, we're in, surrounded in a world filled with spiritual dangers. Yet notice how Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 10 gives us encouragement. It says, The name of Jehovah is a strong tower. Into it the righteous run and are given protection. This scripture reveals a basic truth about Jehovah's tender concern for each and every one of us here today. You see, God offers us protection, especially to righteous ones who actively seek him. It's as if we were running into a very strong tower for our protection. Do you not feel confidence in a father that cares for us like that. But you might ask, how do we run to him for protection? Well, there are just three basic steps. Very simple. First, we turn to Jehovah, our heavenly father, in prayer. Sincere prayer. We can supplicate him. We can thank him. We can praise him. We can ask him for help to cope. The second one, we need to work in harmony with the Holy Spirit. How do we do that? By working in harmony with our prayers. And the third one is to submit ourselves to Jehovah's arrangement by seeking association with fellow Christians who in turn will help us to allay our fears will be there as a source of encouragement and comfort when we need it. But, 
Jehovah's promise of protection is conditional. It's only realized by those who draw close to him. Remember, he invites us to seek his protection and he promises to deliver us from Satan's crafty acts. Just reminded perhaps of our young brothers in Korea. Now, they're arrested and imprisoned for their neutral stand. And they're given a sentence. And then they're released. And as they walk out of the prison gates, they're rearrested and put back in prison. They never know when they're going to be released. And yet, Jehovah sustains them and is a source of protection for them. We know that Jehovah protects his organization as a group. But how about us individually? Well, the answer to that is found in Psalm 28 and verse 7. Perhaps you'd like to turn there. Psalm 28 and verse 7. This is how the psalm is spelled. He says, Jehovah is my strength and my shield. In him, my heart has trusted, and I have been helped, so that my heart exults. Yes, when we feel Jehovah helping us, how we rejoice. So we have the confidence and we have the assurance that Jehovah does hear us, that he is interested in each one of us. He helps us to maintain our integrity to him and isn't it true that when we personally experience Jehovah's helping hand then we feel even closer to him maybe times when you personally have sensed the, the help of that spirit perhaps when we're presenting the good news and we need some help Scriptures come to mind. That is the Spirit helping us. Or maybe we have an obstacle to overcome. Perhaps we want to expand our ministry and there doesn't seem any way at all that we can do that. But we pray about it. We work in harmony with our prayers. And then suddenly it opens up for us to do what we want to do. Yes, Jehovah truly provides protection to those who remain close to him. Let's look at our third area. Our attachment to Jehovah moves us to perform deeds of godly devotion. That's a longer one to take note of. But I'll repeat it again. Our attachment to Jehovah moves us to perform deeds of of godly devotion. What does the expression godly devotion bring to your mind? I'm sure we have a variety of answers. But the expression really refers to reverence or devotion to Jehovah that moves us to do what is pleasing to him. That's what we have to remember. We want to do what's pleasing to him. And this is done even in the face of difficult trials. Why? Because we love Jehovah from the bottom of our heart. According to 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 11, it finds expression in the way in which we live our lives. To quote, Peter says, Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of persons ought you to be in holy acts of conduct and deeds of godly devotion. Yes, we want to do that. Foremost among those deeds of godly devotions is the preaching and the disciple-making work. Jehovah's will is that all sorts of people should be saved. There's no class distinction with Jehovah. Neither should there be with us. 
Having that close relationship with Jehovah, it really stimulates that desire within us to keep on seeking first the kingdom. To try to help as many people as we possibly can. And our life will abound with deeds of godly devotion if we keep seeking that kingdom first. But that involves having a, a balanced view of material things. Now, it may be hard for us to picture ourselves being blinded by the love of money. However, Jesus warned that the anxiety of life and the deceptive power of riches can choke the word of God. A close relationship with Jehovah will help us to avoid becoming ensnared by those things. Spurred on by godly devotion, many have made material sacrifices in order to expand their ministry. This has drawn them closer to Jehovah as the experience I'm about to relate will show. A migrant worker from the Philippines learned the truth while working in Japan. Upon learning the truth, he recognized the scriptural responsibilities of the headship of his family. He realized that he needed to help his family members to come to know and to serve Jehovah. So he decided to return back to the Philippines. However, his wife strongly opposed his newly found faith and wanted him to stop where he was in order to send back the money every month. But spurred on by the urgency of the times, he went home. His patience in lovingly dealing with family members was well rewarded. In time, all his family became united in worship of the one true God, Jehovah. And you know the blessing he had? His wife entered into the full-time ministry simply because he put doing Jehovah's will first in his life and remaining close to him. You see, godly devotion holds promise not only of life now, but also that which is to come, everlasting life. Now let's look at our last point, number four. Love for Jehovah leads to everlasting life. That's love for Jehovah leads to everlasting life. To keep everlasting life in view, we have to stay close to our Heavenly Father because He is the source of life, isn't He? And for us to remain close to Him, we have to read God's Word daily. We have to do personal study. We have to meditate on the things that we learn. And that, brothers, should take a prominent place in the lives of every single one of us. We should take each time each day to do this so that right principles become an integrable part of our thinking process. Think of the needle of a compass. It may be diverted to the left or to the right, but it always swings back to the north. So our minds should always be directed back to the thoughts of Jehovah. If we do this, then we'll have no reason to fear the troublesome times ahead. Isn't it true that when we dedicated our lives to Jehovah, we didn't dedicate ourselves to a religion or to a man, Neither did we de dedicate our lives to an organization. We became baptized disciples not because someone forced us, 
but because Jehovah drew us to him. We dedicated ourselves to the supreme sovereign of the universe, our creator. Weren't we drawn to him by his kind qualities, by the way in which he deals with each one of us? We recognized that our father Jehovah, he gave his only begotten son for us and he offers us the best possible future that anyone can have. That in turn moved us to offer our life to him. We did that by means of our dedication. Without a doubt, it has opened up the way to many blessings for every one of us. Don't you feel, think that we should feel as the psalmist did in Psalm 16 and verse 8? He said, I have placed Jehovah in front of me constantly because he's at my right hand. I shall not be made to totter. Isn't that how we feel when we dedicated our lives to Jehovah? May we keep Jehovah before us constantly by means of prayer and meditation on his word. He wants us to serve him out of love not just because we want to live forever. How do we do that? Well, Jesus gave the answer in Matthew chapter 22 and verse 37 and 38. Jesus said, you must love Jehovah your God with your whole heart, with your whole soul, with your whole mind. And then he said, this is the greatest and first commandment. So our motivating force in rendering sacred service to our Father should be our heartfelt love for him in response to his immeasurable love for us. You see, if our sole motive in serving God is simply to enjoy everlasting life on a paradise earth, we could easily become impatient, dissatisfied when things become difficult or events don't move as fast as we'd like them to. If that were the case, then we would be in danger of drifting away from the living God. What a tragedy when we're so near to the end. The Apostle John gave a warning to the Christians in Ephesus in chapter 2 of Revelation and verse 4 they were, he commended them first then he said nevertheless I hold this against you that you've left the love you had at first can you recall how you felt when you first learned the truth and you decided to live in harmony with it that's how those Christians felt when they first learned the truth in Ephesus but then they got to thinking, oh, things are not moving fast enough. And so that love started to wane. Can we see ourselves losing that love that we had at first? It will only happen if we allow ourselves to be sidetracked by the things of this world. So it's vital that we maintain that love. As the end of this system draws near, we can expect pressures and temptations. They're going to increase. For example, our honesty in the workplace may be tested. Our young children may be tested as to their chastity at school. Each one of us may be put to the test by this morally corrupt world. Yes, the moral corruption that surrounds all of us, it really can be very distressing and discouraging. However, if we make wise use of our time, our energy and our resources by focusing our relationship with Jehovah, then we can remain close to him. A Bible writer who faced all of these pressures was Asaph. And in Psalm 73 and verse 28, 
This is how he summed it all up. He says, but as for me, the drawing near to God is good for me. In the sovereign Lord Jehovah, I have placed my trust. Yes, that's how we want to be. May those sentiments be our sentiments. This convention provides timely spiritual food from the faithful slave to help us remain close to God. Perhaps you'd like to open your programs just for a moment. Notice today the keynote talk, an interesting title. How Jehovah draws close to us. We'll not want to miss that. And then at 2.45 this afternoon, never become enraged against Jehovah. How could we possibly do that? Well, listen attentively for the answer. And then at 4.25, you will not want to miss the talk entitled, Creation Reveals the Living God. And then that brings us to Saturday. At 11.40, we have an opportunity to review our dedication vows. The talk is entitled, Having Come to Know God, What Now? At 2.15, we have a, a thought-provoking eight-part symposium. Allow nothing to distance yourself from Jehovah. And then note at 425 the exciting title of our final talk. Stay close to Jehovah as Jeremiah did. On Sunday, we start off with an eight-part exciting symposium entitled Appreciating Jehovah's Endearing Qualities. You will not want to miss any part of that symposium. At 145, we have one of the highlights of our convention, the drama. Walk by faith and not by spirit. Very moving, but very practical. Each item at this convention is designed to help each one of us remain close to Jehovah. Listening attentively to this fine spiritual program, then applying what we learn will benefit us greatly. Remember, the drawing close to God is good for us. May all of us remain close to Jehovah, and may this assembly help us to do that. Thank you, Brother Simpson, for stirring our anticipation for what lies ahead these three days. We certainly want to remain in the stadium during the program so as not to miss one word of this vital information from Jehovah and his organization. Can a convention like this one strengthen your bond with Jehovah? If so, how? Listen as Brother Andrew Holland, an elder in the Crew North congregation, presents the part, Conventions Help Us to Stay Close to Jehovah. Jehovah loves a gathering, always has done and always will do. Why? Because gatherings or conventions such as this one draw his people closer to him. Now this happened about two and a half thousand years ago when the Jews gathered for a convention. And that event is recorded for us at Nehemiah chapter 8. Let's open our Bibles together to Nehemiah chapter 8. 
So who was on the program? Well, have a look at verse 5. It says, And Ezra proceeded to open the book before the eyes of all the people, for he happened to be above all the people. And as he opened it, all the people stood up. They were attentive to Ezra. Now, verse 7 tells us that uh, others, other Levites, were on the, co the convention program. But more importantly, what was on the program? What was covered on the program? Well, have a look at verse 8. It says, And they continued reading aloud from the book, from the law of the true God, it being expounded, and there being a putting of meaning into it. And they continued giving understanding in the reading. So Ezra and the Levites, they put meaning into it. That's what the program was about. They made application of God's law. Now what was the effect? Well, let's read verse 12. So all the people went away to eat and drink and to send out portions and to carry on a great rejoicing. For they had understood the words that had been made known to them. The people, they understood and they rejoiced. And as a result, they drew closer to Jehovah. Now conventions today help us to apply God's word in our lives and to draw closer to Jehovah. Now, this convention and all the other conventions we attend, brothers and sisters, are vital means by which the faithful and discreet slave provides food at the proper time. We gain greater understanding of Bible teachings. We're motivated to zealous activity. And aren't we put alert to dangers to our spirituality, to our relationship with Jehovah? Indeed we are. Now we know this. We know that that was the case two and a half thousand years ago and we know that it was the case only 12 months ago. Last year's convention helped many to draw closer to Jehovah. So let's speak to some of them. Very pleased to have with us Brother Mike Poynton of the Crew North Congregation and a Sister Margaret Stewart of the Mere Congregation. Now Brother Poynton and Sister Stewart were both affected positively by the symposium part last year entitled help people to awake from sleep don't forget your relatives real encouragement given there to have our unbelieving relatives in mind there was a demonstration how to do it how not to do it now Mike you came into the truth in 1975 how did this affect relations with unbelieving family members? Well, I come from a Roman Catholic family, and I'm the youngest of eight. So when I became a witness, the family were very disappointed indeed. And when we met on occasions, well, the atmosphere was very tense. Right, okay, so relations are not too good. So, Mike, then, how did the item last year help you to approach your relatives differently? Well, after 35 years, I just couldn't go diving in, witnessing to them. So I prayed about the matter and waited for an opportunity to communicate with my family. And of course, I was also determined that if an opportunity came along, then I wouldn't miss out on it. Excellent. So prayer and ready for the opportunity. So did that opportunity arise and was there a positive response? Yes, an opportunity did arise. Uh, sadly, my brother's son-in-law died tragically. I was able to offer them, my brother and his wife, words of comfort. I shared with them my Bible-based hope for dead loved ones. I was also able to give them the tract when some, the booklet when someone you love dies. Excellent. My brother and his wife passed it on to their daughter, who received it favourably. Lovely. So a favourable response. That's that's great, Mike. Thank you very much indeed. And now Margaret. Now from time to time, Margaret, uh, you're well known for your witnessing activity. And uh, from time to time you certainly witnessed to your relatives. But, but what did you think when you heard the item last year? 
With what had been said, I thought, what more can I do? So what more can I do? What an excellent attitude. So Margaret, what did you do? Well, in contacting one of my relatives, I found out that he had become ill and had been taken into hospital. I visited him, and when he came out, I visited him. And I left him with the magazines and also Bible-based literature to read. Excellent. So a very positive response there and fine developments. So what's happened since, Margaret? A local brother called and started a study with him. And the study is progressing well, but I continue to call. Excellent. So wonderful, the, uh, the application there uh, with regard to uh, that item. Thank you. So now please to be able to introduce Sister Naomi Lee of the Crew North Congregation and also Sister Hayley Brown of the Parkfield Wolverhampton Congregation. Now both Naomi and Hayley were strengthened last year by the symposium part Watch Out for Satan's Traps, The Snare. Now this item really focused in on the power of peer pressure. Now Naomi, you're 16 years of age and your school circumstances have changed over the last 12 months. What peer pressure have you experienced recently? Well, when I moved into sixth form, attempts were made by my peers to set me up with lads my age and older on a number of occasions, which was done in quite a pushy way. Right, difficult situation for you. And almost what was presented in the demonstration in that symposium part. So how did the part help you to cope with this pressure? To deal with the problem, I used to say I was not interested. However, after last year's item, I noticed how the sister openly explained the reasons why she didn't want a boyfriend and that she was a Jehovah's Witness. By dealing with the situation in this way has lessened the pressure of my friends and has protected me. My friends may not fully understand my reasons, but they respect my views for it. Excellent. So a real positive result for you there. Well done, Naomi. Now, Hayley, you're 15 years of age, and you've experienced lots of pressure since last year's convention. Now, one example of peer pressure really stands out. Now, what was that, Hayley? The PE teachers at school are always commending me on how well I do at sport. A sporting event was coming up shortly, which they wanted me to engage in. The event landed on my Thursday meeting night, and not only did I get pressure from the teachers, but the peers in my group to miss my meeting and support them instead. Well, you can understand almost from their point of view. They want their, their best sports person, don't they, for the, for the event. So, because of that pressure then, how did the part help you to handle it? I remember the scripture from the talk last year at Proverbs 29, verse 25, which says, Trembling in men is what lays a snare, but he that is trusting in Jehovah will be protected. I find this scripture very comforting, and it helps me to rely on Jehovah. Isn't that fine that that scripture came to your mind from that symposium part? Have you, did, did you take up other help as a result of what you learned from the part? Well, beforehand, I talked to my mum about situations that may arise at school. She encouraged me to pray for Jehovah's Holy Spirit and talk boldly on behalf of his name. So when peer pressure arises, I'm not under pressure, but I can talk with confidence with Jehovah's help. Excellent. So a fine result for you, Hayley. That's lovely. And uh, Naomi as well. Thank you. Now, brothers and sisters, do you remember last year's drama? It was entitled, Your Brother Was Dead and Came to Life. Many do. Do you recall the parents of David, the modern-day prodigal? They were called John and Mary. 
they really grieved, didn't they, by his decision to move out of the family home, to associate closely with, do you remember him, Al, a youth who was not spiritually minded and whose conduct was questionable. They grieved. But did they fly into a rage at their son? Did they beat themselves with guilt, thinking that they had failed because of, de because of David's decision to leave the family home and to leave the truth? No. In fact, when we recall the father John, he reasoned with David, and even when his son responded poorly, when he was determined to leave, well, John, he remained calm, he displayed warmth, and he gave good counsel. He never excused the wrong conduct. But was he ready to welcome his repentant son home? Yes, indeed he was. With all of that in mind, the drama last year certainly touched the hearts of many. Now, Brother Gary Millward, it's good to be able to talk with you, Gary, uh, of the, uh, the Bucknell congregation. Now, as a long-serving congregation elder, what were your reflections on last year's drama? Well, there can be no more tragic situation for a parent having invested years of time effort and most of all love to then see that child deviate from the road to life. Indeed so, that certainly is the case. So how do you feel then that the drama was helpful? Well I thought it quite beautifully demonstrated the balance between not having what we might describe as a shoulder shrugging permissive attitude to the wrongdoing or on the other hand, uh, an uncompromising and a harsh and unforgiving approach to the situation. Very much so. Balance certainly came over, didn't it, Gary? And no doubt this helped a number of loyal parents in such a situation. Are you, are you aware of that? Well, sadly, we know these situations do arise. And yes, I am aware of parents, and particularly fathers, who were helped to handle such situations in a balanced way that reflected Jehovah's spirit and love. Lovely, and no doubt bringing great pleasure to Jehovah as well. Thank you very much, uh, Brother Millward. So, Sister Nicola Millward of the Bucknell Congregation, uh, you're a mother of three daughters. So, as a, as a mom, as a mother, what were your feelings about the drama? Well, I thought it was one of those really memorable dramas which touched the hearts of many and it provided a fine warning example for all young people. I know my own girls and their friends found it very moving. Indeed so. Now as a, as a mother, what about the example of the parents as presented in the drama? Well, I really appreciated the fine example of the parents. Even though they were heartbroken, they stuck to Jehovah's standards and while still leaving the door open for their son to return to Jehovah. Very good. So could their example be of help to you as a parent, do you feel? Well, sadly, we never know when we could find ourselves in this situation and we could learn lessons from the fine way the family handled these very difficult circumstances by never compromising Jehovah's standards. Excellent. Thank you very much for your uh, comments there, Nicola, Sister Millward. Now, Sister Claudia Holland of the Crew North Congregation, as a young person in the truth, how did the drama affect you personally? What stood out to me was the age of the main character, as it was very close to my own. Also, think of my own family situation, as some um, family members have also fallen away from the truth. Right, okay. So, was your attitude to those who leave the truth changed by the drama? Yes, it was. Thinking back to the prodigal's older brother makes me not want to act the same way. Really, when I can see they have been repentant, I would want to be welcoming. Well, that's good to hear. It's lovely that uh, 
you and, and many others have been affected in that way. Now, you mentioned earlier that the age of the main character stood out to you. Could you just expand on that a little bit, please? Yeah. Thinking back to the drama, I can remember what distress and upset was caused to the family. I'll never forget the words of the mother who said it was like death, her son leaving the truth. With the experiences my family has been through, I've seen the upset it's not only caused to my family, but to those in the congregation. This has really proved to me that I don't want to cause the same upset by leaving Jehovah and his organisation. Well, it's really good to hear those thoughts, Claudia. Thank you very much, and thank you to Nicola, Sister Millward as well. Thank you. It's good, isn't it, brothers and sisters, to hear the expressions of those who have been helped to draw closer to Jehovah. Now, such like ones benefited from attending last year's convention, not just as a result of attending the convention, but because they personally reflected on the content and then they applied what they'd come to understand in their lives. No wonder Jehovah loves a gathering. Now, at this convention, we will receive instruction. We're going to receive practical counsel and encouragement. And just like the Jews of Ezra's day, we will rejoice. And as we then apply what we learn, as we act wisely, Jehovah too will rejoice. So may all of us pay close attention, increase our understanding, benefit fully, and thus remain close to Jehovah. Thank you, Brother Holland and all your participants. We feel closest to those we know best. What is the key to learning as much as possible about Jehovah? Please give your attention to Brother Bill Harris, presently serving the West Midlands number no. two circuit as he speaks to us on the theme, The Son is Willing to Reveal Him. If you were asked to explain who God is, what would you say? Well, perhaps most of us here would give a similar response based upon the Bible, but just think of the different responses we would receive if that question were posed to people in general. Some people, they raise their hands and say it's impossible to explain God because he is a trinity, a mystery beyond human comprehension. Others, why, they would paint God as some far-off, distant, and aloof character who plots a difficult path for humans to follow, and then when we stumble or fail, he leaps in with eternal torment in a fiery hell. Contrasting with that, others would simply say, God is love. But by taking that statement out of the context of the Bible as a whole, it can easily become distorted, because some reason that if God is love, then God tolerates everything. But if God tolerates everything, then God condones everything. And if God condones everything, then he must be indifferent to the suffering being caused for many on the earth today. And that's hardly a loving God. Of course, in a country such as this, when asked to explain who God is, some would simply shrug their shoulders and say there's nothing to explain. Yes, many honestly feel that theoretical science has done away with the need of a creator. But all these responses just prove one simple thought. That there is a mass of contradictory and confusing ideas in the minds of people today concerning God. And that is a very dangerous position to be in. Because it is vital that people call upon the name of Jehovah if they're to be saved. And we know this calling on Jehovah's name means a lot more than just using it. It implies truly coming to know Jehovah, a developing a trust, a confidence, a faith in him, 
until of their own accord people choose to dedicate their life to him. Something that ones will not do unless they know the truth about him. So the question arises, in the midst of all this confusion, is there anyone who is qualified to reveal the truth to us about God? And the answer, of course, is yes. Just think, who, when he was on the earth, told us more about Jehovah than anyone who has ever existed? And who, as mentioned in John chapter 1 and verse 14, was actually appointed by Jehovah to be his spokesman or the word? And who is the faithful and true witness the book of Revelation speaks of? Or the only begotten Son mentioned at 1 John chapter 4 and verse 9? And as the only begotten Son, who would have spent perhaps billions of years in close association with God, really getting to know him well? Who other than the one Jehovah inspired all the ancient Bible prophets to point forward to? Jesus who became the Messiah. Yes, Jesus clearly knows God better than anyone else, and that alone would qualify him to reveal God to us. But is that the only reason? Is it just because Jesus knows God better than anyone else that he's qualified to reveal God to us? No. There is another reason. And if we open our Bibles to John chapter 5, then together we can find out what it is. Now we're going to read verse 19, but remember, when we're going through this, we're reading it to find out exactly why Jesus is so qualified to reveal Jehovah God to us. Let's read the verse together. It says, Therefore, in answer, Jesus went on to say to them, Most truly I say to you, the Son cannot do a single thing of his own initiative, but only what he beholds the Father doing. For whatever things that one does, these things the Son also does in like manner. Now how does that help us? Well look carefully at the way it describes the character of the Son here. Do you see in this description any taint or any trace of an independent spirit? Do you see any inclination towards an independent way of thinking? or a rebellious spirit, or whatever? Or rather, do you see the character of a son who not only knows his father, but respects his father, loves his father, who is proud to be his father's son to such an extent that of his own free will he has chosen to mold himself to reflect his father's personality? Well, obviously, we see the latter. But do we see the degree to which Jesus has done this? In the middle of verse 19, it tells us there, the Son cannot do a single thing of his own initiative. Now, now that means that everything that Jesus did when he was on the earth is exactly what Jehovah would have done if he'd personally been present. But this verse goes even further than that. Did you see at the end of the verse... It says the Son does these things in like manner. In other words, not only did Jesus Christ do what Jehovah God would have done when he was on the earth if he'd been present, but Jesus, he did it in exactly the same way. Now do we see why that qualifies Jesus to reveal God to us? There is a saying in our language, like father, like son. Or again, others say that an obedient son is like a chip off the old block. And these sayings just illustrate a simple truth. That a son who not only knows, but loves and respects his father, can mold himself to become so much like his father, that it's possible to find out about the father by looking at the son. And remember, Jesus Christ... He reflected Jehovah's personality perfectly. But, but how does this help us? Well, it should help us to realize that this blanket of confusion concerning God can be lifted for people if they individually choose to focus their attention upon Jesus. And doing this really is the best way to find out about Jehovah. 
Let's just illustrate why we say that. If you had to explain the personality of someone who perhaps lives in a far-off distant land to others, how would you do it? Well, you could say that the person you're trying to describe is a kind person, and then read a dictionary definition of kindness. But that would only go so far. How much better it would be if you told ones that you would demonstrate the type of kind deeds this person you're trying to explain would carry out if he were present. Then others could see the true depth and meaning of the kindness and of the character who lives so far away. In effect, that is exactly what Jesus Christ did. And remember that point. Jesus did it perfectly. So what sort of things does Jesus Christ as the Son reveal to us about his Father? Well, shall we just say wonderful things? Heart-warming things, hope-giving things, life-changing things. For example, when Jesus gave us the story of the prodigal son, well, he portrayed Jehovah there as a forgiving father who was so moved when he saw his repentant son returning to him that he ran eagerly towards him, fell upon his neck, and tenderly kissed him. It really is a beautiful word picture, is it not? But Jesus didn't just leave it at words. How did he treat repentant ones? Did he harp on about their past? Did he belittle them, hold them back, humiliate them? No. Jesus commended them for changing. He helped them to rebuild themselves spiritually. He helped them to focus on the blessings ahead and then take progressive steps to attain those blessings. Now when you stop and think, doesn't that tell us a lot more about Jehovah than just saying he's a God of mercy? Or what about when Jesus was in the temple and he saw a haughty Pharisee praying and a humble tax collector? Well, Jesus used that opportunity to show that Jehovah is an approachable God who would rather the prayers of someone who is humble than those of someone who is arrogant. But again, Jesus didn't just leave it at words. He animated that with his own life. Whose company did Jesus choose? The haughty or the humble? Well, we know he chose the humble. But how did he interact with these ones? We know he spoke to them, he taught them, yes. But just think, the Son of God, the greatest man who has ever walked this planet, he also listened to these humble ones. He sought them out to have meals with them. He enjoyed their company. He even laughed with these ones. Now doesn't that help us to appreciate the Jehovah God? He wants us to be humble. But doesn't it help us to grasp his character in being a humble person too? Or what about one other case when Jesus Christ was with his apostles and he told them that God knows even when a tiny sparrow falls to the ground. And then he turned to them and said, Have no fear, you are worth more than many sparrows. Well, there Jehovah God was shown to be a caring character. But again, did not Jesus Christ care for those who were close to him? How did he care for his followers? Well, he cared for them spiritually, emotionally, and even when they needed it, physically. And Jesus did that even when they let him down on occasions. He didn't throw them away. He rebuilt them again. He helped them to be dignified. He expressed confidence in them, and when they were able to shoulder it, he gave them responsibilities. Yes, when you think about such matters, it helps us to see the true personality of God. Because it's not just the teachings, but it is Jesus' life portrayal of Jehovah's wonderful personality that really reveals God to us. But, is there not something else in this material for us? The very fact that we're here discussing these things right now, opening our Bible and looking at verses that tell us these points, doesn't this reveal something else to us? 
Let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 11 to find out the answer to that. Now we're going to look at the famous verses, uh, verses 27 through 29. But we're going to be reading these verses for three reasons. Firstly, to relay the foundation statement upon which our item is based. Secondly, to discern what is surely the most exciting invitation humans will ever receive. And thirdly, we're going to be looking at the end result that will come to us if we accept this invitation. Let's read the verses. From verse 27, Jesus said, All things have been delivered to me by my Father. And no one fully knows the Son but the Father. Neither does anyone fully know the Father but the Son, and anyone to whom the Son is willing to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are toiling down, toiling and loaded down, and I will refresh you. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am mild-tempered and lowly in heart, and you will find refreshment for your souls. How do we draw out our three points from these pass or this passage? Well, did you notice firstly, halfway through verse 27, no one fully knows the Father but the Son. Never forget, Jesus is more qualified than anyone else to reveal God to us. But did you also see at the end of verse 27, it speaks about his willingness to reveal his Father to others. Now that is quite a thought, because Jesus doesn't want to keep this information about his Father to himself, to hoard it. No, Jesus wants us to get to know his Father. In fact, basically, in the Gospel accounts, Jesus Christ is inviting us to come to know his Father by observing the way he is animating his Father's personality. What an invitation that is. And of course, as Jehovah God sent Jesus Christ to the earth, we could say that Jehovah too is inviting us to come to know him by observing the way his son acted. So what is the end result if we accept this most beautiful of invitations? Well, did you notice in verse 29, Jesus Christ said that work is involved. He said that we would have to take his yoke upon us. But this is not an empty, frustrating work. This is something that if we truly take to heart, it will refresh us, build us up, and assist us to have a meaningful life, a life that is guaranteed to bring all of us refreshment if we wholeheartedly follow it. Now that passage is really one that we should meditate upon. And it should help us to appreciate that if we wish to remain close to the Father, we must continually fix our attention upon the teachings, the example, and the attitude of the Son. Something for us to keep in mind as we're studying the Scriptures personally. So what should we now do with this material? Well, surely we would want to make sure that we set time aside on a regular basis to allow Jesus to reveal his Father further to us through that one channel of communication Jesus said he would be using, the faithful and discreet slave. We should study properly seeking out Jehovah because he's most definitely there for us. Secondly, we know that Jesus Christ led a life portrayal of Jehovah's beautiful personality well, surely within the limitations of our own imperfect flesh, that is what we want to do. We know it's not easy. We know it's not automatic. But can you imagine how pleased Jehovah God will be with us when he sees that we're putting in the effort to be like him? Imagine the smile on his face as we exert ourselves to be reflecting his personality as his son did. And finally, of course, we know that Jesus Christ was proud to go out and speak to others about his Father. He didn't hold back. He wasn't embarrassed about it. At the end of his life, he could honestly state that he'd done everything he could 
in those last three and a half years to introduce others to his father. What about us? How do we feel about our Christian commission? Well, why don't we ponder on the words of Jehovah God himself as recorded for us at Jeremiah chapter 9 and verse 24. Now these words from the ancient prophet all those years ago, these are words that we would be wise to meditate and ponder on right now ourselves. Look at the way Jehovah God expresses himself. Jeremiah 9 verse 24, Jehovah said, but let the one bragging about himself brag about himself because of this very thing the having of insight and the having of knowledge of me that I am Jehovah the one exercising loving kindness justice and righteousness in the earth for in these things I do take delight is the utterance of Jehovah do you find it strange that Jehovah tells us to brag well, remember the Apostle Paul, he also said he would boast in Jehovah. And we boast or brag in the privilege of really knowing God and in the honor of going out and helping others to come to know him too. We know some will laugh at us, but let's never forget, we believe what we know. Those who mock disbelieve what they don't know. And we know because we've accepted fully Jesus' unique role in Jehovah God's arrangement. And through Jesus, we've come to know the universal sovereign himself. So let us not be ashamed or slow down, but let's continually exert ourselves to go out and find the refreshment that is guaranteed to come when we help others realize that the Son is willing to reveal his Father to them too. Thank you, Brother Harris. How grateful we are that Jesus revealed his Father so that we can know Jehovah intimately. It is time for us to sing a song together, song number 18. We invite all who are able to do so to stand. After singing, you may wish to remain standing during some announcements. Again, that's song number 18 entitled, God's Loyal Love.
like to remind you that our convention is an open meeting. For your benefit, please wear your lapel badges at all times. Be security conscious with, re conscious with regard to your belongings and make sure that your young children are with you at all times. May we suggest that in the case of young children, you write the seat number and row on the back of their lapel badge each day. Those who find it necessary to use a folding chair may sit in the area designated for this, the running track in front of the John Smith stand. Please note, this is only for those with medical problems and folding chairs are not to be used in any other location. Because of the stadium fire regulations, there is a limit to the number of personnel allowed in the Tony Waddington suite and the Sir Stanley Matthews lounge where the elderly are located. Therefore, those wishing to visit their elderly friends or relatives need to meet in the external elderly section of the West Stand in blocks 13 to 15. You will notice that there are certain areas of the stands that have been cordoned off and we request that you please cooperate with the attendants by not sitting in these areas. For the hard of hearing, a loop system has been set up and is located in the west stand, lower section between gates 17 and 18. Baptised publishers, 35 years of age and younger, who are residents of the United Kingdom and are interested in serving at Bethel, should plan to attend the meeting for Bethel applicants on Saturday afternoon at 1pm in the Gordon Bank Suite, level 3 of the main West Stand. Please note, all baptised brothers, even those younger than 19 years of age, are invited. Pioneers between the ages of 21 and 38 who are interested in missionary service are invited to attend the meeting for Gilead applicants that will be held this afternoon at 1.15pm in the Gordon Bank Suite, level 3 of the main West Stand. You may be seated. enabled uh, servants of God in the past to remain faithful despite challenges and hardships? How can their example help us to maintain a close personal relationship with Jehovah? To find the answers, listen to this first symposium of our convention. It will be delivered by brothers Martin Geach, Jim Price, George Kidd and Cameron McNeil and is entitled Imitate those who maintained intimacy with Jehovah. Each speaker will introduce the next. But the Martin Beach, serving in the Newcastle Cross Heath congregation, will begin with the example of Abraham. have a child or children no doubt you love them very much indeed but you know it could be argued that no parent at any time in history has ever loved his child more than Abraham loved his son Isaac you see Isaac was Abraham's only child now there have been many only children and of course it does often produce a very special bond but Jehovah had given Abraham Isaac in his extreme old age. And not only that, he was the beloved son of his much-loved wife, Sarah. A gift from Jehovah. Something very special indeed. And so the bond formed during Isaac's lifetime was very strong. So can you imagine the scene then? Abraham is about to kill his only son, offer him as a sacrifice to Jehovah. Can you imagine what was going through their minds at that time? What a startling scene that is to consider. What could possibly have enabled Abraham 
to do that as asked by his God Jehovah, the God whom he loved. Well, if I say to you Hebrews chapter 11, you're likely to think of a word straight away, aren't you? But look at Hebrews chapter 11 and look at verse 17 because in that verse I think you'll find the word you're thinking of. Hebrews chapter 11 and it's verse 17. Right at the beginning of the verse it says, By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, as good as offered up Isaac. Yes, it was the quality of Abraham's faith that enabled him to do that as requested by Jehovah at that particular time. But how could he possibly have developed faith of such quality that it would enable him to do that? Because faith has differing levels, of course, so Abraham's faith must have been enormous, great quality. He was able to do it because he knew Jehovah. He had a very close and intimate relationship with Jehovah developed throughout his whole lifetime. And so he was able to, without question, follow instructions from Jehovah. He knew the kind of God that Jehovah is. What did he know? Well, he knew, for example, that at the time of Eden, Jehovah had been merciful to humankind. He hadn't destroyed Adam and Eve, he kept them alive so that you and I, and indeed he, could have the chance of life. So he knew Jehovah was merciful. He knew that Jehovah cared about people sufficiently that when he was going to bring an act of destruction at the time of the flood, that he would give out a warning, similarly at the time of Enoch. But not only did he know that Jehovah cared about people as a group, he knew that Jehovah cared about people as individuals. He'd experienced that himself. His own wife, Sarah, she had been saved from violent assault on a couple of occasions and he'd witnessed Jehovah's hand in that. He had a nephew called Lot and Lot had been saved by Jehovah. Jehovah going to some lengths to save Lot's family from the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. So he knew that Jehovah cared about people as individuals. He knew that Jehovah cared about him. When he was 75 years old, Jehovah asked him to leave his hometown of Ur where he was very comfortable and he asked him to go and live in tents. Abraham, without question, did that. His faith led him to do it and Jehovah blessed him for it. So it was these and other events that made Abraham have a real close, intimate relationship with Jehovah. And his faith in Jehovah was built not on credulity, not on just blind faith, but his faith was built on real knowledge of his God. But there was one key promise from Jehovah that enabled Abraham to display the kind of faith that allowed him to be prepared to offer his son as a sacrifice. And that promise is referred to in Hebrews chapter 11. Again, go back to verse 18. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 18 refers to the promise. It says, What Abraham had been promised, that what will be called your seed will be through Isaac. Do you see that in verse 18? He had been told that he would have a family line. And he had been told that when it seemed unlikely. But he'd experienced a miracle from Jehovah that made that possible. And he did have a son and he did have the prospect of a family line, even though he and Sarah were extremely old. Abraham was 100, Sarah was 90 at the time. But Abraham unquestioningly, unquestioningly believed Jehovah when he told him that that is what was going to happen. And he knew that for that to happen, for him to have a family line, and for that family line to be important, Isaac would have to have children. So Abraham came to an absolutely astonishing conclusion. And it really is hard to underestimate how astonishing this conclusion was. This conclusion was brought to him because of the quality of his faith. And the conclusion that Abraham came to is in Hebrews 11, referred to in Hebrews 11, verse 19. 
When considering offering his only son as a sacrifice, Abraham reckoned, it says in verse 19, you see that, but he reckoned that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. And from there he did receive him also in an illustrative way. Yes, he worked out that Jehovah could raise Isaac from the dead. If he could restore his procreative powers, he could resurrect him from the dead. No one had ever been resurrected before. No one had ever seen it. It had never been written about. But the quality of his faith allowed him to trust in Jehovah to that extent that he was willing to take that action if required. Now maybe not in such a spectacular way, but have you found yourself being willing to trust Jehovah even though you didn't know how things were going to work out for you, even though you weren't quite sure what the outcome would be? That's the kind of attitude that we want to develop. And Brother Lukic showed that attitude in his life. Could you tell us, Brother Lukic, what opportunity was presented to you? We responded to a circular overseer's letter asking your families to move to a specific congregation in Stoke-on-Trent. Did you find that difficult, moving to a new area? My wife, Karen, initially found it difficult. It was our first home as a married couple. But I personally found it very difficult. Why did you find it so difficult? I was brought up in Hensford Town. We were very happy there. And it just really was a, a tug for us. It was your home? Yes. Facing you. Yes. Very difficult. So how did you overcome your natural tendency to stay where you were and show that Abraham-like spirit and move to somewhere new? We've always tried to maintain a very close relationship with Jehovah, to get to know him well. As a result, we felt that uh, we ought to respond and trust in his direction. And when you considered that move, I think you came up with rather a nice way of looking at moving to somewhere new, didn't you? We felt that God's organisation was like a large household and it was Jehovah that was asking us to move from one room to another. In other words, from one congregation to another congregation. And we were, in, in never, we, were in doubt, we were never in doubt as to Jehovah's helping us to do that. Did you have any basis though for thinking that Jehovah would help you? We've previously experienced on many occasions Jehovah's support. So it really as a family drew us close to Jehovah and it gave us the confidence to take bigger steps and that he would continue to help us to do that. So, like Abraham, do you feel that you were blessed for following Jehovah's direction in your life? Certainly. That shared experience as a family has drawn us closer to Jehovah and it's now us to give us the confidence that whatever we may need in the future, Jehovah will provide for us. Thank you very much for the speech. Most likely, Abraham will have to wait until the resurrection, of course, to find out just what Jehovah had in mind when he asked him to offer that sacrifice. He'll, he'll realize that he was used in a wonderful way to help us to better understand the cost to Jehovah of providing the ransom sacrifice. So we're very grateful to Abraham for his example of faith. He'll never have cause to regret the quality of faith that he showed. And we'll never have cause to regret the quality of faith that we show in our relationship with Jehovah. Wouldn't you like to feel just like Abraham? Are you determined to remain close to Jehovah, like Abraham, and follow Jehovah's direction? Will you follow the example that he set for us? What about examples of faithful women, though? We have an example of a faithful man in Abraham. What about women, such as Ruth? Next, Brother Jason Price, an elder in the Starport congregation, will consider imitate those who maintained intimacy with Jehovah, Ruth. Picture two widows walking on the road into Judah. One of them is old 
the other is young. And though they journey together, their journeys differ greatly. How so? Well, for Naomi, the older widow, as she approaches Judah, she approaches her homeland, a land that she has not seen for over 10 years. The last time she saw the land of Judah, her husband and two sons were very much alive. For the younger widow, Ruth, well, as she approaches Judah, she gets further and further away from everything that is familiar to her. She leaves behind perhaps friends, family, and customs that she has known since she was a child. What would motivate Ruth to make such a tremendous sacrifice? Well, notice her words in the Bible book that bears her name. Turn with me, please, to Ruth chapter 1 and verse 16. Ruth chapter 1 and verse 16 reads, And Ruth proceeded to say, Do not plead with me to abandon you, to turn back from accompanying you, for where you go, I shall go, and where you spend the night, I shall spend the night. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Did you notice why she was prepared to make such sacrifices? Well, she had gained intimacy with Jehovah God, hadn't she? But how did she learn about Jehovah God? Well, clearly from her husband and from Naomi, her mother-in-law. And now she wanted Naomi's God to become her God. Can we imitate the example of Ruth today? Yes, we can, can't we? As we examine this scripture here, what quality do you notice about Ruth? Well, isn't it the quality of loyalty? Not just loyalty to Naomi, but loyalty to Jehovah God. Yes, Ruth wanted to learn more about Jehovah. She wanted Jehovah's people to become her people. And she was going to be brought into the earthly part of Jehovah's organization. What else can we learn about Ruth? Well, glance your eye at Ruth chapter 2 and verse 7. You see, under the Mosaic law, Jehovah had set in place the gleaning arrangement so that the poor, widows and foreigners could feed and look after themselves. But you notice in the first part of Ruth chapter 2 and verse 7, Ruth asks to glean. Why does she do that? Since she had the legal right. Well, clearly she did not take anything that Jehovah provided for granted. What a good example for us. But notice in Ruth chapter 2 verse 7, the latter part, what time did she start working? Well, she started early in the morning. Now glance your eye over to Ruth chapter 2, verse 17, the first part, and notice what time she finished work. Well, she finished late in the evening. How much did she gather? Well, the latter part of verse 17 shows us an ephah of barley. Now, an ephah of barley is about 22 litres of barley. To help you to picture that, that's about the size of an average suitcase. And she would have picked that, most likely, by hand. What an industrious, hard-working individual she was. But did she keep this food to herself? No. Verse 18 shows us very clearly uh, that then she took it to Naomi and shared it with her. Yes, her industriousness, her humility, surely made her very precious in the eyes of Jehovah God, and thereby increasing her intimacy with Jehovah God. Brothers and sisters, can we imitate Ruth by drawing closer to Jehovah, by working hard 
in the earthly part of his organization today and the field of activity of the preaching and teaching work. But you know, Ruth also showed tremendous submission, missive, tremendous submissiveness when we consider the repurchasing arrangement. Under God's law, there was a provision for a widow to be taken in marriage by her deceased husband's nearest kinsman in order to carry out the family, family line. Now, Ruth followed the direction of Naomi, despite the fact it was extremely embarrassing for her to approach Boaz. But she did, and she was blessed greatly. In fact, Boaz praised her and showed kindness and compassion to her. And Jehovah blessed her because she became an ancestress of King David and of the Messiah. Will we, brothers and sisters, will we likewise prove to be unselfish and humble as Ruth as we submit to the arrangements of Jehovah's organization today? In fact, when we think of it, within Jehovah's organization, there are many fine examples of sisters who show genuine unselfishness and humility. Brother Christopher Marshall from the Telford Ironbridge congregation knows of such a sister. Brother, please tell us, what makes this sister Ruth-like in characteristics? The sister that I know has similar qualities to Ruth. She has been a regular pioneer for about seven years and has been willing to serve in the multi-language field as she speaks Spanish. So, brother, could you perhaps tell us how did she expand in the multi-language field? Well, two or three years ago, she supported herself and served in the Dominican Republic as a missionary for about six months. She had such a lovely time, she was determined to do the same again. So, what happened next then, brother? She actually worked full-time for six months whilst regular pioneering to save enough money to go back again. But it was during this time that her fleshly sister was diagnosed with breast cancer. So, what did our sister do in this most difficult situation? Like Ruth, she relied upon Jehovah and demonstrated a real self-sacrificing spirit. She used her newly saved funds to help cover the costs of her sister's treatment and her needs. Excellent. So, what blessings has this sister received as a result? Our sister relates that she's drawn so much closer to Jehovah as he no doubt carried them through a very difficult time. She feels much closer to her sister as they are both now serving as pioneers together and her sister is doing really well. She's also felt the love of the local congregation. Thank you, brother. Ruth really earned her reputation as an excellent woman. Her unselfish love for Naomi, her industriousness and her humble willingness to adhere to God's laws and scriptural counsel all helped her to maintain intimacy with Jehovah God. Brothers and sisters, are we not also blessed to have many excellent women in our midst today? But we can all, all of us, we can all strive to imitate Ruth's example by being loyal, by working hard and adhering to scriptural counsel. And by doing this, well, we will maintain intimacy with our Heavenly Father, Jehovah God. Next, Brother George Kidd of the Kingsford Central will discuss Imitate those who maintain intimacy with Jehovah, Hezekiah.
Imagine a young man, a crown prince, living in the lap of luxury with a great future to look forward to as king. How would you feel under those circumstances? But this young man is not a happy young man. He lives in distress daily. Why so? Well, if I give you his name, perhaps you'll know. His name is Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, who was the worst of all the kings of Israel, the most wicked, the most destructive. What kinds of terrible wrongdoing did Hezekiah witness that distressed him so much? Well, concerning his father Ahaz, we read, just quoting in part from 2 Kings 16, verses 3 to 4, and he, Ahaz, went walking in the way of the kings of Israel, and even his own son he made to pass through the fire, according to the detestable things of the nations whom Jehovah drove out. So Hezekiah had a father who promoted idolatry, prevented his people from worshipping at Jehovah's temple, and burned alive at least one of Hezekiah's brothers as an offering to a pagan god. No wonder he was an unhappy young man. Hezekiah was an impressionable young man, a son devastatingly robbed of his spiritual heritage by his father. He had none of the parental example of worshipping Jehovah that he should have expected. In fact, his father did everything possible to destroy his faith not to build it up. Ahaz did the opposite of Jehovah's recommended advice at Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 and 7. And here is the advice. And these words of the law that I am commanding you today must prove to be on your heart, and you must inculcate them in your son and speak of them when you sit in your house and when you walk on the road and when you lie down and when you get up. So what's the relevance of that account today? Well, sadly, like many people, uh, young people today, Hezekiah was robbed of his spiritual in inheritance. And today that happens too by parents who also ignore the counsel at Deuteronomy that we read. They do not inculcate the truth into their children. These are parents who know the truth but ignore Jehovah's standards, parents who fail to set a good example in worship and ministry, parents who fail to provide spiritual instruction and leadership. So, young people, if your parents ignore Jehovah's standards, are you destined to repeat their mistakes? Well, let's consider Hezekiah's case. What does the record show? When he became king, Hezekiah quickly showed that he was not doomed to follow in his father's footsteps. Now, how do we know that? Because Hezekiah chose to follow good examples rather than bad ones. He looked not to his faithless father, but he chose his outstandingly faithful forefather, King David, as a role model. Just some extracts from 2 Kings 18, uh, verses 3 to 7, which says of Hezekiah, verse 3, as king, he continued to do what was right in Jehovah's eyes, according to all that David, his forefather, had done. What else did he do? Well, he chose not to be a passive resistor of badness, but to fight actively against false worship. And also, Hezekiah trusted in Jehovah and kept sticking to him. Not surprisingly, in verse 7, it tells us that Jehovah proved to be with him, to be with faithful Hezekiah. So in all these ways, he built intimacy with Jehovah. 
Now, what about you, young people here today, if it applies to you? You too can choose to stay close to Jehovah, even if she got about her son and what he would do. She meditated on those vital truths. The Bible says that Mary carefully kept all these sayings in her heart. So when we consider how Mary was strengthened by these things, we can see how vital it is that we build intimacy with Jehovah through regular Bible reading and meditation. Mary also strengthened her intimacy with Jehovah by learning to lean on him during difficult times of her life. Let's consider a few of the situations that she faced. When Mary revealed her pregnancy to Joseph, he found it hard to accept what was happening and planned to divorce her secretly. Can you imagine how distraught Mary must have been with that discussion to hear Joseph's rejection of her? The Bible doesn't reveal how many days that situation may have lasted, but how emotionally tiring it must have been for her. Now imagine how her faith would have been built up, strengthened, when Joseph returns and explains that Jehovah has explained everything to him in a dream. Mary also had to endure the sudden loss of her husband while she herself was relatively young. Mary and Joseph had been through so much together already in this early part of their marriage. Can you imagine the scene in your mind's eye? Darkness has fallen, the children are now asleep. Mary and Joseph are sat outside, sat close to each other on a bench, just listening to the insects chirping in the night air. They talked about Jesus. They wondered about what his future would hold for him, concerned about whether they were preparing him in the right way, raising him in the right way. Then suddenly, she was alone. Have you lost your partner in death, perhaps? Maybe you still feel the pain and emptiness that such a loss causes, even after many years. Well, Mary found great comfort in her faith and her relationship with Jehovah and the sure hope of the resurrection. Mary had at least seven children, so her grief must have been compounded by the heavy responsibility that she had to, to, have to bear. How often she must have prayed to Jehovah with real earnest, asking for his support and his spirit to help her, to guide her to make the right decisions and to set a fine example. Today, many single mothers are likewise struggling to make ends meet while striving to set a spiritual lead. We can see from Mary that prayerful reliance on Jehovah is extremely important. And then a massive body blow. Mary endured the death of her child. In Luke chapter 2, it was prophesied that she would feel a pain as if she had been run through with a sword. How true that must have been when Jesus was put to death. But Mary refused to let this test destroy her emotionally or to weaken her faith in Jehovah. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 14, it tells us that immediately after Jesus' death, she was with the other disciples persisting in prayer. So through this brief reflection of Mary's life, what have we learned? How did she maintain intimacy? Well, her intimacy with Jehovah was built up through Bible reading, through meditation, and through prayerful reliance on Jehovah during life's trials. Have you ever faced a trial or a challenging assignment? How can we cope with such situations? Well, let's talk to Sister Debbie Rees from the Welsh Pool Congregation. What daunting assignment did you take on, Debbie? Well, they were setting, setting up a new Welsh-speaking congregation, and they needed publishers, and especially elders. And as Andrew's an elder, we decided, we um, discussed the possibilities of joining, and then we went, wanted to go along with Jehovah's Direction. I also wanted to support Andrew in his decision. Very good. So how did you feel about that yourself? Well, I felt excited about the challenge, but also a bit apprehensive and unsure. Why was that? Well, two things, really. 
I'd always been in Welshpool congregation, so the idea of going to a new hall with new people wasn't really something I wanted to do. And the other thing, um, although we live in Mid Wales, English is spoken by everybody, so it meant learning a new language. And um, Welsh isn't an easy language to learn, so that was a challenge too. I see. How did, you, how did your trust in Jehovah help you to overcome those worries? Well, we know that when Jehovah's behind something, it works. Like the change to the Christian congregation, when you see it in action, it draws you closer to Jehovah. Very good. Did anything else help you to move along with that direction? Well, I wanted to support Andrew in his role as an elder, and I knew how important that was um, to enable the congregation to be set up successfully. I see. How, d how did your time in the congregation work out then? Well, we stayed in the congregation for three years until it was established, and the love of the brothers and sisters really helped to smooth out any of the difficulties that I thought I was going to have. And it also, um, because we worked together as a team, that drew us together, like learning the language. Okay, that's lovely, thank you. So looking back on the whole experience, how would you encourage someone in a similar position? Well, now I can really see that submitting to Jehovah's direction and staying close to him, he can carry you through any challenges. Thank you very much. So when you were given an assignment, whether in the form of a scriptural commission or by means of direction from Jehovah's organization, do not assume that it is beyond you. Imitate Mary, be submissive and trust in Jehovah. He will give you everything that you need to do his will. See how he supported Mary through all of those difficulties, enabled her to be successful and to cope. What was it that built Mary up? study and meditation and being determined to endure whilst relying upon Jehovah. Recall Jehovah's assurance at 2 Chronicles 16 and verse 9 where it says that as regards Jehovah his eyes are roving about through all the earth to show his strength in behalf of those whose heart is complete toward him. So let us remain close to Jehovah and may such Bible examples as Abraham, Ruth, Hezekiah and Mary move each of us to maintain our intimacy with Jehovah. Outstanding examples of faith, loyalty, endurance and intimacy with Jehovah. We thoroughly enjoyed those encouraging talks and interviews. Thank you, brothers. Do you sense that Jehovah is drawing close to you? In what ways does he do so? Let us pay close attention as Brother Edmund Kerr, serving in the Staffordshire No. 2 circuit, presents the keynote address, How Jehovah Draws Close to Us. Closeness. Have you ever noticed that the word closeness is often associated with danger? How many times do we hear a mother say to her children, don't get too close to this, don't get too close to that, and it doesn't end there. When we grow up, it's don't drive too close to the car in front, stand clear of the doors. In fact, it seems that the course of wisdom these days is keep your distance. Sometimes we use the word closeness and say that two people are close. That's usually when they like each other. But there's always someone who will say, don't get too close. You don't really know him. You don't really know her. It'll all end in tears. So when we hear Jehovah's invitation to draw close to him, many can be forgiven if they think that it's totally unrealistic 
to draw close to God, that God would want to be too close to them. Perhaps they may feel that God is too remote. Perhaps they feel unworthy to approach Jehovah or too unworthy to even be approached by him. But let's take hold of our Bibles and turn to where Jehovah gives us that powerful invitation through his Bible writer James to have this intimate relationship with him. James chapter 4 and verse 8. Simply put, James said, draw close to God and he will draw close to you. Now when we read that scripture, where do you often concentrate your attention? Isn't it the first part, draw close to God? Well this morning we want to pay close attention to the latter part. Jehovah will draw close to you. Because notice in that invitation, it starts with the invitation to draw close to him, but finishes with the promise that he will draw close to us. How does that make you feel? Well, let's start with this idea, is Jehovah God too remote or too distant as many feel? Well, not according to the Apostle Paul, who was inspired by Jehovah back in the first century, when addressing a group of Athenian philosophers on Mars Hill, he was inspired to tell them, Jehovah is not far from each one of us. Yes, Jehovah is willing, he is ready, he is eager to receive humans into his favor as his close friends. And there are many examples in the Bible who did just that. Let's just think for a moment about one of the kings of Judah, Asa. Prior to Asa's rule, Judah and Benjamin had become steeped in apostasy during the 20 years following the split of the nation of Israel into two. But like David, his forefather, Asa demonstrated zeal for pure worship and courageously set about cleansing the temple prostitutes and the idols out of the land. And that took courage because one of the things he had to deal with was his own grandmother, Maeka. She had to be removed from her position as a sort of first lady of the land because she had made a horrible idol or the sacred pole Asherah and Asa had to burn that religious idol. Yes, King Asa searched for Jehovah and Jehovah allowed himself to be found by him. Let's just confirm that if we turn in our Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 15. And we'll just take into consideration the first two verses. 2 Chronicles 15 verse 1 and 2. Now as for Azariah the son of Oded, the Spirit of God came to be upon him. Consequently he went out before Asa and said to him, Hear me, O Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. Jehovah is with you as long as you prove to be with him. And if you search for him, he will let himself be found by you. But if you leave him, he will leave you. Yes, Asa's searching for Jehovah amounted to his always seeking God's direction and then being sure to obey him. Now if we just go back one chapter to 2 Chronicles chapter 14 and we just consider verse 2 and verse 4 notice what is now written and Asa proceeded to do what was good and right in the eyes of Jehovah his God further he said to Judah to search for Jehovah the God of their forefathers and to do the law and the commandments of course, Asa was like you and I, he was not a perfect man, but despite the lack of wisdom and spiritual insight that he manifested at various times of his reign, Asa's good qualities and his total freedom from apostasy evidently outweighed all the errors that Jehovah God saw in that man. In fact, Asa came to be viewed as one of the faithful kings of the line of Judah, and his 41-year reign overlapped or covered the reigns of eight kings of the nation of Israel. So what a faithful man he proved to be. So yes, it is vital that we draw close to God if we're going to have his blessing now 
and to eventually to become part of his universal family. Now in line with our theme this morning, it's of vital importance that we realize that Jehovah was the first one to take action in drawing close to us. Now how did he do that? Well it was the Apostle John who bore evidence of that in his uh, first letter toward the end of the Bible. 1 John chapter 4. We're going to consider verse 9, 10 and then verse 19. I'm sure you'll remember some of these verses. 1 John 4, verse 9 and 10 first of all. John wrote, By this the love of God was made manifest in our case because God sent forth his only begotten Son into the world that we might gain life through him. The love is in this respect not that we have loved God but that he loved us and sent forth his Son as a propitiatory sacrifice for our sins. And then verse 19 As for us, we love because he first loved us. Now how is God's bounteous love demonstrated or expressed towards us? Well, in many ways. What about the beautiful home that he has created for us, his lovely planet? Have we not enjoyed our British summer so far this year? Has it been a pleasure to see the sunshine, the blue skies, the, the green of the trees and forests around us in spite of all the damage that man has done to this home? Has he not made marvelous physical provisions? We enjoy the animals, the birds, the fish, the fruit, the vegetation to sustain us. He looks after our spiritual needs. Gradually he built up a written record in the Bible of his dealings with mankind. And today we have a constant spiritual banquet provided through the faithful and discreet slave. What about the assurance that Jehovah gives to us that when we pray to him he actually listens? But brothers and sisters, what would you say is the foremost way in which Jehovah draws us to him? Well, surely it has to be through the ransom sacrifice. What did John just remind us of? It was Jehovah who sent his most precious son so that we might be delivered from sin and death. And it was Jesus who revealed that to Nicodemus, the Pharisee, in the middle of the night. In John 3.16, a verse in the Bible that some consider to be the most beautiful verse in the whole Bible. For God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten Son that everyone exercising faith in him might not be destroyed but have everlasting life. So the ransom... The ransom sacrifice is the key to our intimacy or our closeness with Jehovah. Now that was such an important point, it had to be reiterated. And it was the Apostle Paul who does that for us in the book of Romans chapter 5. I'd like to turn there with me brothers, Romans 5, and we'll consider verse 6 through 8. Paul puts it slightly differently and just helps us to reason here. He says, For indeed Christ, while we were yet weak, died for ungodly men at the appointed time. For hardly will anyone die for a righteous man. Indeed for a good man, perhaps someone even dares to die. Well, this was the point. But God recommends his own love to us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Notice how Jehovah draws us to him. He's the one who takes the initiating action. Jehovah didn't stubbornly stand by and say, well, you got yourself into this fine old mess. You get yourself out of it. And when you've got rid of your sin, then we'll talk. No, while we were yet sinners, he sent his son to die for us. Now once that provision was made, it became a basis for a very unique and an approved approach to Jehovah. And it was Jesus himself who explained 
this unique approach to his heavenly father and he did it in conversation to the disciple Thomas at John 14 verse 6 Jesus said to him I am the way and the truth and the life no one comes to the father except through me but here's a really fascinating point brothers about the ransom so if you're taking notes I would really encourage you to make a note of this one did you realize that Jehovah's precious provision of the ransom sacrifice established a legal basis for even pre-Christian believers and servants of God to have an intimacy with him well how could that be if Jesus hadn't yet provided the ransom to find the answer to that we've got to go back to the book of Romans this time Romans chapter 3 we're going to consider verse 25 and 26 Romans 3 25 26 Paul writes God set him forth as an offering for propitiation through faith in his blood this was in order to exhibit his own righteousness because he was forgiving the sins that occurred in the past while God was exercising forbearance so as to exhibit his own righteousness in this present season that he might be righteous even when declaring righteous the man that has faith in Jesus now, no wonder the Apostle Peter said that some of Paul's writings were hard to understand did you get the gist of that what was Paul saying what do those verses mean well let's break it down brothers can you recall what was the very very first messianic prophecy ever recorded in the Bible Have you got it it was Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 that's when after Adam and Eve sinned Jehovah uttered that prophecy that through his woman he would send a seed who although being bruised in the heel would eventually crush Satan in the head that was our hope for the future that was Jehovah God's purpose for mankind now if you got that right well done but now when would you say that that prophecy in Genesis 3:15? began to be fulfilled well if you said 33 CE you would be right yes Genesis 3:15 found fulfillment in 33 when Jesus was put to death on a torture stake now why is that important well think about this the very moment that Jehovah God uttered the prophecy at Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 the ransom sacrifice of his son Jesus Christ was as good as paid from Jehovah God's point of view why can we say that why could Paul say that because he knew that nothing nothing no one can ever stop Jehovah God from fulfilling his purposes so on the basis of the future sacrifice of Jesus Jehovah could now forgive the sins of Adam's descendants who exercise faith in that promise now brothers does that not bring home to us the very full scope of the ransom sacrifice of Jesus Christ the benefits of Jesus sacrifice are not just present they're not just future they also go right back to Adam's earliest descendants why is that important to us because if we ever feel unworthy to be drawn close to Jehovah we now see the lengths that Jehovah has gone to to draw close to imperfect humans now on this subject of being drawn to Jehovah Jesus said that didn't he that Jehovah draws people to him now the fact that we're drawn to Jehovah doesn't that indicate that a force has to be at work it's very much like perhaps when we were children or perhaps some of you young ones here today still do it I don't know but have you ever got a sheet of paper 
and on the paper you've sprinkled some iron filings and then underneath the paper you've held a magnet and as you move the magnet around under the paper the iron filings form a pattern or go to where you want them to go or if you have a very powerful magnet have you never tried to pull a, a metal object across a desktop? Well, that's the kind of force that uh, Jehovah God uses. But what's the force he uses to draw you and me and others closer to him? Well, he has the most powerful force in the whole universe. It was the force which he used in the creation of the universe and all the things in it. That force is none other than Jehovah's own Holy Spirit. So that Holy Spirit draws us to his Son. It draws us to the hope of eternal life. It doesn't mean that we have no decision in this. If we respond to that force, we can be drawn to him. Now that makes the point then that even the most humblest of people on the face of this planet can be drawn to Jehovah if they will follow the leadings of that spirit. Now in any relationship that we forge, the bond that we forge is based on knowing the person, admiring and valuing the person's distinctive traits and qualities. Well, Jehovah's appealing ways and qualities are revealed in the Bible. And isn't the Bible a product of Holy Spirit? So here's another force that draws us to Jehovah. The Bible is a vital field of study for us. That's why we use it so much in our personal study, our meetings and conventions. So the more we learn about Jehovah through the pages of the Bible, the more real Jehovah becomes to us and the closer we feel to him because we are responding to that force of the Holy Spirit. Have you ever thought that the Jehovah God had the Bible written for the purpose of revealing himself to you and me and to others around the world? And the fact that he did so in a language that humans could readily understand? But today, sadly, in a world that doesn't want to believe in God, that lovely reason is a reason now used for people to turn away from the Bible. Oh, the Bible, they say, that's just a book written by men. Well, who else could have written it? The angels could. Angels, we know, are very, very interested in human affairs and activities. But think of this. If angels were given the commission to have written the Bible, would they have seen things from a human point of view? Would they have been able to relate to our needs? Would they relate to our weaknesses? Could they relate to our aspirations? Surely having humans write the Bible makes the Bible more personable. We can relate to the Bible writer's feelings, his thinking on matters, his doubts, his imperfections. But is that important? Let's think about that. What angel could have fully conveyed the feelings of Jonah the prophet when he ran away from Jehovah and his commission to go to Nineveh and then repented inside the belly of that huge fish? Now, you think you can find Jonah in your Bible? It's not a book we look at very often, but he comes after Obadiah. It shouldn't be too difficult. Jonah chapter 2. Let's just read a few verses here. Verse 1 and 2. Then Jonah prayed to Jehovah his God from the inward parts of the fish and said, Out of my distress I called out to Jehovah, and he proceeded to answer me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried for help. Now remember, Sheol is the Hebrew word for the grave. So dire was Jonah's circumstances, he felt he'd been buried alive. Under normal circumstances, there was no way that Jonah was going to walk away from this. 
Out of the belly of Sheol I cried for help, and you heard my voice. Drop your eyes down to verse 4. As for me, I said, I have been driven away from in front of your eyes. How shall I gaze again upon your holy temple? Verse 7. When my soul fainted away within me, Jehovah was the one whom I remembered. Then my prayer came into you, into your holy temple. Could you imagine an angel having those feelings and being in that predicament? And what about the prophet Isaiah? At seeing Jehovah's vision or Jehovah's glory in a vision, do you remember what Isaiah said? He said, I am unclean in lips. Can't we appreciate that? If you today stood before Jehovah in that vision, would you not feel exactly the same? But no holy angel of Jehovah would ever utter words like that. And would an angel of Jehovah ever have to say that he felt unworthy, as Jacob did, when Jehovah directed him back to the land of his relatives, knowing he had to come face to face with his brother Esau, the one from whom he'd taken the birthright at Jehovah's instruction? Just read about how Jacob felt and expressed himself to his God Jehovah. It's Genesis 32, verse 10 and 11. Genesis 32, verse 10 and 11. Jacob said, I am unworthy of all the loving kindness and all the faithfulness that you have exercised toward your servant. For with but my staff I crossed this Jordan, and now I have become two camps. Deliver me, I pray you, from my brother's hand, from Esau's hand, because I am afraid of him that he may come and certainly assault me, mother, together with children. You put yourself into his shoes, how he must have felt, his stomach in knots, wondering what Esau was going to do. He confesses that he was afraid of this man. Would an angel have said that? No. One angel in Hezekiah's day destroyed 185,000 trained troops in one single night. What chance would Esau have stood? Would an angel have felt fearful, as the apostles did, when seeing Jesus walking along the waters of the Sea of Galilee on a storm-tossed evening in the middle of the night? Would an angel have to say that he had to muster up boldness to continue his mission after being severely beaten as the Apostle Paul did? But when humans say it, we immediately understand and we even feel what was written. Could you put yourself into the Apostle Paul's shoes when he wrote these words to his traveling companion Timothy? They're recorded for us at 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. 1 Timothy 1, verse 15. He said, Faithful and deserving of full acceptance is the saying that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Of these, I am foremost. Yes, by pondering on what the Bible says about Jehovah's interactions with his faithful servants of the past, we can learn countless wonderful things about our God Jehovah. This draws us to him and helps us to know him very well and helps us to come to know and love him very much. So the next time you read that simple invitation at James 4 and verse 8, just remember this, brothers. It is more than a goal, drawing close to Jehovah is like a journey. As long as we remain faithful, then that journey to Jehovah will never end. It's a little bit like when you go on holiday, perhaps, say, to the beautiful Lake District. It might take you a few hours to get there from here. That's your journey to the Lake District. But how long do you think it would take you to really get to know the Lake District? Every nook and cranny, all the animals, birds, fish, all the mountains, all the walks, all the lakes. You know, people have spent a lifetime 
studying just that one part of the British Isles. They've written books and they still don't know all there is to know about that one tiny corner of the British Isles. So we will never stop drawing closer and closer to Jehovah. After all, there will always be something more to learn about him. Even the Bible doesn't tell us all that there is to know. Do you remember what the Apostle John said about Jesus? Talking about Jesus, he said that uh, if all the things that Jesus did were to be put into writing, the world could not contain the scrolls that were written. Now, if he could say that about Jesus, how much more so about the Father? Can you see now why Jehovah promises eternal life? Even eternal life will not bring us to the end of our journey of learning about Jehovah. Could you imagine living on this earth for millions and billions of years and still feeling that there are countless wonderful things about Jehovah still to be learned? Yes, we'll always have reason to feel as did the psalmist who sang these most encouraging words in Psalm 73 and verse 28. And if you've noticed our program, this scripture is the theme for our day. Psalm 73 verse 28. The psalmist sang, But as for me, the drawing near to God is good for me. In the sovereign Lord Jehovah, I have placed my refuge to declare all your works. Yes, eternal life will be unimaginably rich and it will be varied. And drawing closer and closer to our Heavenly Father will be the most rewarding part of it. The only difference then will be that our relationship will have changed. No longer will we be considered to be his friends as we are now, but then we'll be considered as being his perfect son or his perfect daughter. And you know, in that lovely new earth, just so near at hand, no one will ever have to say, don't get too close, it'll only end in tears. The only tears that you and I will shed will be tears of joy. It is our prayer that may Jehovah draw ever closer to you now and throughout all eternity. Thank you, Brother Kerr. Well, what a thrilling session this has been. The attendance for this opening segment of our Remain Close to Jehovah District Convention is 7,297. It is appropriate that we stand now and join our voices in singing song number 113, Grateful for God's Word. That's song number 113.
there will be an intermission. We invite you to be back in your seats at 1.50pm so that you may enjoy to the full what has been prepared for the afternoon. Seven point seven megahertz FM and operating under the call sign Watchtower Convention Stoke. You're listening to the Watchtower Convention in Stoke, broadcasting on eighty seven point seven megahertz FM and operating under the call sign Watchtower Convention Stoke. Good afternoon. After that refreshing noon break, 
we're ready to fix our attention on the rest of today's program. The song selected to begin our session is number 91, My Father, My God and Friend. Let us all stand and sing it together. That's song number 91. Please be seated. The more we know about Jehovah, the more we want to learn. And the Bible reveals so many amazing details about his personality and ways. For this reason, we're sure you will enjoy the next part entitled, Answers to Questions About Jehovah. As Brother Paul Hendricks, an elder in the Wolverhampton Claygate congregation, propounds the questions, think how you might use the Bible to assist others to draw near to Jehovah. Then listen intently as Brother Hendricks presents answers to questions about Jehovah. How can we attain real happiness today? Well, Jesus gave us the answer, if you'd like to turn to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 3. That's Matthew chapter 5 and verse 3. And there it reads, Happy are those conscious of their spiritual need since the kingdom of the heavens belongs to them. Did you notice in that verse that happiness comes not from having a spiritual need, but of being conscious of it and then satisfying it? 
So how can we satisfy our spiritual need? Well, we can do it through personal study, preparation for the meetings, and one of the finest ways is by researching and studying the three to four chapters of our weekly Bible schedule. Now what will all this research do? Well, it helps to satisfy our spiritual need. It gives us the confidence so we can speak to others freely in our field ministry. So what we're going to do this afternoon, we're going to have four questions raised that through our study can help us to know Jehovah better. So we're going to ask Brother Ron Johnson from the Warsaw Blockswich congregation if he'd read our first question for us. Why would a God of love destroy bad people forever? The answer? Because Jehovah loves his servants, he will not tolerate unrepentant sinners forever. Now notice this quality of Jehovah if you turn to Isaiah 43 and verse 4. That's Isaiah 43 and verse 4. And there it reads, Owing to the fact that you have been precious in my eyes, you have been considered honourable, and I myself have loved you. Let's just stop it there. Notice that Jehovah speaks of his servants as being precious in his eyes. He says that he loves them. Now that is the first reason why Jehovah has to destroy the wicked. Now a second reason is found for us at Psalm 37. And we'll read verse 10. That's Psalm 37 and verse 10. And it reads, And just a little while longer, and the wicked one will be no more. And you will certainly give attention to his place, and he will not be. Notice at the start of the verse that the wicked are no more. And then it says, You will look for them, but they will not be. Now what will that result in? Look at verse 11. But the meek ones themselves will possess the earth, and they will indeed find their exquisite delight in the abundance of peace. Now, if the Israelites had obeyed Jehovah's commands, they could have enjoyed conditions like this. So there will be an abundance of peace by Jehovah removing the wicked. So just for emphasis, did you note the two reasons? One, because of Jehovah's love for his people. And secondly, we can only get peace on the earth by the removal of the wicked. But does that mean that Jehovah takes delight in destroying the wicked? Certainly not. The Bible tells us clearly that Jehovah pleads with people to turn back, turn back from your bad way. So here we can see clearly that Jehovah never forces people to serve him. All of us are given a free will. Let's have our second question, please. In what sense has Jehovah felt regret? On a number of occasions, the Bible mentions that Jehovah felt regret. We're now going to consider two examples. The first one is when Jehovah felt regret over the calamity that he was intending to bring upon the city of Nineveh and its people. The second one is when the Bible tells us that Jehovah felt regret making Saul king over Israel. 
What does this mean? Well, the Hebrew term, which is translated, feel regret, refers to either a change of attitude or a change of intention. Now let's go back to those two examples. In what sense did Jehovah have regrets about his judgment on the city of Nineveh? Well, let's find out. Turn, if you would, to Jonah chapter 3, and we'll read verse 10. That's Jonah chapter 3 and verse 10. And there it says, And the true God got to see their works, that they had turned back from their bad way. And so the true God felt regret over the calamity that he had spoken of causing to them. Now what does it say next? And he did not cause it. So here we can see, because the people in Nineveh had turned back from their bad way, what does the scripture say? Jehovah did not cause its ruination. He had a change of intention. Now let's think of our second example. Why did Jehovah say that he regretted making Saul king? Well, when Saul was first appointed king, he was a modest man, showing desirable qualities. But Jehovah's feelings changed towards Saul as Saul turned out to be both faithless and disobedient. So Jehovah had a change of attitude towards him. So can we see in these two examples that when the Bible says that Jehovah felt regret, it can mean either a change of attitude or a change of intention. But what does it not mean? It does not mean that Jehovah makes mistakes. How do we know? Because Deuteronomy 32 and verse 4 tells us that the activity of Jehovah is perfect. So what a comforting thought it is to know that Jehovah is not only reasonable, he is adaptable, he's merciful, and he is willing to have a change of attitude or intention towards erring individuals, provided they make the necessary changes. Let's have our third question, please. Does Jehovah know all things before they happen? The answer? Jehovah's ability to foreknow and foreordain is clearly stated in the Bible. The fact that Jehovah can foresee future events forms the basis for true prophecy. So, does Jehovah have to use his foreknowledge at all times? No. He can use it selectively and at his own discretion. Let's illustrate it. A singer can have a beautiful voice, but he doesn't have to go round singing every minute of every day for the rest of his life, does he? Likewise, with Jehovah, he has the ability to foreknow the future, but he uses it selectively. Now let's just think of four logical reasons why this is the case. Number one, if God knew that Adam and Eve were going to sin, that would mean that he would be responsible for all the wickedness on the earth and all human suffering. That is completely out of harmony with a God of love. Secondly, why would Jehovah say that he felt regrets if he could foresee the outcome, as we've just reasoned? Thirdly, 
When Jehovah told Abraham to offer up Isaac, his son, when did Jehovah know that he had the faith to do it? Well, let's find out. Turn, if you would, to Genesis 22, and we'll read verse 12. That's Genesis 22 and verse 12. notice and he went on to say do not put out your hand against the boy and do not do anything at all to him for now I do know that you are God fearing in that you have not withheld your son your only one from me did you notice there As Abraham was just about to offer up Isaac, his son, what did Jehovah say? He stopped him and says, Now I do know. Would Jehovah have made that statement if he knew in advance that Abraham would obey this command? And fourthly, if Jehovah used his foreknowledge on every occasion there would be no point in having the good news preached. Why? Because Jehovah would know already who was going to be saved. And what would the point of Jehovah being patient be if he already knows who is going to be saved? Let's have our fourth question raised, please. How will it be possible to learn new things about Jehovah forever? The answer? Jehovah is the creator. He has been alive forever and keeps on working. So will we ever get to know everything about all that Jehovah has done or will yet do? Well, the answer to that is found for us in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 11. That's Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 11. And there it reads, Everything he has made pretty in its time, Even time indefinite he has put in their heart, that mankind may never find out the work that the true God has made from the start to the finish. Again, look at the verse carefully. And what has Jehovah put into our hearts? Time indefinite. Yes, he has put within us the desire to keep living forever. But even having put that within us, what does the verse say? That mankind will never find out the work of the true God. And you know how true that is? Scientists estimate that there are still yet between 1 and 10 million different varieties of life that are still waiting to be discovered. But can you just imagine for a moment having the time to do things without ever being rushed? Can you imagine living forever with perfect health, with a body that is full of energy, a brain that is working perfectly, with a memory to match? Ask yourself, What would you like to do in paradise? What could you do in paradise? Well, maybe your desire is to want to learn to play a musical instrument. Or maybe to compose a beautiful song. Or maybe your interest is in the field of science. Did you know that man has been studying photosynthesis for 200 years and he still does not fully understand how photosynthesis works if he did he could feed the world from a building 
the size of the school. Now just imagine fully understanding photosynthesis in paradise. Do you think that would benefit us? And talking of food, do you ever get bored of eating? Are you dreading going home tonight and having roast lamb, mint sauce, roast potatoes, peas and cabbage? Do you dread the thought of apple pie and custard? Or black forest gatto? No. Humans never get bored of eating. It is a fact that if you were to eat just three meals a day, you would have to live for over 300 years just to taste every food known to man. And one of the most exciting things we will learn in paradise is when the resurrection begins. Just imagine finding out who your ancestors are. Not from an internet-based product, but from actually meeting your family and ancestors face to face. Talking to them, finding out all about your family. No doubt many of us will be pleasantly surprised, or maybe even shocked. But let me ask you one thing. Do you think you'll ever get bored? Will we ever stop learning about Jehovah? Never. Because our human lifespan is so short, this statement is certainly true. People either know a little about a lot, or a lot about a little. Would you agree? But in paradise, how that will change. The more we learn about Jehovah, the more we're going to marvel, draw closer to him. What a wonderful prospect. Tell me, do you feel like this? Have a look at Jude and verse 25. Jude, verse 25. And there it reads, To the only God our Saviour, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, might and authority for all past eternity and now and into all eternity. Amen. Just look at that verse again. We will glorify Jehovah for all eternity because of who he is. We will remain close to Jehovah. We'll never stop learning about him because he is a grand creator. Yes, life is going to be truly wonderful. Brothers and sisters, may we all be there to praise Jehovah for all eternity. Thank you very much, brothers. Indeed, the more we learn about Jehovah, the more we marvel at his wonderful qualities. It can be difficult to be the one receiving discipline. So how can we make sure that it, uh, its benefit is not lost on us? Please listen intently as Brother Tim Price, an elder in the Bridge North congregation, presents the talk let Jehovah's discipline mold you. Can I invite you to turn with me to the 73rd Psalm, where we find the words of a Levite musician named Asaph. See if you can make an important link 
between the two statements we find in verse 24 and verse 28. So verse 24 of Psalm 73. With your counsel you will lead me and afterward you will take me even to glory. And the first part of verse 28. But as for me, the drawing near to God is good for me. Did you make the connection? Asaph had come to the realization that in order to draw and remain close to God, he had to be led by his counsel. Applying Jehovah's counsel secured him, bound him tightly to God. You see, the earlier verses of Psalm 73 reveal that by his own admission, at one point, Asaph's thinking was unbalanced, causing him to deviate and to be bitter at heart, putting distance between him and Jehovah, loosening the bond between them. Yet by humbly accepting and applying counsel, he was able to regain his spiritual balance and, more important, to maintain intimacy with God. In line with our theme, he came to recognize that Jehovah's discipline was molding, was shaping him. Now perhaps those expressions bring to mind someone who works with clay. And we note that fittingly, Jehovah is described numerous times in the scriptures as a potter. For example, in prayer to Jehovah, Isaiah acknowledged, we are the clay and you are our potter and all of us are the work of your hand. Now what an appropriate illustration because in the right hands, a piece of clay, which after all, is essentially a worthless clod of earth, can be transformed into a vessel of exquisite beauty and great value. But for that end result to be achieved, the clay has to go through the process of being kneaded and pummeled and squeezed and modelled and shaped and formed. And if we're to experience a comparable metamorphosis, we must go through a similar process. Like Asaph, we must grasp that one way the potter Jehovah shapes us, and that's every single one of us, without exception, is through counsel and discipline. We can learn much from the way Jehovah acted as a potter toward the nations. The ancient nation of Israel was privileged to be on the great potter's wheels. They became the special focus of his artistry. One of the things that his dealings with that nation makes clear is that Jehovah does not mould people arbitrarily, making some good and others bad according to his whim. No, one huge difference between inanimate clay and us is that we have the God-given faculty of free will. So can we really stress this point? We must choose to be moulded by Jehovah. Proper response is needed if one is to be fashioned in a beneficial way. Israel rejected Jehovah's moulding influence. They did not respond to repeated counsel given by the prophets. For their stubborn course, Israel had to be severely disciplined, suffering destruction at the hands of appointed nations. The being a chosen nation did not exclude them from discipline. But the truth is that Israel proved to be difficult material to work with. They weren't malleable. They weren't yielding in the hands of the great potter. A contrasting example is that of ancient Nineveh. Jehovah decreed that due to the wickedness of its inhabitants, that city was fit only for destruction. However, when they received divine warning, though not in a covenant relationship with Jehovah, the people of Nineveh softened. They demonstrated appreciation 
for Jehovah's molding efforts and they repented. And so Jehovah did not destroy Nineveh at that time. You see, they made the choice to be shaped by God's discipline. So what about you and me? Which kind of clay are we? Are we malleable and pliable or are we difficult material to work with? We'll come back to that question. But just for a few moments, let's look at two individuals who had the opportunity to respond to divine molding. Both were Israelite kings. So first consider David. We know that David did some terrible things that adversely affected him and others, and he compounded his sins by attempting to cover them up. Now David was the king. So did Jehovah treat David with special leniency? No. He did not hold back from giving David firm, uncompromising discipline. After hearing the counsel of Jehovah through the prophet Nathan, how did David respond? His heart was touched. He repented. He became supple material in Jehovah's sculpting hands. He was prepared to be pushed back into shape by God's discipline, however drastic and painful that proved to be. We only have to go back a short way from David in Bible history to find a starkly contrasting example of someone who had not responded well to counsel. Israel's first king, Saul. Turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 15 and we'll consider some of those verses. But first of all, let's just set the scene. Jehovah's direct command to Saul was to devote to destruction every living thing in the city of Amalek. But in an attempt to bring honor to himself, Saul spared the Amalekite king Agag and the choice livestock. When counseled by Jehovah through the prophet Samuel, how should Saul have reacted? Well, he should have softened. He should have demonstrated humble submission before God. But let's read about his reaction in 1 Samuel 15 and verse 13. At length, Samuel came to Saul, and Saul began to say to him, Blessed are you of Jehovah. I have carried out the word of Jehovah. Even before Samuel opened his mouth, Saul launched into an effort to justify his actions. Now Samuel began to speak, but again look at the response in verse 15. To this, Saul said, from the Amalekites, they have brought them because the people had compassion upon the best of the flock and of the herd for the purpose of sacrificing to Jehovah your God. But what was left over, we have devoted to destruction. Saul quickly tried to shift the blame onto the people. Did you notice that? He also rationalized that what he'd done was permissible because the livestock could be sacrificed to God. So Samuel went on to repeat in no uncertain terms Jehovah's clear instructions to exterminate the Amalekites and to point out Saul's failure to comply with those instructions. But again, look at the reaction of Saul in verse 20. However, Saul said to Samuel, but I have obeyed the voice of Jehovah in that I went on the mission on which Jehovah had sent me and I brought Agag, the king of Amalek, but Amalek I have devoted to destruction. Saul minimized Samuel's evaluation of his actions and insisted, as he'd already repeatedly done, that he had carried out the word of Jehovah, even though he had done nothing of the kind. So did Saul respond well to divine molding? No. He resorted to self-justification, he shifted the blame, he rationalized his disobedient actions, and he minimized the gravity of his sin. 
for his stubborn refusal to accept Jehovah's loving attempts to smooth out his flaws, Saul was rejected as king. And worse still, sadly, he never recovered a good relationship with Jehovah. So with those scriptural examples in place, the nations of Israel and Nineveh, the individuals, David and Saul, let's return to the question, what kind of clay are we? Because by means of his word and organization, Jehovah is molding every one of his people. Remember Isaiah's acknowledgement all of us are the work of his hand. Jehovah desires to lovingly craft each one of us into a vessel of beauty and value. But whether that end result is achieved is dependent on how we react to his discipline. The Bible examples we've highlighted show clearly that we should respond wisely to Jehovah's counsel regardless of how many years we've been baptized or how many privileges we've enjoyed. When discipline is administered, we should accept it, even when it may hurt or even result in the loss of privileges. Now, some discipline is simply instruction or correction in areas where we need to progress or make improvement. Other discipline is needed because we have acted wrongly. Like David, some who have done wrong things accept counsel and improve. Like Saul, some have proved to be hard-hearted and they have rebelled when counseled. Reacting in such a manner is detrimental. It can seriously damage one's relationship with Jehovah. So we're now going to hear from our interviewees to see what can result when we respond to discipline in the right way. So first, we'll talk to Brother Liam Seward from Telford Aqueduct. Uh, tell us, Liam, what responsibilities do you have in the congregation? Well, I currently have the privilege of serving as an elder in the congregation. I'm a congregation group overseer and a sin assistant ministry school overseer too. Well, that's excellent. But I know that in your youth, there was a time when you had to be counselled and disciplined. But tell us, what was your initial reaction to the counsel you received? I received very strong counsel from Jehovah God through the body of elders, and it was delivered in a very firm manner. That led me to feel, at that point, that the counsel was perhaps a bit severe, or maybe even a little harsh. So you were somewhat hurt. But what do you now appreciate about the discipline that was administered? Well, Tim, looking back, I now know how close I came to losing my relationship with Jehovah God. I didn't realize what I had and also what I could have lost. The discipline I received from Jehovah was definitely a turning point in my life. A scripture that I'd known all my life now keeps coming to mind. It's one we know well in Proverbs 27, verse 11 where it says, Be wise, my son, and make my heart rejoice that I may make a reply to him that is taunting me. I realized that in my Christian youth, I didn't make Jehovah happy. But now, because of the counsel that I received from Jehovah through his organization, I have the opportunity to make him rejoice by making decisions that please him. Well, we really want to thank you for those uh, very honest expressions. Now, our second interviewee is Brother John Nabby from the Warsaw Willenhall congregation. He's a regular pioneer and has been serving as an elder for the last six years. But you had served as an elder previously, hadn't you, John? Yes, that was over a decade ago, but I lost that privilege. How did you feel, uh, John, when you received that discipline and the announcement of your deletion was made? Well, I felt that I hold it to Jehovah to be there at the meeting when the announcement was made because that was part of the discipline, but it wasn't easy to listen to. It really hurt to know that I'd lost the privilege of serving as an elder. 
In fact, it was probably the lowest point of my life in the truth, and I really thought I'd never serve as an elder again. So now, looking back, in what specific ways did the discipline you received help you? It helped me to take an honest look at myself. The strong counsel I received enabled me to refocus and I started doing serious personal study once again. Looking back, I can't put it into words how I feel about the mercy Jehovah showed me. I can see that it was Jehovah himself who raised me up and kept me in his organization. I can honestly say, because of Jehovah's discipline, I am happier now than I've ever been. Well, that really is tremendously encouraging. Responding to discipline in such a mature and positive way, and resisting any tendency to complain about the decision made by the elders, not only benefits the individual, but we might add, also, if the individual concerned has a family, it helps to avoid dragging them down and damaging them spiritually. Now there are times when Jehovah's discipline takes the form of disfellowshipping. Not only does that protect the congregation, but it plays a valuable role in the sinner's recovery. To illustrate that, Brother Tim Winter, an elder serving with Burntwood Chase Town congregation, will share an experience with us of one who responded after having to be removed from the congregation. Can you do that for us, Tim? Sure. The brother was actually disfellowshipped many years ago, Tim, and then reinstated after a year. Now he's a very hard-working ministerial servant in the congregation, and along with his family, they set a very good lead indeed. So, what does this brother have to say now about the discipline he received all those years ago? What he actually says to him, he says when he was initially reproved at the time, he actually mocked the discipline of Jehovah. And as of course, as a result of that, he was then disfellowshipped from the congregation. Looking back, he said at the time, it was the longest 12 months ever of his life. What the elders in the congregation then did, they actually suggested that he really bury himself in study and really get to know Jehovah properly as a person. For example, they asked him to do topics for his personal study, such as the heart, love and repentance. And he actually applied the direction that was given. And as a result of doing that, he was then uh, reinstated a year later in the congregation and actually now he says looking back at the time it went just like the blink of an eye well again we thank you for sharing that experience with us so may we all make a decision to adopt the attitude expressed in prayer to God by Isaiah turn with me to Isaiah 64 and verse 8. We've referred to these words already, but let's read them together. Isaiah 64 and verse 8. And now, O Jehovah, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are our potter, and all of us are the work of your hand. The great potter, Jehovah, is indeed our loving Father. Knowing this should move us to respond appreciatively to his counsel and accept any discipline he determines that we need. Look beyond any immediate discomfort this may cause. Instead, see his skillful, loving hands crafting you. Willingly submit to his shaping of you and envisage the end result. You see, it's true, all of us are a work in progress. We are not yet the finished article. But if we continue to benefit from Jehovah's discipline, we will be molded into a vessel of exquisite beauty and perfection, a living testimony to the consummate skill and craftsmanship of the great potter, Jehovah God.
And fine discussion will no doubt help each uh, of us to appreciate Jehovah's loving personal attention. Thank you very much indeed. It is possible that instead of trusting Jehovah, we could develop a negative, uh, could develop negative emotions towards him. The Bible discusses this very real danger. How could it ensnare us? How can we maintain our confidence in Jehovah? Listen as Brother Andrew McNeil from the London Bethel gives the talk entitled Never Become Enraged Against Jehovah. Our most precious possession is our relationship with our loving Heavenly Father, Jehovah. And this convention is really helping us to feel closer to Jehovah, isn't it? How close can we actually be to Jehovah? Well, the disciple James wrote that Abraham put faith in Jehovah and he came to be called Jehovah's friend. So, that indicates that we can be friends, personal friends of Jehovah. We can view him as a friend, and he even views us as a friend. But Proverbs 19 and verse 3, which is the theme scripture for this talk, please look at it with me. This reveals a disturbing threat to that closeness. Proverbs 19 and verse 3. It is the foolishness of an earthly man that distorts his way so that his heart becomes enraged against Jehovah himself. Now isn't that extraordinary? The, the proverb there describes a person who maybe at one time really loved Jehovah becoming enraged against him. Now that is a futile situation. As one poet said, our arms are too short to box with God. This is not a contest we want to enter. And being enraged with Jehovah can manifest itself in a number of ways. Some people maybe have an explosive rage and suddenly leave the truth, hating Jehovah. Some people have a kind of simmering rage which affects their relationship with Jehovah. And although they might continue serving him, they no longer enjoy their prayers to Jehovah. They are less enthusiastic about their ministry. They don't enjoy so much associating with their brothers and sisters anymore. They, in effect, hold a grudge against Jehovah for some reason or another. So that raises the question, well, what is it that could prompt a person that could make the transition from loving Jehovah to being enraged against him? There are four factors that are revealed in the Bible through Bible history. The first of these is found at Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verses 26 to 28. So turn with me to that please and see if you can work out what this factor is. Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verses 26 to 28. Now just setting the scene here. The Israelites were poised to enter the promised land, which they were very excited about doing, and they sent 12 spies to go and reconnoitre and report on it. And they all came back and said, yes, this promised land is, uh, is beautiful. It's wonderful. But 10 of them said, but the inhabitants are unusually strong, and it's a well-fortified place. We will never be able to conquer it. And that terrified the whole of the nation of Israel. Look at the result it had on them in Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verses 26 to 28. But you did not wish to go up, and you began to behave rebelliously against the order of Jehovah your God. And you kept grumbling in your tents and saying, It was because Jehovah hated us that he brought us out of the land of Egypt to give us into the, land, the hand of the Amorites to annihilate us. Where are we going up? Our brothers have caused our heart to melt saying a people greater and taller than we are, cities great and fortified to the heavens, and also the sons of the Anakim we saw there. 
did you notice what it was that caused this rapid change in attitude towards Jehovah? Our brothers have caused our heart to melt. Yes, it was the actions and words of those ten faithless spies that completely changed the attitude of millions of people to Jehovah. So that's our first factor. The actions and the words of others, even perhaps ones who are our brothers. That could cause people to become enraged against Jehovah. Let's have a look at our second factor. This is Isaiah chapter 8 and verses 21 to 22. Now, just to introduce that one, the fact is that we all have hardships, don't we, in our life. At times, we experience various hardships. But Isaiah describes a problem here in Isaiah 8 and verses 21 and 22. Look at the attitude here. And each one will certainly pass through the land hard-pressed and hungry. And it must occur that because he's hungry and has made himself feel indignant, he will actually call down evil upon his king and upon his God. And he will certainly peer upward. And to the earth he will look and lo, distress and darkness, obscurity, hard times and gloominess with no brightness. Yes, this describes a fleshly reaction to hardships. Here the person experiencing hardships begins to ask, well, why isn't Jehovah helping me? There is nothing but gloom in front of them. They can't see any ray of hope. It's, a, in effect, a faithless reaction to the hardship. And they begin to become angry against Jehovah that they are experiencing it. Let's go to our third factor. This is in Ezekiel 18 and verse 29. Now, Ezekiel was acting as a prophet to the Jewish people exiled in Babylon. And here he records Jehovah's reasoning with them regarding their attitude. In Ezekiel 18 and verse 29. And the house of Israel will certainly say, The way of Jehovah is not adjusted right. As for my ways, are they not adjusted right, O house of Israel? Are not the ways of you people the ones that are not adjusted right? You see the attitude of the Israelites at that time? They were judging Jehovah and saying, Jehovah's not adjusted right. He doesn't view things the right way. So this factor is actually judging Jehovah based upon our limited understanding of the facts. And that also can happen today. Perhaps somebody is looking at a Bible account. The Bible doesn't reveal all of the factors behind the situation and why Jehovah dealt with the matter that way, perhaps. And they become puzzled and they might judge Jehovah. Or it might be the way that events are occurring in the world today. The person looks at those and again begins to judge Jehovah because they don't feel that Jehovah is carrying out things in the right way. Perhaps they feel there's a degree of unfairness and they become angry with God for that. So that's our third factor, judging Jehovah without knowing all the facts. And our fourth one, well, this goes back to Adam. In Genesis 3 and verse 12, we can see this factor. Look what Adam said. The man went on to say, The woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit from the tree, and so I ate. So whose fault was it that Adam ate the fruit? It was Jehovah's. He'd given him the woman. So there we see Adam actually blaming Jehovah for his own mistake. And this is a common thing in society today, isn't it? That people don't want to blame themselves for their mistakes. They want to find somebody else to blame and maybe even somebody else to pay for their mistakes. So all of those four factors that we've described there from looking at the Bible, they all show how it is that a person can distort their way in a foolish way and end up becoming enraged against Jehovah. 
as Byington puts it, a man's ignorance muddles his affairs and he flies out against Jehovah. Now, how can we avoid this then? Well, the real key, the central key to avoiding any of these mistakes is to listen to probably one of our favorite scriptures, which is in Proverbs 3 and verses 5 and 6, which we won't read, but there it tells us to trust in Jehovah with all our heart. So even if we don't understand a situation or there's some other problem, let's at least start reasoning on the matter by trusting completely in Jehovah rather than relying on, our, on ourselves. But analyzing those factors one by one, let's take the first one. Remember what that was? It was the actions or the words of others. And we can deal with that just by a simple illustration. Imagine a husband comes home from work and tells his wife, I'm angry with you and I'm going to leave you. And she says, why? What have I done? And he says, nothing. It's just that I've got a problem at work and I want to take it out on you. Well, how fair is that? That is both illogical and it's also disloyal, isn't it? But it's basically the same as allowing a problem with somebody, some individual, some person, whether it even be a person in the congregation or not, to somehow affect our relationship with Jehovah. It's like taking it out on Jehovah, even though in fact he is not to blame. It is illogical to blame Jehovah for the actions of others. And it's disloyal to take it out on him by leaving him or by diminishing our service to him. What about our second point? This was the fleshly reaction to hardships and difficulties. Well, we will all experience hardships and difficulties. But is Jehovah ever the cause of them? Let's remember the words of James in chapter 1, verse 13. Have a look at this important scripture to always help us in our reasoning when we're under pressure. James chapter 1, and verse 13 says, When under trial, let no one say, I am being tried by God. For with evil things God cannot be tried, nor does he himself try anyone. So whatever trial we're experiencing, we can be absolutely sure that Jehovah himself is not causing it. In fact, more than that, this is a time for us to draw close to Jehovah, because he promises that he will be with us during the trial. A heart crushed is something precious to him. He will be close to such a one. He will help us cope with whatever this trial is. And of course, if we remain loyal to him, then we know that there's going to be a time when he removes all wickedness and when he allows the meek to inherit the earth, where there will be no more trials and where we will just enjoy peace. So we need to stay close to Jehovah not to blame him during such times. What about judging Jehovah without knowing all the facts? Well, Job fell into that situation, didn't he? And he was counseled here in Job 35 and verse 2 about that. Job 35 and verse 2. Elihu told him, Is this what you've regarded as justice? You have said, my righteousness is more than God's. Now, who of us in our right mind would ever think that we're more righteous than Jehovah? Let us make sure then that we never judge Jehovah based upon our limited understanding. If we don't understand a Bible account, or if we don't understand why it is that things are working out a certain way in the modern day, then rather than judging God, let's continue to come to learn more about him. Let's study other Bible accounts. Let's pray to him, draw close to him. Let us exercise patience, and we'll be sure one day we'll get a clearer understanding of the matter. What about blaming Jehovah for our own sins and mistakes, which was our fourth factor? Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7 is very helpful there. Galatians 6 and verse 7. 
that tells us do not be misled God is not one to be mocked for whatever a man is sowing this he will also reap it could well be that well if it's a mistake we've made who is it that we should blame for that mistake well it needs to be us we are reaping what we have sown we need to stand up and face the consequences of that maybe actually the cause of what we're going through could be something that Satan has managed to construct and create it could just simply be time an unforeseen occurrence or it could be a mistake that we've made and if so well then we're just reaping the consequences and to illustrate that let's say we go and buy a car the car does a hundred miles an hour so we drive it at a hundred miles an hour through the town center of Stoke and have an accident can we now go to the manufacturer and say this car you sold me was too fast no the fact is that there are laws about how fast we should drive through town centers and there's the highway code and if we don't follow those then the result is our own fault we can't blame it on somebody else and that's true also about our relationship with Jehovah we need to recognize when we've made a mistake that there might be consequences for us overall what we need to do is to treasure our relationship with Jehovah this really is the beginning of of how to deal with a situation whenever we're experiencing any of the difficulties that we've described in these four factors I'm quite sure that none of us who are sitting here ever imagine that we can become enraged with Jehovah but it's one thing to be sitting here in this peaceful atmosphere and talking positively about Jehovah like we are and it's another to be placed in some very difficult situation and in the heat of the moment to be trying to work out how to think about it and how to react well let's always begin that thinking and that reaction by being positive about Jehovah and by treasuring our relationship with him you know thinking about the nation of Israel I said that they all reacted badly to uh, those spies in fact they sent out 12 spies it was 10 that came back with a negative report but two were very positive they said yes these people are very big and strong and they are in a fortified in fortified cities but don't worry Jehovah's with us we will undoubtedly conquer them but those spies were ignored by the rest of the nation now what was the response to that well you know that the Israelites had to wander around for 40 years in the wilderness while all the faithless adults that reacted negatively died off but those two spies what happened to them numbers chapter 14 and verse 30 gives us the answer numbers 14 and verse 30 as for you speaking of the nation you will not enter into the land which I lifted up my hand in oath to reside with you except Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun so those two spies were singled out to survive the wilderness trek and go into the promised land 40 years later but think about it those spies had been faithful all along those two they could have reacted negatively and said why can't we go in now but they were prepared to accept what Jehovah decided and that's what we need to do too we need to treasure our relationship with Jehovah always think positively about him visualize the wonderful hope that he's given us ask ourselves where would we be without him the answer is nowhere let us be absolutely determined whatever happens to us in our life to remain close to Jehovah to treasure that relationship with him and never ever to allow our heart to become enraged against him Our timely reminders we're grateful to Jehovah aren't we, and his organization for helping us to cultivate 
a godly view of our imperfections and trials. At this time, we invite you to stand, open your songbooks to song number 88, and that song's entitled, Children Are a Trust from God. After the song, there will be some announcements, and if you wish, you may remain standing. So we invite you all to join in singing song number 88. As you'll see from the program, first of all, baptism. As you'll see from the program, the baptism is scheduled for tomorrow midday. Baptism candidates are requested to sit in the four rows designated in the seating area between entrances 10 and 11 of the lower main west stand opposite the platform. Seating for family and friends of baptismal candidates is located immediately behind these four rows. We thank you for your cooperation with this request. Candidates should sit in this section from the beginning of tomorrow morning's session. Cleaning. To assist the cleaning department in their task, we would like to encourage you all to take rubbish or litter home with you at the end of each day. Could remind all those who are pre-registered volunteers to check with the cleaning department at the end of each day's sessions. There will be a special need for cleaners on Sunday after the conclusion of session. May we encourage all who are able to volunteer to help. Parking. We would encourage everyone to exercise patience and demonstrate the fruitage of the Spirit because of the limited route from the stadium. We would request that all cars are removed from South 1 and 2 car parks by 6.25 this evening and Saturday evening, as the gates to these car parks will be locked. 
If you're staying, please move your car to the west car park. Each of us has an opportunity to share in the joy of making voluntary offerings. Contributions are locate, contribution boxes are located throughout the facility for those who would like to give financial support to the worldwide preaching work. Anyone who pays income tax may wish to increase the value of their kind donation by placing cash or a cheque payable to IBSA Convention in an envelope along with a completed gift aid form, both of which are available at the contribution boxes. The form needs to show just the amount enclosed, along with your name and address, all of which will be treated confidentially. In addition, donations can be made by credit or debit card, whether tax effective or not. The facilities for this are located in the following areas. Three in the main stand, concourse block 7 and 18, and in the main reception. Two are located in the north stand, concourse kiosk and supporters club entrance. A further location is in the south stand, concourse, concourse blocks 36. You may be seated now, brothers. Communication is vital to the strength of any relationship. What are some practical ways in which you can improve communication within the family? Husbands, wives, parents, children, please take special note of this five-part symposium. Communication helps families stay close to Jehovah. Each speaker will introduce the one to follow. Brother Jeff Woodfield, serving the number two Sussex circuit, will start off with the talk, Jehovah, the Great Communicator. All these superlatives apply to Jehovah, don't they, when it comes to qualities. For instance, he is the great evangelizer. Uh, the Grand Instructor, uh, the Bible calls him the Grand Creator. There is another superlative, and this is one that it's good for families to note. He is the Great Communicator. Right from the start, Jehovah has communicated with his family of worshippers on earth. In fact, you might remember John chapter 1 and verse 1, where it says, In the beginning was the Word. Well, who was the Word? Well, that was Christ in his role as spokesman for Jehovah. And it was likely that the word Christ was the one that communicated with Adam back in Eden on Jehovah's behalf. Evidently, Jehovah spoke with Adam on a regular basis. If you turn to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8... It says there that later they, that's Adam and Eve, heard the voice of Jehovah God walking in the garden about the breezy part of the day. So it may have been Jehovah's custom to communicate with Adam at that part of the day. Uh, possibly even every day at that part of the day. Now you imagine if that's true, then how must Adam have felt? Imagine looking forward to that time of the day, that one-to-one -one communication with his creator. But whatever the case, it's clear that Jehovah took the time to communicate his instructions to Adam, to teach him what he needed to know, to get the very best out of life. What was the motivation behind that communication with Adam? Well, 1 John 4 verse 8 says, God is love. And that's the simple answer love. Jehovah wanted to because he loved Adam and Eve very much. Unfortunately, of course, we know later Adam sinned, but when he did, Jehovah immediately communicated the basis of hope for the future in that very first prophecy recorded in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. 
And that involved the promise of the seed and the key role that Christ would play in the outworking of Jehovah's purposes. So Jehovah was quick to communicate when it was necessary. Another example of God's communicating effectively had to do with his concern for Cain. In, if, if you're still in Genesis, turn to chapter 4 and reading from verse 5. It says, that Jehovah did not look with, with any favor upon Cain and upon his offering. And Cain grew hot with great anger and his countenance began to fall. But this Jehovah said to Cain, why are you hot with anger? And why has your countenance fallen? If you turn to doing good, will there not be an exultation? But if you do not turn to doing good, there is sin crouching at the entrance. And for you is its craving. And will you, for your part, get the mastery over it? So what a loving act on Jehovah's part to provide this warning for Cain. So he, he didn't hold back from communicating necessary counsel and direction. Interestingly, Jehovah cho uh, chose a variety of ways to communicate with um, his worshippers, uh, usually by means of intermediaries. Uh, we've already mentioned Jesus as the word. Of course, there was the angels, and Jehovah raised up prophets too. Additionally, we have the greatest written communication of all. That's God's word, the Bible. And through the pages of the Bible, Jehovah progressively reveals his purposes, his personality, and his standards. And there are, I would imagine, thousands of examples of that. Just thinking of one uh, part of Jehovah's personality that's revealed through the pages of the Bible is his patience. Do you remember in uh, Genesis chapter 18 where imperfect Abraham is questioning the perfect judgment of the Creator with regard to the situation in Sodom? Imagine that. And yet Jehovah patiently condescended to listen to what Abraham had to say. What a good example for Christian husbands and fathers. Yet the Bible reveals that Jehovah's patience has limits. Um, when Israel ignored Jehovah's persistent reminders, eventually those reminders were replaced with judgment. In fact, in 2 Chronicles 36 and verse 16, it says the rage of Jehovah came up against his people until there was no healing. So that's just one example, but it proves that we could never really get to know Jehovah without his word. So aren't we grateful for this most marvelous communique from God to man. So, if Jehovah is the great communicator, which he is, and if he's benefiting all those that listen to him, which he is, then are we listening to him? Are you and I listening? Well, the importance of listening is emphasized by another superlative that's applied to Jehovah in Isaiah. We refer, refer to it at the beginning. He's called the Grand Instructor. That implies the need for us to listen and apply. What good would instruction be if we didn't do that? And don't we have every reason to listen to Jehovah? Everything Jehovah tells us to do is for our good. If we apply what he says, we always benefit. For example, Right from the beginning, Jehovah revealed the respective roles of husband and wife. Going back to Genesis, we can read chapter 2, and first of all, verse 18. It says, Jehovah God went on to say, It is not good for the man to continue by himself. I am going to make a helper for him as a complement of him. And then in verse 24, that is why a man will leave his father and his mother and he must stick to his wife and they must become one flesh. So there was the, the blueprint, if you like, for this relationship between husband and wife. Now to what extent husbands and wives enjoy the one flesh state 
will depend to a large extent on how much we listen to the great communicator and apply his advice. So what would good communication involve in the family, particularly between a husband and a wife? Well, a number of things. We'll mention two. Firstly, honest self-disclosure. Two, appropriately revealing our thoughts and our feelings. Now, some of us may find that a challenge. But Jehovah has set the perfect example, again, for us, by revealing his innermost feelings. For instance, in Psalm 78, his hurt feelings were expressed this way regarding his people, how often they would rebel against him in the wilderness. They would make him feel hurt in the desert. Isn't it wonderful Jehovah recorded that? Or expressions of love for his people. In Isaiah 43, verse 4, Owing to the fact that you have been precious in my eyes, you have been considered honourable, and I myself have loved you. What a marvellous example of self-disclosure and appropriately revealing our innermost thoughts and feelings. A great example for all of us, certainly for family members. So we should strive to imitate Jehovah in that regard. So husbands and fathers here today listening to this talk, are you setting the example by being good communicators in your family? Well, we must. If we truly know God, we will strive to do that to the best of our ability. With that in mind, let's give attention to Brother Terry Cannon from the Wolverhampton Bilston Congregation, who will discuss the theme Communication helps families stay close to Jehovah. Husbands, communicate with your wives. Are you ready, lads? Please turn to James chapter 1 and put a marker in 1 Peter 3. Recently, when I started my car, the flash on the dash said, change oil soon. I thought, or else, degraded lubricant will seriously damage the engine. If I ignore this message, It will cost me an inconvenience and an arm and a leg in the wallet department. I took the wise course and booked it in for a service. There are some communications men cannot ignore. The statement, husbands communicate with your wives, is one of those messages. As top quality oil, is to an engine, good communication is to marriage. In fact, good communication based on love means happiness for our families and helps them stay close to Jehovah and to each other. So how can husbands develop good communication skills? Well, applying Bible principles that are essential in making good communication of top quality. For instance, we are told by the Apostle to put away falsehood and speak truth with our neighbour. Paul also counsels, let your utterance be always with... Can you finish the verse off, brothers? Graciousness, yes. Seasoned with salt. Excellent. And Jesus, the perfect communicator, not only revealed his feelings to his disciples, but he also listened to theirs. So good communication is loving, open and honest, tactful and respectful. On the other hand, poor communication includes hearing without listening, speaking without communicating, insulting, sulking, 
conveying anger by icy silence. One divorce lawyer said that the inability to talk honestly, to bear their souls and treat each other as best friends was the biggest reason for couples splitting up. So rather than being colloquially a Mardi Aper who sulks and calls his wife a Muppet, let's make sure that every day we trust our mates with our feelings, are pleasant to live with and easy to apologise to. Tension between spouses is often caused by different communication styles. We shouldn't be surprised that men and women don't think or communicate the same. After all, when Eve was created, she wasn't just a slightly revised model of Adam. Remember, Adam said, at last, bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. He didn't say brain of my brains. Not that either brain of the sexes is superior to the other. Mind you, it is a fact that the two sections of the brain responsible for language are larger in women than men. And apparently, on average, women use 20,000 words per working day, whilst us men can only manage 7,000. As to what that means, you must draw your own conclusion. But the fact is, Eve was different. She was a complement. A complement is one of two different parts that make up the whole. So generally speaking, most women deal in feelings and expect emotional support, whereas men deal in facts and expect information so we can provide a solution. Most men are problem solvers. Most sisters will say that's because most men cause most of the problems. But seriously, the majority of women want their husbands just to listen to them. They don't want a repairman. One sister put it this way, telling me how to fix the problem was like saying, your feelings are invalid. You're overreacting. See how easy it is to solve this little problem? A word of caution. There are exceptions to the rule. There's no such thing as a typical man or a typical woman. What we have to do is individually get an insight into the perspective of our wife. Communication in marriage is a formidable challenge. You brothers know how you feel when your beautiful wife asks the deceivingly simple question, how does this look? It doesn't look nice, does it? That's like walking a tightrope with an unexploded bomb at one end. You can't ignore an unexploded bomb. You have to get over there and try to defuse it. So what we have to do is learn to look below the surface. This isn't a cold scrutiny of our wives' communication style, but a warm gaze into our heart and mind. When it comes to giving men in particular advice on how to communicate, the Bible is supreme. You've got James 1. As we read verse 19, see if you can spot where the surprising emphasis in communication is placed. Know this, my beloved brothers. It doesn't say sisters. Every man, not woman, every man must be swift about hearing, slow about speaking, slow about wrath. So the emphasis is on patiently listening to our wife, trying to understand her feelings. 
Young or old, husbands should listen. It's dead cool to listen. Although our brain shrinks with age, our ears continue to grow. So let's make sure that we use them to the full and carry on listening to our mates, thus providing emotional support all through our lives. She will feel cherished and will respect and love us all the more. Besides improving communication skills, family heads can strengthen family communication through spiritual growth. It is an astute husband and father who obeys the command of Jesus when he said, keep seeking first the kingdom, Matthew 6. It's a shrewd family head who applies Jehovah's counsel when he said, these words I am commanding you today must prove to be on your heart. Deuteronomy 6. It is a truly a wise man who takes time to strengthen himself and his family, making good use of the family worship evening. It is a foolish man who does none of these things and lets technology and entertainment consume too much of his and his family's time. We cannot be too busy to study and meditate. Rather, we must strive to be a good teacher and example to our family. Such a man will humbly pray with his wife, expressing mutual concerns, and will try to discuss the daily text with all of his family. Whilst not using the Bible as a rod to beat his mate, such a man will have the moral fortitude to provide spiritual direction to his wife when necessary, drawing attention to points of counsel from the scriptures or direction from the faithful slave that they both can put into practice. But we hear this same counsel year after year at our conventions. But are we really listening? Not applying this counsel is like an irrational man who drains his engine sump and immediately replaces it with last year's used oil. The engine will splutter, but inevitably the car will seize up. Surely, brothers, none of us wants our precious family to come to a spiritual dead stop. Maybe you are finding it difficult to keep the lines of family communication open, but don't give up. You have to begin somewhere. Communication requires a lot of effort, so work at it. It's like trying to open an unused door with rusted hinges. Squeaking, the rusted hinges gradually give way. But if the door had been regularly in use and the hinges were well greased, it would have been easy to open. The same is true with the door of communication. So make it a practice to communicate and lubricate its hinges with husbandly love. One final important reason to communicate with our wives is found at 1 Peter 3. As we read verse 7, I'd like you husbands to think of your worst fears. It says, You husbands, continue dwelling in like manner with them, according to knowledge. Well, as far as communication is concerned, we know now, we've got the knowledge, we have to listen and provide emotional support or whatever else our wife needs. Assigning them honour as to a weaker vessel, the feminine one, since you are also heirs with them, of the undeserved kindness, uh, favour of life, in order for your prayers not to be hindered. So whatever our fears are, imagine having to face them totally alone without the support of our Heavenly Father. It doesn't bear thinking about, does it, brothers? So truly, as top quality oil is to an engine, 
good communication is to marriage. In fact, it's more important than that. It's the very lifeblood of a successful marriage. So what are the benefits of open, warm communication with our wife and children? As a couple, we will draw closer to God and to each other. We will earn our children's respect as we set them a good example. Our prayers as a husband will not be hindered. We'll now interview a sister who appreciates how her husband communicates with her. It's my pleasure to introduce Sister Monica Dawes. Both uh, Monica and Dominic, her husband, serve as regular pioneers in Bilston. Just a few questions, Monica. How does Dominic help you to work through the natural stresses of marriage when they arise? Well, naturally, when problems do crop up, Dominic has always tried to seek the faithful slave's advice on which direction to take. Okay. Does he ever give you loving counsel? Yes, frequently. Has it always been easy to take? No. Oh, I see. Do you mind telling us why? Well, I suppose it really has a lot to do with my upbringing. I was brought up in a household where respect for the headship arrangement wasn't thought of as being important. Okay, considering that fact then, how does he try to approach the subject? Well, oftentimes he will say, Moni, have you read this article? I think this will benefit us as a family. Can you give us an example? Well, recently, there was a film I wanted to see at the cinema. I said, oh, that would be nice to watch, but Dominic objected to this. Was you uh, disappointed? Naturally I was, so I said, fine, I'll ask one of our sons to go with me then. All right, so what happened? Well, not long after this, we were discussing the subject of entertainment in our family study. And the material we discussed really helped me to get God's viewpoint on the matter. And at this point, I could really see the point Dominique was trying to make. Okay. We're all dying to know what the film was, so <laughs> now I'm only joking. So, finally, Explain why you find it easy to pray with Dominic. It's never been a problem because we've always prayed together and oftentimes they will ask me, what shall I say to Jehovah on your behalf? That's fine. Thank you ever so much, uh, Sister Dawes. We appreciate that. <laughs> so, my brothers, never be frightened. Never give up. Keep pushing the door of communication open. Grease the hinges with love. Lubricate your family with good communication. You and your family will never regret it. Because when we apply Bible principles, we make it easier for our wives to communicate with us. So with this in mind, we will now give attention to Brother Richard Farrell, an elder serving with Bridge North Congregation, who will discuss the theme, Communication Helps Families Stay Close to Jehovah. Wives, communicate with your husbands. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is your captain speaking. Time and again, these words have reassured a nervous traveler. The captain's voice, as he welcomes you aboard the flight, sounds so relaxed. You may have wondered how he's able to stay and remain so calm. Well, a lot has to do with the cabin crew that are accompanying that captain on his journey. Today, we are on a journey. Husbands, you are the captain or pilot, and wives, you are the co-pilot or first officer. You're both following the same flight plan, a flight plan that will ultimately lead you to a new system of things. 
During the journey, you will at times encounter some turbulence. Seat belts may have to be fastened, and adjustments may have to be made as the journey progresses. However, you are part of a team. And as everyone knows, a successful team is one that communicates well. Could you imagine the captain who welcomed you aboard your flight still sounding calm and collected if he had accompanying him a co-pilot who screamed at him with words of abuse showing little or no respect for his authority? Communication between a wife and her husband is vital. And while wives should feel free to express themselves to their husbands, the Apostle Peter said that this should be done in a certain manner. He said it should be done with mildness and deep respect. Wives, do you follow through with that exhortation? A wife who respects her husband would avoid criticizing or demeaning him. To do so would be counterproductive and make him less willing to communicate with her in the future. The wise man Solomon had some fine words recorded for us at Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 18. Shall we turn to that together? Proverbs chapter 12. And verse 18. There he says, There exists the one speaking thoughtlessly as with the stabs of a sword. But the tongue of the wise ones is a healing. Wives, is your tongue when you speak to your husband thoughtless like the stab of a sword? Or is your tongue like that of the wise one? A tongue that is healing. As we've already said, there will be times when we experience some turbulence on our journey as we go through this system of things. And there will be occasions when sensitive information will have to be conveyed to your husbands. But wives, how and when will you do this? Could you imagine listening to the captain conveying information about the flight to his passengers? The altitude they were flying at, what country they were flying over, what speed they were flying at, all of this in a calm and relaxed manner, only then to hear the co-pilot's raised voice coming over the sound system, that engine number two was overheating, they were losing altitude, and it was all the captain's fault. The effect on the passengers and the rest of the crew would be sheer panic. But wives, do you unknowingly fall into this category? Remember what Solomon said of Ecclesiastes chapter 3, and verse 7. Shall we turn to that together? In verse 1 he's talking about how there's an appointed time for everything. But then in verse 7 he said there's a time to rip apart and a time to sew together. A time to keep quiet and a time to speak. Wives, do you take to heart these words? Let us look in on a scene of a husband arriving home from a hard day's work, stressed and tired. Oh, what a day. And then the traffic on the motorway on the way home. I just can't believe how busy it was. It's taken me ages to get home. But never mind, I'm home now. Oh, I'm just so glad to be home. Hi, Lynn. I'm home, love. And it's about time too, Steve. Your son, he's supposed to be doing his homework, but no, he's on that phone again texting his friends. I told you this would happen when you bought it for him. <sighs> Honestly, Stephen, when are you going to do something about it? For how long was our brother glad to be home? How much kinder it would have been for the wife to have welcomed her husband home, inquired about his day, and then to have broached the matter about the son's lack of enthusiasm in completing his homework. Wives, 
be discerning as to when is the right time to speak with your husband. Going back to the illustration of our journey with a flight crew, the co-pilot on that crew very quickly realizes that he or she is responsible for their own actions. They cannot hide behind the pilot's skill and his ability. They need to work hard to develop their own skills and their own abilities. Soon, maybe later on in that flight, the captain may need to draw on these skills. The same is true of Christian wives. Even in a household where the husband is an exemplary servant of Jehovah, a Christian wife needs to realize that she has to continue to work hard to build up and maintain her own spirituality. True, her husband has the scriptural obligation to care for her spiritually and materially. But in the final analysis, she must work out her own salvation. Wives, even though your husband can do much to help you grow spiritually, you are responsible for your own relationship with Jehovah. At this point, it would be good for us to reflect on today's theme scripture. It was taken from Psalms 73 and verse 28. Here the psalmist says, but as for me, the drawing near to God is good for me. In the sovereign Lord Jehovah, I have placed my refuge to declare all your works. Notice the psalmist says, as for me, it's good for me. I have placed my refuge. The psalmist was showing that building a relationship with Jehovah is an individual thing. Husbands, you cannot build a relationship with Jehovah for your wives. Wives, you need to do this for yourself. And think of the blessings that will come to you by growing spiritually. Why you'll be able to foster the fruitage of the Holy Spirit in your life. Now that's the thought. The fruitage of the Holy Spirit, which we all know, is love, peace, kindness, mildness, and self-control. And if these qualities are cultivated in a marriage, then surely good communication with one's husband will automatically follow through. To emphasize the importance of good communication between a wife and a husband, Ask yourself this question. Would I be willing to undertake a journey on a plane if I learned that the co-pilot was refusing to communicate with the pilot? Of course you wouldn't. How could you be confident that vital flight information such as possible dangers, possible dangerous situations, that these would be passed on to the captain accurately? Now, wives, you owe it to Jehovah and to the children that he has entrusted in your care for the duration of this journey that you are on to communicate with your husband. If recreation, entertainment, or secular work is consuming too much of your time, then maybe these are dangerous signs for you and for your children. Maybe these signs ought to be relayed to your husband and together you should discuss and decide which is the best way forward. Sometimes it's the simple things that are overlooked. The things that are taken for granted that can help a family to communicate. For example, mealtimes. Now is your family having at least one meal together each day? Sadly, in today's hectic world, eating has become haphazard. It's a do-your-own-thing in many households. And yet, besides feeling a physical need, enjoying a meal together as a family can satisfy even more important needs, such as warm communication 
and family bonding. In this year's January edition of the Awake magazine, there was an article, Can Mealtime Strengthen Your Family Values? And it made the point that family meals offer parents a unique chance to care for their children's emotional well-being. It also cited examples of parents who had gone to great efforts every day in order to eat together as a family. Do you go to such efforts with your family? Mealtimes can be viewed as an opportunity to converse with the family and to work as a team, either preparing the meal together or perhaps clearing the table and tidying up afterwards. The rewards gained from putting this into practice will far outweigh any sacrifices that have to be made. At this point, we'd like to introduce you to Brother Harvey Noon, who is a ministerial servant from Bridge North Congregation. Harvey, could you tell us what your family circumstances are? Yes, I'm married to Katrina, and we have two children, Jacob, who's nearly 15, and Megan, who's 12. So how do you view mealtimes, Harvey? It's very precious. And why is that? Well, it's a time when we're able to talk over the day's activities and spend some valuable time with each other. So, Harvey, how important is the information that Katrina imports to you about the family? Well, for me, it's vital. Katrina has the advantage of spending more time with the children than I do, so any matters that concern her, we're able to sit down together and discuss it. And this helps us to closely monitor our spirituality as a family. So when you discuss these matters, Harvey, what else do you do? We also work closely as a family to set theocratic goals. That's very commendable. I wonder if you could give us an example of some of these theocratic goals that you've set as a family. Yes. Although Saturdays we are out on the field ministry as a family, Katrina recently became aware of the fact that the children wanted to have a share in the ministry midweek. She talked to me about it and we sat down as a family and discussed how and when this could be done. And what was the result? Well, we spoke to some of the pioneers and it was agreed that Thursday, after school, Katrina, Jacob and Megan would meet up with the pioneers and work together to develop their calls. And how have the family benefited from this arrangement, Harvey? It's working really well. Our meetings are on Thursday night, so after the ministry, the children are already dressed and prepared for the meeting, and they're in the right frame of mind. That's excellent. So what progress have they made, Harvey? Well, we believe that this arrangement has contributed to them enjoying the ministry more, and we were really pleased a few weeks ago when Megan joined Jacob and became an unbaptized publisher. That's lovely. Thank you very much, Brother Noon, for those practical comments that you shared with us. <clears throat> Friends, we are at a crucial point in our journey. Shortly, we hope to arrive in the new system of things. So now is the time for us to stay alert. Now is the time, more than ever, for Christian wives to communicate with their husbands. Proverbs 31, verse 30 and 31, we're told how Jehovah views faithful Christian wives who loyally support their husband on their journey into the new system. Shall we turn to that together? Proverbs 31, and verse 30 and 31. Here we read, Charm may be false, and prettiness may be vain. But the woman that fears Jehovah is the one that procures praise for herself. Give her of the fruitage of her hands, and let her works praise her even in the gates. Let us now give attention to Brother David Griffiths from the Carnarvon congregation, who will discuss the theme, Communication helps families to stay close to Jehovah. Parents, communicate with your children.
the craft of making arrows has been known to man for many thousands of years. It's quite a complicated maneuver, quite a complicated thing to do. The Fletcher, the arrow maker, starts off by selecting the correct type of wood. He then selects the type of wood that has the right type of grain, hopefully lovely and straight. And when he splits that grain, he's looking to create a particular shape of arrow. It could be one that is uh, equally fat all the way through, or it could be one that's thin at both ends and fat in the middle, like some of us. Or it could be bulbous at one end and narrow at the other. And then when he's selected his wood, the fletcher, or arrow maker, now decides what type of tip he's going to put on his arrow. And when he's done that, he gets to the fletch, the actual feathers that he's going to use to help his arrow to fly straight and true. So he might have collected uh, grey goose feathers during the winter and dried them carefully and shaped them to fit his particular desired arrow. It really is a precision act. It's quite interesting, therefore, to see that Jehovah uses that illustration of the arrow to describe the parent-child relationship. Consider with me Psalm 127. Psalm 127, and look with me please at verses 4 and 5. Like arrows in the hand of a mighty man, so are the sons of youth. Happy is the able-bodied man that has filled his quiver with them. They will not be ashamed, for they will speak with enemies in the gate. So here, children are likened to arrows, and the parents or parents are like the bowman who has to aim his arrows in the right direction. Look at how successful this particular bowman is in verse 5. He says, happy is this man that filled his quiver with them. He's got more than one child. He enjoys child rearing. They will not be ashamed. The way they bring their child up will bring them joy and delight in the future. In fact, look at that very first, last sentence in uh, verse 5. For they will speak with enemies in the gate. Yes, this man or woman or what both have brought up children who are so skilled and able that as adults they're prepared to uh, perform legal acts to conduct legal business with the elders in the city gates on behalf of their parents. The parents are proud of their children. So our children, our arrows, we are bowmen. What is our target? Is it not to have our children as happy, wise, and responsible adults. Such accuracy in aiming an arrow to hit a target requires skillful and sustained communication. Regular communication is absolutely vital. When could we plan, as parents, to have meaningful communication with our children? Well, how about before our children set off for school each day? Perhaps we are able to include the day's text, or at least a prayer on their behalf. You know, a spiritual thought and some encouraging words might be just what is required to shape the direction in which our children fly on that day at school. Or perhaps, as previously mentioned, uh, parents could arrange things so that a family meal is enjoyed at least once a day as an entire family. Family matters can be discussed. Congregation activities could be reviewed. Do you know, simply saying a heartfelt well done to your children could be just the thing. Uh, just a word of warning though, don't use such times to deliver the family lecture. Negativity can be damaging. 
It's not just indigestion, but alienation that might be created by that. So nasty side effect for using such times to deliver a telling off. In fact, notice the wise counsel found at Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 23. Proverbs 15, 23rd verse. A man has rejoicing in the answer of his mouth, and a word at its right time is oh how good. So taking time to communicate is vital. Equally important is the question of how we are going to talk to our children. Perhaps I could just ask you parents to think about what we do personally to deal with the issue of how we teach our children. Perhaps we could ask ourselves some questions. Do I listen carefully to what my children tell me, or perhaps what they don't tell me? Do I take the time to see things from their perspective? to really understand the issues that they have, or at least they feel they have. And if I do need to have a serious talk with one of my children, do I think carefully about where and when would be the best opportunity to result in ensuring that our arrows are still flying in that right direction? Are they still pointing at the right target? So another question we might want to ask ourselves is, as a parent, am I approachable? Now what might make us unapproachable? Well, a few more questions to just consider carefully. When my child tells me something that I wish they had not, what is my reaction? Do I immediately get very upset? Do I fly off the handle? Does the finger wagging start? That could make us very unapproachable. Or do I tend to make sweeping assertions? You know the sort of thing? You are always the last one ready for the meeting. Or you never have your books packed. Or perhaps when I was your age, well, just think about that last one. If we're 25 or 30 years older than our children, just think back 25, 30, 35 years ago to the world that we occupied as children. It's a very, very different world that we contemplate to the one that our children face on a daily basis. Mobile phones, the internet, home PCs, Social networking sites, well, they're every day now, but we rarely saw them then, or perhaps didn't ever. So our children face issues and problems that we did not have to deal with. Are we aware of these issues? Do we know about them? Do I take into consideration my child's feelings? I'd like you to observe the next demonstration. This is definitely a how not, how not to communicate. Here a father is being approached by his son in his mid-teens who wants permission to go to a party. Dad, you know how you're always telling me that I should make more friends in the congregation? Yeah. Well, Katie's arranging a party, I mean a gathering, this Friday night. And guess what? She's invited me. Can I go? Just slow down there, Tim, a minute. I can see you're up to no good again. What have I told you about going to these so-called witness parties? But, Dad, this is my chance to, you know, widen out. Widen out? Widen out? There's no room to widen out on the narrow and cramped road. Tim, when I was your age, I went to parties. I can only imagine what they're like these days. But, Dad... This is a witness gathering. You just don't trust me. Oh, Tim, it's not you I don't trust. It's that treacherous heart of yours. Oh, great. 
so now you're attacking my motives. I just don't get it. You tell me to find good association, but when I do, you don't let me associate. But that's just the point, Tim. These aren't good associates. How do you know? I have not even told you who's going to be there yet. Oh, forget it. Oh dear. I wonder what went wrong. Well, Dad had reservations, didn't he? I think that's pretty obvious. But do you think he jumped to conclusions? Didn't he accuse his son of being up to no good again? That conversation became totally confrontational. Dad not really listening, contradicting himself about widening out and narrow roads and all sorts. It became a no-win situation. Now, we have a teenager who feels totally hard done by, and a father who's frustrated, angry, and possibly worried. How might the conversation have gone with a more positive approach from the parents? Dad? You know how you're always telling me that I should make more friends with people in the congregation? Yeah, that's right, Tim. Well, Katie's arranging a party, I mean, a gathering, this Friday night. And guess what? She's invited me. Can I go? Well, just calm down a minute, Tim. I can see you're really excited about this one. Well, of course. After all, this is my chance to, you know, widen out. Which you are always telling me to do. Yeah, that's true, Tim. I'll tell you what, just sit down for a minute. Just first of all, Tim, I just want to say that if it's properly organised and, and overseen, you know, I want you to go and I want you to have a real good time. So, tell me, what do you know about this gathering already? Well, Katie said that if you have any questions, just give a dad a call. But all that I know is it's going to be a barbecue and it'll be at her house and her parents will be there. So, how many are going? Just the kids from our local congregation, so about 20. And Brother Heaney is going to be looking after everything. After what happened last year in the neighbouring congregation, nobody's leaving anything to chance. Well, Tim, it's looking good so far. I don't know, perhaps we'll talk about one, other, two, one or two matters about the uh, gathering. Um, and maybe we'll give Katie's father a call. See if we can make it happen. Thanks, Dad. You're the best. Well, what a different conclusion. This time, Dad didn't second-guess his son. Rather, he took the time to consult with his son, asking meaningful questions in a friendly manner. It wasn't an inquisition, and it didn't force Tim into being overly defensive. Regular communication between parents and their children is so important, but it has to be of a particular type. It has to be positive, and it has to be relaxed. Of course, sometimes we do get it wrong as parents, don't we? But we need to persevere. Why? Well, isn't it our fervent desire that our children be happy? What a heartwarming scripture this is. It's uh, 3 John and verse 4. Please turn with me, uh, with me to this scripture. It always gives me a lump in my throat as a parent to read this scripture. 3 John and verse 4. No greater cause for thankfulness do I have than these things, that I should be hearing that my children go on walking in the truth. Isn't that a wonderful motivation for us as parents to continue working at communication? Good parent-child communication helps families stay close to Jehovah. Let us now give attention to Brother Simon Pugh, an elder from the Craven Arms Congregation, who will just discuss the theme, Communication Helps Families Stay Close to Jehovah, Children, Communicate with Your Parents. So children, do you communicate with your parents? As we've learned in our last talk, 
the Bible likens the child-parent relationship to the arrows in the hand of an archer. And as young ones, your parents want you to hit the target. But you're only going to hit that target with skillful direction. What is that target? Well, your parents want you to serve Jehovah now, and they want you to serve Jehovah on into eternity. That is our heartfelt desire for our children. So where can we get guidance, where can we get skillful direction to make sure that we're aiming and that we're on target to make that goal? Well, let's have a look in God's Word. Let's have a look what he tells us in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4. It gives us Jehovah's standards here and it says, And you fathers, do not be irritating your children, but go on bringing them up in the discipline and the mental regulating of Jehovah. So what does this verse here highlight? Well, it highlights to parents that they have the responsibility to guide and to direct their children in line with Jehovah God's principles. Now, children, you may find this surprising, but, you know, your parents were actually children themselves at one time, which means that they have walked the same path as you. They have grown up as you are growing up yourself. Now, it's true, as was highlighted in our last talk, the problems and the pressures that are put upon you at school, and maybe you've just started work, are harder and more difficult. The devil is really, really trying to get at our youngsters. But you know, the path and the answers are still the same. Jehovah and your parents, they love you, and they are looking out for your best interests. They want you to reach your target. So what does Jehovah require of you children, of you youngsters today? Well, let's have a look at the first three verses there of Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6 in the first three verses tells us Jehovah's requirements for children. It says there, children be obedient to your parents in union with the Lord, for this is righteous. Honour your father and your mother, which is the first commandment, with a promise, that it may go well with you and you may endure a long time on the earth. So did you notice what Jehovah's requirements were for children there? It said to be obedient to your parents. Now today, the world thinks completely the opposite. Maybe your school friends or maybe people you work with think the idea of being obedient to your parents is not very cool. It isn't something that they would view as valuable. But we don't want to be influenced by Satan's world and his thinking, do we? We want to have Jehovah's thinking. Jehovah's standard is highlighted here. It is righteous on his behalf if children are obedient to their parents. Why? Well, at the end of verse 3, it says that it may go well with you. Jehovah wants you to hit that target. So Jehovah's laws, they protect and they benefit us. Maybe as youngsters at school, maybe you've seen the value of that. Maybe you've seen perhaps some of your school friends doing things that aren't in line with scriptural principles, and you can perhaps see that they're not happy or the consequences that that has led to. And yet Jehovah's principles, they benefit us. But you know, obedience is easier when there is good communication. Because good communication promotes understanding. Perhaps we can illustrate this with our idea of an arrow. Now recently I had the privilege of talking to a lady who's on the Olympic para, Paralympic archery team. And she was telling me that when she aims her arrow and she fires it, she has to really take into consideration the environment around her. Obviously, if there's a wind, she's got to take into consideration the wind speed, the direction of the wind, whether it's just a breeze or whether it's gusting. But she also said she needs to take the, the whole environment into consideration. If it's a warm day like today, 
the arrow will possibly lift slightly. If it's a cooler day, the arrow will possibly dip. So she has to take that into consideration when she's aiming her arrow. And you know, children, it's the same with you. Your parents need to know the environment that you are in so that they can help you to make adjustments so that you can stay on target for our aim for the future. So help your parents to understand you. Help them to understand the problems and situations that you face on a daily basis. And then when they talk to you, try to understand their point of view too. Let's now look in on a, a, a soliloquy. Let's look in on our sister who's got this particular problem that she's having to face at school. Now it may be that many of our youngsters, young and old, have had to face a similar difficulty. It may be that it's another difficulty that we've had to face. But notice how our sister reasons on this situation and the conclusion that she draws. <sighs> I really need to talk to mom about some questions I have about boys. But the thing is, I have no idea how she'll react. I mean, what if she wonders why I'm asking? Even worse, what if she thinks I'm boy crazy? Wait, hold on. I've talked to mom about things before and she's never overreacted. In fact, She's even told me things that she went through when she was a teenager. <laughs> like that time when I told her there was a boy at school that started taking an interest in me. Or, actually, I started taking an interest in him. She didn't come down hard at me. She said she understood that once even she had a crush on a boy when she was at school, Thinking about it, the advice she gave me, it did make sense. And it really got me back on track. Mom's always been very understanding and fair. In fact, there's nothing to worry about in talking to her about what's concerning me now. Right, I've made up my mind. I'm going to talk to Mom. So a fine demonstration. And did you notice what our sister did? You see, first of all, she was worried about how her mum may react to the situation. But then she thought it through and she reasoned on it and she realised that, that mum hadn't overreacted last time she'd spoken to her. And then she realised that mum had actually spoken to her about a similar problem that she had had when she was at school. So the lines of communication were open. So she made the wise decision and decided that she would talk to her mother about the situation. So we need to keep the lines of communication open with our parents. Why? Because Jehovah asks us to, because he wants the best for us. But we also need to realise that our parents love us and they want the best for us. Now sometimes we may think, well, I'm going to go and talk to my friends about this situation. And sometimes that, that can, on occasions, help. But usually our motive when we think, well, I'm going to talk to my friends about this problem as opposed to our parents, is because we know that our friends will perhaps tell us something completely different to what we know our parents are going to tell us. And when we ask for advice of young people, they don't really have the wisdom or the experience that adults or that our parents will have. And they don't really think about the consequences or the long-term view. Where your parents, you see, they'll be able to draw off their own experience. Maybe they themselves have faced similar problems. Maybe they know other friends within the congregation that have been able to tackle a problem and use God's word to help them. And sadly too, they may know of ones that haven't applied Bible principles and have faced the sad consequences. And they will be able to draw from that experience and use Jehovah's thinking to help you if you're able to keep your lines of communication open. 
Let's just now turn to 1 Kings together, uh, chapter 12, and have a look at an example in the scriptures of somebody who had the opportunity to listen to good advice, uh, but notice what he did. 1 Kings chapter 12, and here we find the account of Rehoboam, Solomon's son. Now towards the end of Solomon's life, he'd turned away from Jehovah, and he'd made it very difficult for the people of the nation of Israel. So in verse 4 of 1 Kings 12, the people come to him and they make this request. They say, your father, for his part, made our yoke hard. And as for you, now, make the hard service of your father and his heavy yoke that he put upon us lighter. And we shall serve you. So these people are saying, well, look, you know, your dad made it difficult for us. If, if you make it a bit lighter, we pledge our allegiance to you. So what does he do? Well, wisely, he asks for three days to think about it. And the first thing he does, we find in verse 6. It says, And King Rehoboam began to take counsel with the older men who had continued uh, attending upon Solomon, his father. So first of all, he goes to the older men. And their advice is, yes, make the load lighter. But if we look down at verse 8, he doesn't leave it there. Verse 8 tells us, However, he left the counsel of the older men with which they adv advised him, and they began to take counsel with the young men that, he had grown, that had grown up with him. These were the ones that were attending upon him. So what he did here was he, he left the counsel of the older ones and he turned to his mates, his friends, people he'd grown up with. And their advice was completely different. They said, make it harder, make it more difficult on the people. And do you know who he listened to? He listened to his friends. And sadly, the consequence was that the nation rebelled against him and his nation was split in two. Ten of the tribes rebelled and revolted against him, and he was only left with a small part of the kingdom that he'd had previously. What a sad consequence, because he'd followed the foolish advice of his friends. So children, don't make that mistake. Work hard to communicate and keep the lines of communication open with your parents. True. It may be hard work at times to keep those lines of communication open. It won't always come easy, but continue at it because your lives are at stake. Share your thoughts with your parents and confide in them. Tell them how you feel about situations. Why is that important? Well, let's go back to our illustration of an arrow. You see, if an arrow's flight is slightly damaged or isn't quite well balanced, it will affect the way in which the arrow flies. And if it's got a damaged flight, it will rarely hit its target. It will usually veer off to one side or the other. And sometimes, because we're imperfect and, and we're affected by the spirit of this world, children, our, our hearts perhaps tug us in one way, don't they? Perhaps we know something's wrong, but we're almost inclined to go that way. So we need to talk to our parents, because they can help us, they can readjust us, so that we can then make sure that we're back on a target. So continue to work at communication parent, with your parents. Understand their thoughts. Talk to them. If they give you some advice and you don't understand why you've got that advice, ask them to explain it. Draw off their experience. Why? Because Satan the devil doesn't want you to hit that target. Satan the devil isn't interested in you children. But Jehovah God is. Jehovah God loves you. Your parents love you. And they want you to continue in your service to Jehovah now. And they want you to live in service to Jehovah God forever. So children, keep the lines of communication open. Because good communication helps families to stay close to Jehovah God. Thank you, brothers, for those thought-provoking talks, demonstrations, and interviews. How can we draw close to a God that we cannot see? How can we help others learn about the Almighty Creator? 
We know that you have keen interest in this next talk entitled Creation Reveals a Living God. Brother Stephen Hardy, serving as a member of the branch committee in the London Bethel, will now present this to us. Since we cannot see God and live, we have a challenge. And that is, how can we learn about him? Two scriptures that we will read now will point the answer. Would you turn in your Bibles first of all to Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14 and we're going to read verse 15. And just to set the scene, you may remember how Paul and Barnabas had been hailed by the crowds as Greek gods. Of course, that was far from the truth, and they wanted to direct attention to Jehovah. So we read in verse 15 of Acts 14, they said, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are humans, having the same infirmities as you do, and are declaring the good news to you for you to turn from these vain things to what? To the living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all the things in them. So a way to learn about the true God is to consider what he's made. That would include the heaven, the earth, the sea and all the things in them. Our second scripture is perhaps even more well known to us. It's Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. Paul reasoned this way. He said, For God's invisible qualities are clearly seen from the world's creation onward, because they're perceived, how? By the things made, even his eternal power and godship so that they are inexcusable. Yes, again, Paul directs attention to the things made. So when we examine what Jehovah has created, what do we observe? Well, consider first of all, Jehovah's power. How is that evident? Well, right now, protecting us are two remarkable shields. You know, space is a really dangerous place. Out there we could be bombarded with death-dealing radiation. And yet, Earth's magnetic field shelters us. How does it do this? Well, if we were to go right down into the bowels of the Earth, right to its core, its very center, we would find a bowl of molten iron that is spinning. And this movement of this molten metal creates a magnetic field so vast that it stretches right from the center of the earth way out into outer space. And it protects us from harmful radiation from the sun, for example. The sun emanates a wind and this is a steady stream of art particles of high energy, which if they stream toward us with no protection, we'd have been dead before now. And not only that, as scientists have learned from studying the sun, every so often there are flares that come out of the sun. And these release in minutes as much energy as billions of hydrogen bombs. Now, where would we be without some protection from that? And even more than that, from the sun come some remarkable mass ejections of energy. Sometimes billions of tons of matter stream forth from the sun. But that magnetic sphere around the earth protects us. How grateful we are to the Creator. And what about the atmosphere? 
this uh, blanket of gases around our planet. Why, that gives us extra protection, doesn't it? We have right at the top of the atmosphere what we call the stratosphere. That contains a layer of oxygen, a certain type of oxygen called ozone. And that ozone absorbs 99% of the harmful ultraviolet radiation. Interestingly, that layer is always changing. So if more ultraviolet energy arrives, then there's an intense layer of ozone to protect us. So it's a dynamic shield that protects us. Then in addition, think of the other protection our atmosphere gives us from the billions of meteoroids. Now some of these range in size from tiny particles to great big boulders. But now when those boulders strike the atmosphere of the earth, they tend to burn up. And sometimes we see them as a, like a shooting star or a meteor. And the majority of them, of course, do not harm us here. So isn't this amazing that we have these two protective shields and yet they don't block the wonderful light that we enjoy, the sunlight. They don't block the heat from the sun. In fact, our atmosphere enables the heat to be distributed around the earth. So it's never too hot. And then at night, it acts like a blanket to protect all the heat from suddenly dissipating and us freeze to death. Yes, Jehovah's power is evident from creation. And what of Jehovah's wisdom? Now just imagine, suppose we considered the city of Stoke. Now suppose in the city, it would of course need good air for its inhabitants to live. But suppose the fresh air was cut off. And then suppose all the sewers in the city were blocked. What would happen? Well, obviously disease would spread rapidly, wouldn't it? And all the inhabitants would soon die. And yet, our Earth, our Earth is a closed system. So we've got clean air, we've got water. Now this clean air doesn't have to be shipped off to some other place to be cleaned up, does it? Neither does the water have to leave the earth. So how does the earth remain healthy and habitable? Well, the answer is Jehovah's wisdom has called remarkable natural cycles to work. And we call these today the water cycle or the oxygen cycle, the carbon cycle, and even more importantly, the nitrogen cycle. So consider, humans with all their technology, we create so much toxic, unrecyclable waste annually, and yet the Earth recycles all its wastes perfectly using ingenious chemical engineering. Yes, Jehovah's wisdom is revealed even in the life that he's created here on earth. Now, many humans claim to be very clever engineers. But you know, many engineers scrupulously study natural things. And they've learned so much that they've been able to perfect their designs by considering what they've observed. For example, they've learned much about the remarkable flippers of the whale. Now, you know, a whale is a creature of tremendous weight and girth. And yet, these two flippers it has enable it to go speedily through the water, even to turn quickly. How? Well, they found that on the leading edge of those flippers, there are little nodules so that the edge is not smooth. Consequently, as the whale goes through the water, turbulence is caused on the edges of those flippers. And where there is turbulence, then there's a difference in pressure above the flipper to below it. So it's able to suddenly rise or die. Indeed, this is so remarkable that many leading scientists are now trying to design aircraft wings that are no longer smooth, but have this ability 
to cause added lift and avoid the drag. Not only that, we know that if you observe a seagull, the way it flies is quite different to an aeroplane, isn't it? You observe how the seagull's wings are bent and they're able to move. So scientists today have studied the seagull's wings and they've even developed a, a little drone aircraft, that's a, a remote controlled aircraft that has movable wings, that is one section of its wing can move and cause a different angle in the flight and as a result this dr uh, drone is so remarkable they can get it to hover in mid-flight or they can cause it to dive between two large buildings and even though there is turbulence down there, it flies smoothly through them, just like the seagull does. And the gecko, that little lizard, you remember, that seems to be able to climb up even a vertical smooth wall. How does it do this? Well, the researchers have learned that it has a remarkable ability. The molecular forces on the hairs on its feet and toes are such that they're able to help that creature stick to the surface even when it's upside down. Recently we heard that the United States National Aeronautics Space Administration, that is NASA, they have developed a multi-legged robot that is really just like a scorpion. And engineers in Finland have developed a six-legged tractor using the design from an insect. And this tractor is able to go over hedges and walls and boulders without any problem whatsoever. Other researchers have studied fabric and they've considered how pine cones have this ability to open and close according to different temperature and humidity. Some Car manufacturers are studying the designs of the boxfish to design a car with the ability to pass through the air smoothly, reducing drag and, of course, becoming more economical. Now, where could these engineers have got those ideas from? From ideas that are already in existence as a result of Jehovah's wisdom. So, how can people not see the creation reveals the existence of the living God. Despite all these technological advances, really, we have to admit, they are inexcusable. Sadly, there are two false teachings that have become very common today and that prevent the truth about Jehovah God being made more obvious. These two teachings blind people to the truth about Jehovah. You know one of them very well. That is the theory of evolution. See, that theory really undermines faith in God. It contradicts the Bible, and it results in people losing hope. How does it do this? Well, a recent statement in Scientific American magazine says that the theory of evolution implies that ultimate meaning in life is non-existent. Well, if there's no purpose in life, then why are we here? Is it simply to pass on our genetic traits to the next generation and then at death cease to exist forever? Our brain? with the ability to think, reason, meditate on the meaning of life? Well, it would simply be an accident of nature. That's not all. Many who believe in evolution assert that either God doesn't exist or that he, he certainly won't intervene in human affairs. But what would that mean? Well, in that case, it would mean that our future rests simply in the hands of political leaders or religious leaders or the academics themselves. And judging from their past record, imagine the chaos, the conflict, the corruption that will continue to blight human society if evolution is true. Indeed, evolution robs us of hope. 
The second false teaching that blinds people to the existence of God is the teaching of creationism. Now that's the idea that the whole universe, including this earth, and all life on it are only a, a few thousand years old. Now some fundamentalist Christians, they may say they believe the Bible, but they contend that the Bible mentions six days of creation and these must be six 24-hour days. And they say this all happened just a few thousand years ago. And they reject any evidence to the contrary, even evidence from the very Bible that they claim to believe. Yes, creationism disregards credible scientific evidence. And it makes what is in the Bible appear unreasonable and inaccurate. Happily, we as Jehovah's Witnesses, we disagree completely with Christian fundamentalists who advocate creationism. So how do these two teachings compare with what creation does reveal and what the Bible really teaches about Jehovah? Well, the Bible teaches us to love knowledge. Proverbs 2, verse 10 says, Knowledge itself will become pleasant to your very soul. Now, Jehovah wants our faith in him to be based on proof, on knowledge, on evidence, not on any human philosophy, and certainly not on the religious traditions. Hebrews 11, 1 says, Faith is the evident demonstration of things hoped for. Now, for decades, our magazine, Awake, has helped millions to appreciate what creation reveals about Jehovah. And it's also helped to expose many of these false religious teachings. For example, I'm sure you've noticed, Awake is currently featuring a subject in each issue entitled, Was It Designed? Do you remember reading about the shark skin? About the kingfisher's beak? the cold light of the firefly, the eye of the moth. I'm sure you've enjoyed reading those articles. Then you may remember last year, February 2009, we had a cover series in The Awake entitled Earth Designed for Life. And you'd be pleased to know that 36 million copies of that issue were published in 81 languages. And that really honored Jehovah, the living God. Going back a couple more years, September 2006, we had a special issue in Awake devoted entirely to exposing both the false idea of evolution and that of creationism. Do you remember those articles? One was entitled, Did God Use Evolution to Create Life? Is Evolution a Fact? Does Science Contradict the Genesis Account? Well, the initial printing of that special issue was 32,400,000 in 81 languages. But the orders for extra copies were so great that we were happy to reprint that magazine four times with a total printing of 48,200,000. That's an, an extra 16 million copies or half of the original printing. One sister in the United States wrote, the campaign to offer this special issue went extremely well. One woman asked for 20 copies. She is a biology teacher and wanted each of her students to have a copy. A brother wrote, I've been active in the field service since the late 1940s and I'm nearing 75 years of age, but I have never enjoyed my field service as much as I have this month offering the special issue of Awake. And after expressing appreciation for this issue, a sister in Sweden wrote, I hope we'll get a brochure that discusses this subject. Well, it's our pleasure to release the brochure, Was Life Created? Now, 
This brochure is a compilation of articles on this subject from Awake magazine and it's designed to be used in our public ministry. First, you're going to notice the beautiful pictures and the amazing teaching diagrams inside. It covers five topics. First of all, the living planet. Who designed it first? Second, evolution, myths and facts. Third, science and the Genesis account. And fourth, does it matter what you believe? Now each section ends with a box entitled, How Would You Reply? And the questions are designed to help the reader to reason on the information that he's just considered. And then at the back of the brochure, just inside on page 30 and 31, there is an extensive bibliography of 32 items listing the source material for anyone who wants to check whether we've taken things out of context or not. Now this brochure, Was Life Created, is designed to be used as a stepping stone to a Bible study. In fact, on page 31, there are two sections at the end here inviting the reader to ask for two publications. One, the brochure, A Book for All People, and second, the book, What Does the Bible Teach? Now, having those publications as a basis will make it easy to study the Bible with them. And I'm sure, parents, you're going to find this very colorful brochure useful for helping your younger children to really appreciate Jehovah, who is our living God. Now, our youths are a particular target of the theory of evolution. You see, many scientists declare that it's a fact. Even school teachers profess evolution as a fact and teach it as such in school. Nature documentaries that we see on the television speak of creatures evolving. Even in the entertainment media, even in uh, certain films, they promote the idea of evolution as a fact. Well now, how can we further help our young ones to combat this God-dishonoring theory? Well, one way is to help our young publishers to develop their power of reason. You see, the Bible encourages us to put all things to the test. You remember the words of 1 John chapter 4, verse 1? Test the inspired expressions to see whether they originate with God. So a youth who can reason will have success in disproving the evolution theory. And a second way to help our young ones is to provide them with material that discusses